Buenos días, good morning all of you. It's a pleasure to receive all of you in person for first time after three years, so it's extra new. Um, dear colleagues, dear friends, distinguished guests, welcome to the 25th annual conference of the Central Bank of Chile. We are very pleased to host you again, as I, I said, face to face in Chile after three long and difficult years. Although it is unquestioned that the new forms of hybrid work have opened unforeseen opportunities, closeness and old fashioned face to face discussion are essential inputs for the development of ideas and their practical implementation. Since 1997, the CBC has been convening prominent scholars and policy makers to this conference to discuss major issues in central banking and their implications for emerging economies. Since its inception, this conference has been a bridge between academia and policy making. This version is no exception. 
fresh and thoughtful research will support the discussion over the next two days on a topic that is very much front and center in the policy agenda. We will enjoy the presentation of 30 authors, nine discussions, one keynote speaker, and a policy panel. This year's conference is focused on the role of heterogeneity in macroeconomics and its implication for monetary policy in general and Chile in particular. Understanding the heterogeneous micro-implication of a given macro aggregate shock can improve our knowledge of how the economy works and help us predict its future evolution. This is the right time to be discussing this topic, as we are experiencing the aftermath of one of the largest macroeconomic disruptions of the century. In the last three years, we lived through one of the most challenging times for policymakers where governments and central banks were pushed to deploy everything at their hands to contend the health of economic consequences of the pandemic and lately to contain inflationary pressures. During these years, we have learned that the effects of, pan of pandemic differed significantly between economies, but also within households and firms of heterogeneous characteristics. The different exposure that household and firms have to credit conditions, supply chains, and final demand affected their reaction to the original shock and also to the different policies. Firm size and household income distribution were important sources of heterogeneity to consider as well. Having widespread access to information was critical to develop sound policies. In response to these very challenging times, academia also reacted. Since early 2020, we witnessed an explosion of applied research that incorporated the lesson learned in the last 35 years in terms of the importance of considering firm and household heterogeneity to better understand the transmission mechanism of fiscal and monetary policy. This process of knowledge spillover from academia to policy making is not after every major economic crisis in which policymakers needed to react with a toolkit available at the time, academia came out with new insightful developments that later became part of the available toolkit. This is the evolutionary process by which our profession grows. Precisely for that reason, these bridges between academia and policy making, like the conference we are kicking off, are so important and choosing the right topic at the right time is critical. In these opening remarks, I want to take the time for, uh, to first review the main empirical and theoretical developments on the role of household and firm heterogeneity in macroeconomics with a special focus on economic policy in the current macroeconomic context. I will then briefly review the current trends in central banking, including the Central Bank of Chile, toward the use of more disaggregated models of the economy. To finalize, I will talk you through the main contents of the conference, including the main takeaways from the research papers to be presented. Heterogeneity is not something new in macroeconomic. We can trace it down to Francois Quesnay during the 18th century. Quesnay conceived the economy as the interaction of three groups of agents, landowners, workers, and merchants, who differed in how productive they were for the economy. Kesney proposed to design tax policy to obtain more revenue from taxing the least productive agents or sectors. So, to minimize the distortions in the production of sector with more productive workers. 
Since then, especially during the 90s, economists documented several puzzles in the behavior of household consumption. For example, the result by Deaton and Carroll showed that the ability of household to smooth consumption was imperfect and heterogeneous. This evidence challenged the prediction of models with complete markets and a representative agent. One of the main milestones in this literature in the early 19s was the development of economic models with uninsurable income risk and credit constraints that displayed rich cross-sectional heterogeneity in income and wealth. The so-called heterogeneous agent models or beauty hacket economies. The main takeaway from these earlier models is that one could rationalize the low observed real interest rate in a model in which households have precautionary saving motives to ensure against income shocks. In this framework, the degree of income uncertainty and credit constraints shape wealth inequality and imply a real interest rate in equilibrium that better resembles that in the data. Another key development was the widespread increase in access to large-scale microdata, which helped the profession to evaluate existing economic theories and build better economic models. Microdata has been a cornerstone to the inclusion of heterogeneity into macroeconomic models as it allows a deeper understanding of individual behaviors. Without it, theoretical models could not be adequately tested. For example, the work by Benjamin Garcia, Mario Yarda, and Carlos Lizama that will be presented in this conference combines location-based microdata on credit and debit card transactions with income surveys that show that fiscal policy programs that focused on lower income regions are associated with larger consumption responses as predicted by model of heterogeneous agent with liquidity constraints. These theoretical and empirical advances in the literature were complemented by the improvement of computational capabilities. These gave rise to the recent development of the so-called heterogeneous agents New Keynesian model, or HANK model, which incorporated important features that improve the standard New Keynesian model fit to the data and introduce new transmission mechanism of monetary policy. One of the main lessons from this model is that the direct effect of monetary policy on consumption, the so-called intertemporal substitution channel, can be very small compared to its indirect effect on income, which are shaped by general equilibrium forces that depend on the characteristic and behavior of households. Another important recent theoretical development is the model of heterogeneous firm and financial frictions who alters the way we think about the transmission of monetary policy. While the empirical evidence suggests small effect of monetary policy on aggregate investment, the use of disaggregated data allowed us to observe that investment of firms with uh, good financial conditions react strongly to monetary policy, but not so the investment of financially constrained firms. Therefore, the effect of monetary policy depends on the distribution of firm level financial conditions and how these conditions change with the business cycle. The two examples I have just referred to are very influential in the way we assess the macroeconomic implication of monetary policy. This is the place where academia and policy making meet. As a matter of fact, policy makers around the world are in the process of introducing this new technical development. The ECB stated in 2021 that it is committed to analyzing the implication of hand models for the understanding of monetary policy transmission, focusing 
on the role of household and labor market heterogeneity. On the other hand, the Bank of Canada is working on the groundwork for such a model that includes heterogeneity in the income process of households and its implication for optimal monetary policy. In addition, the Federal Reserve has already included analysis based on HANK models in their Federal Open Market Committee meetings as part of their review of their monetary policy strategy, tools, and communication practices. In our case, the Central Bank of Chile is already developing a HANG model to study how the distribution of income and wealth affects the transmission mechanism of aggregate shocks and the conduct of monetary policy. And as you will see in the next few days, we have given important steps toward that goal. Let me now give a very brief overview of what we will hear in the next two days. The conference will start with a session, Transmission Mechanism of Shocks and Policies, in which the paper by Adrian Oclert, Matt Wrongley, and Ludwig Straub analyze the monetary and fiscal policy implication of shocks to energy prices in model with household heterogeneity and incomplete markets. Then, the paper by Emiliano Lutini, Ernesto Pasten, and Elisa Rubo will shed some light on the heterogeneous effect of monetary policy across different households in Chile. Then, the conference will move to the topic of Hank models, where the paper by Alistair McKay and Christian Wolf will show us optimal policy rules in these type of models, and we will be able to contrast them to optimal rules in models without household heterogeneity and understand the main differences. The importance of the inclusion of heterogeneity for monetary policy analysis is not only about the understanding of the mechanisms and that this implies, but also, and probably more important, is about whether these mechanisms are quantitatively relevant in changing the policy prescriptions. If so, it is fundamental for central banks to have the quantitative tools to solve and estimate these complex models. The paper by Marco del Negro, William Chen, Schlock Goyal, Ita Matlin, Don Guli, Rebecca Sarfati, and Sikata Sengupta will show us one of the first steps toward achieving this goal. To end that, that session, the paper by Benjamin Garcia, Mario Yarda, and Carlos Lizama will show us the current state of a hang model developed for Chile and will analyze the average of the distributional effects of fiscal transfers on consumption in the presence of household heterogeneity. On the second day, we will continue to the study of the role of heterogeneity in policy design in the session Heterogeneity and Economic Policy. The paper by Felipe Alves and Gianluca Violante sheds light on different monetary policy rules that focus on different parts of wealth distribution and emphasize on the unequal cost of inflation. On the other hand, the paper by Valerie Rami, Jacob Orchard, and Johannes Villand will offer an alternative perspective on the role of household heterogeneity in macroeconomics, arguing that the consumption responses estimated at the micro level are not necessarily consistent with the macroeconomic responses of consumption in the US during the Great Recession. The last academic session of the conference named Financial Markets and Monetary Policy focuses on the role of financial markets, firm level and bank level heterogeneity in shaping the, trans the transmission channels of monetary policy. The work by Boragan Aruova, Andres Fernandez, Bernabe Lopez Martin, Win Lua, Felipe Safi studies the financial channel of monetary policy showing that the response of firm level employment and investment to monetary policy shocks 
heavily depends on firms' financial conditions. The last paper of the session by Dean Corbae and Pablo Derasmo studies monetary policy design in a detailed model of the banking sector with heterogeneous banks. Finally, the keynote lecture by Nobel Prize laureate Thomas Sargent and the policy panel composed of James Bollard, Esther George, Claudio Borio, and Pablo Garcia will for sure shed some light on the importance of all these topics for current monetary policy and its expected evolution, including important questions that may remain unanswered. So, I would like to especially thank Gianluca Violante for being the external organizer of this conference, as well as Sofia Bauduco and Andres Fernandez for putting together such a wonderful program. I also thank all the speakers and contributors and look forward to the conference volume that will be published thereafter. Let me finish by thanking Maria Jose Reyes, Constanza Martinelli, Carolina Vesa, Daniela Gaete, Alvaro Castillo, and both the Public Affairs Department of the Economic Research Department of the CBC for all their invaluable help managing the logistic of organizing the first hybrid annual conference. Thank you and have a fruitful, fruitful discussion over new, the new two days. And again, welcome all of you to Santiago. chair this first uh, session of uh, this important conference and I'm delighted to uh, be chairing a session which starts with a paper by Adrian Auclair and Ludwig Straub and which will be, will be discussed by Jonathan Heathrow. Uh, Adrian Auclair is a professor at Stanford Economics Department and he has a number of important affiliations at the Center of, for Economic Policy Research. He's a faculty fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is published in several important journals and his research focuses on inequality, macroeconomics and international economics. And he's also organizer of the site conference on inequality and macroeconomics in the last four years. We're really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for 40, four, 45 minutes.
So, you know, if there is like a pressing question uh, you want to ask to clarify anything in the presentation, you can go ahead and ask. All right, uh, hi everybody. Um, so I echo the governor in thanking the organizers of the conference for putting together this uh, fantastic program. It's truly an honor to be here. And today I wanna talk about what heterogeneous agent new Keynesian models have to say uh, about the transmission of energy, energy shocks and implications for monetary and fiscal policy. So this is joint work with Ludwig who's here uh, Hugo Manori, who's a fantastic grad student at Harvard, and Matt Rogli, who's our uh, usual co-author on, on this series of papers. And so, so the question we want to ask is, is that of how uh, rising energy prices are affecting the economies of energy importers. And this is a, a general study, but we think of this as being particularly relevant for the European situation today, uh, where uh, the, in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine war, there's been very large increases in energy prices and that's uh, clearly affecting these economies. So the traditional kind of thinking around the, the effect of energy prices uh, rests on two uh, types of phenomena. Uh, one is the idea that it's a negative shock to aggregate supply. Uh, so if energy is being used in production, um, redu reducing energy inputs is like a negative shock to productivity. Uh, and the other one, which is very often mentioned in the press and appears to be uh, a phenomenon in the data, is that uh, it's also a negative shock to aggregate demand uh, because fast rising energy prices uh, coupled with a relatively sluggish responses of wages means that for households, real incomes are declining and they have to cut consumption. And so that uh, lowers aggregate demand and that's something that uh, monetary and fiscal uh, authorities are thinking about responding to. Now, um, the first phenomenon is something that's been uh, studied, and there's a series of influential papers by David Bacay, uh, Benjamin Moll and co-authors, uh, thinking about the supply effect of the energy shock, and they have a, a particular application to Germany. Uh, but the, the second is what we're gonna study in this paper. So we're actually going to isolate the effects of productivity. We're not gonna have energy as an input in production. We're gonna be thinking closely about the effects that declining real incomes could have on aggregate demand. Okay, so more specifically, we're gonna ask what, when is this true? So I'm gonna show you this is not actually obvious uh, that this is a phenomenon, even though it's uh, very intuitive, uh, typical uh, models struggle to generate this effect. Uh, we're gonna have a Hank model that does, and then we're gonna ask what the, what the role of monetary and fiscal policy is in, in that situation. And so, so why is it not obvious that uh, rising energy prices generate a negative shock to aggregate demand? Well, standard models to think about this are representative agent, uh, new Keynesian models of a small open economies. Um, and in these models, uh, the rise in energy prices for an energy importer uh, leads to expenditure switching by households towards domestic goods. And, and so that raises demand uh, for domestic goods. Uh, the, the magnitude of this effect is governed by a certain elasticity of substitution, I'm gonna call chi, and I'm, I'm gonna show you what chi is in the context of our model. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so that's an exponential switching effect. On the other hand, there, there may be a decline in real income and that may affect demand, uh, but if, if it does, it's not going to be by much at all because uh, households in these models have very low marginal propensities to consume. Right? So they're either insured against this shock in a complete market world, or they're uninsured, it's an incomplete market world, uh, but they have low marginal propensities to consume, so it doesn't really lower their demand very much. You know, so on balance, think of this as the expenditure switching effect dominates, actually it's a positive shock to aggregate demand. Um, and so here there's very little trade-off for monetary policy. Uh, it's seeing uh, imported inflation, it, it, but it's also seeing a domestic boom, so it just wants to raise interest rates uh, to counter both. Okay, so, so here is where heterogeneous agents come into play, right? and this conference is about this. And so we're gonna show you here, the heterogeneous agent perspective completely uh, reverses the, the standard effect from the representative agent model. Uh, so here it's because these agents, the main reason is these agents have very high marginal propensities to consume, 
And so in particular, in response to these uh, this declining real income, they're now going to cut consumption a lot. Uh, and um, there's still the expenditure switching effect, um, but provided that elasticities of substitution are small, so if you have this low chi, low elasticity of substitution, uh, that effect is trumped by the, the, the effect of, of declining real incomes on aggregate demand. And so now you get a negative aggregate demand shock. Uh, so consumption and demand are falling. And in fact, under an additional condition that we'll specify, you can even get this shock to be a stagflationary shock. And so it's a negative shock to aggregate demand, and on top of that uh, is leading uh, to uh, uh, an increase in wages domestically, and so you get you get wage pressure, you know, infl inflation's going up, uh, wage inflation's going up, price inflation's going up, and you get a recession. It's a stagflation that's generated by the energy shock. So in this situation, the analysis of monetary and fiscal policy are much more interesting. Uh, and so here monetary policy uh, uh, will uh, want to increase interest rates to try to counter the effect on imported inflation, uh, but the the first point we'll make is that it's very hard if you're in isolation, you're a small open economy and you're trying to raise interest rate, it's very hard to influence domestic energy prices. So what you can do is you can appreciate your exchange rate and so that mitigates the effect on the dollar, on the, on the euro price or domestic price of energy, um, but you can, you can only appreciate your exchange rate by so much. Um, but on the other hand, uh, coordinated monetary policy, so if all countries in Europe, let's say, here at the European Central Bank would raise interest rates for everybody, uh, well, that's, um, that's much more powerful because you're now affecting energy demand directly. And so coordinated uh, uh, policies uh, or uh, monetary policy in general has positive externalities because as you raise demand, you, as you raise interest rates, you lower demand for um, all goods, including demand for energy. And so you're now able to bring down the demand for energy worldwide uh, and so that can affect energy prices at the source, like energy prices in dollars. Um, fiscal policy, on the other hand, is going to be very powerful in isolation. And I'll show you, especially things like energy price caps, which have been implemented in Europe. Well, those are very effective at mitigating the effect on households of uh, uh, rising energy prices. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, they have very negative externalities uh, because you're cutting the price mechanism. So, so here, you think the the rise in energy prices is coming from a decline in the energy supply, you need something uh, to bring the energy market in balance. And of course, if you're doing energy price caps, you're, uh, you're exactly removing the price mechanism. And so you're, you're going exactly the wrong way. Uh, and there's gonna be, uh, in our model, a much bigger increase in energy prices uh, when everybody is trying to do energy price caps. Okay? Um, so with that introduction, uh, let me jump into the the outline of the, of the paper, so I'm going to be talking about the model and then discuss how we are um, uh, modeling the energy price shock and the difference between the effects in the representative agent model versus a heterogeneous agent model, uh, where we can get uh, the effects that I've been talking about. Uh, I'll talk about the implications for inflation, and one is it that we can get a stagflationary shock or rise in, in domestic wages, and then um, monetary policy and fiscal policy. Okay, and feel free to uh, ask questions as John Luke has Okay, so here's the model. So, so it's a model that starts uh, from the Galli-Monacelli model, which is a classic um, New Keynesian model of a small open economy. Um, and we're gonna make two changes to that model. So the first one is we're going to introduce a, a new good, an energy good. So it's just to think about the energy price shock. Uh, so we have an energy good in addition to the, a foreign and a home good, so three goods. Um, and the energy good is produced abroad, it's, in, it's imported. We're thinking about the economy of an importer. Um, so there's a large rest of the world that's endowed with this energy good. Um, and then the, the small open economy that we're thinking about, it, it's a part of a continuum of energy importers. Uh, so that's why on its own, uh, if it's just uh, changing domestic policy, it's not going to be able to affect the price of energy. Um, so the households in this small open economy are consuming energy, but as I said, we're gonna strip out the supply side effects for today's analysis just to focus on the aggregate demand effect. So energy is not being used in production here, right? Uh, it's just being used in consumption. So, so households are just consuming energy. So think, you know, in Germany, they're just buying oil directly to heat, heat themselves. Um, 
and then the energy is trading at this world price P star, and in the first part of the talk, this is what we're going to shock. We're just going to imagine that the price rises. Right? Uh, and you can kind of think of this as coming from a decline in the supply uh, in a world market, and that's what we'll do after, uh, when we start thinking about coordinated policies. All right, so that's the first change, is an, an extra good, and then the second change is we're gonna introduce uh, heterogeneity here, and so we're gonna have uh, the type of models that the governor talked about, uh, where households are facing borrowing constraints and idiosyncratic income risk. And the main effect uh, for our purpose, uh, in addition to the heterogeneity and say the consumption share that these models generate, is that it's going to generate a very large average marginal propensities to consume, uh, not just uh, in terms of uh, kind of the impact effects, uh, so the, the MPC that, 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 that's the consumption response to a, an increase in, in income, uh, but also what we've, in other words, we've called, in other work, we've called intertemporal marginal propensities to consume. Um, so in these models, uh, when you give agent a transfer, they'll spend some of this right away and they'll save the rest, but because they're very hungry, uh, the uh, amount that they're saving, they'll actually spend very quickly in the future. Uh, and so what you get uh, is a model of uh, spending down excess savings. Uh, and uh, we think this is uh, you know, really important to think about uh, the current situation uh, where in many countries households have built up excess savings and we're talking about spending them down. And so an observation is if you want a model of spending down of excess savings, well, Hank models are uh, that kind of a model. Right? Uh, agents save in response to transfers, uh, but then they, they spend down their savings and so that affects aggregate demand down the line. a model with a two-tier CS uh, demand structure. Uh, so we have three goods, and uh, at the upper tier, uh, households are splitting their consumption between energy and non-energy uh, with a certain LCCS substitution eta E. So this is the, the first line. So we're gonna have a lot of heterogeneity here. I'm just gonna focus, given your consumption, on how you're spending energy, foreign goods, and home goods. So CI is going to be the consumption of every agent. Agents have homothetic preferences, so all of them uh, split their consumption across these goods in, in the same way, uh, given their level of consumption. So the first equation is just the CS demand equation for energy. Uh, so there's a certain LCC substitution eta E, uh, and then there's a baseline share, which is alpha E. So think alpha is something like 4% of your basket goes to energy, and then if the energy price goes up, uh, you're going to substitute away from energy with an LCC substitution eta E, Imagine that number as being a pretty low number, and, and in estimations by Ben Mull and co-authors, it's a number like 0.1 or 0.2, okay? So very low elasticity substitution in the short run. Um, and so then, if you're not consuming energy, you're consuming a non-energy bundle, and then that non-energy bundle, you're gonna split between a foreign good, which is a good that you're importing, and a domestic good that's going to be produced uh, at home, uh, and the elasticity substitution there is eta. Right? So alpha F is your baseline share of uh, foreign goods, think of it as a number like 20%. Um, and then um, eta, eta is the LCC substitution between the home and the foreign good in the non-energy bundle. Right, so think of this as a larger number, like one. Right, and so for now, uh, we're gonna have flexible prices, linear production, and domestic uh, producers are gonna charge a markup mu. Um, and so that um, immediately uh, tells us what a, a number of these prices are over here. So all the prices that show up in the, uh, in the CS demand system uh, so the energy price, R, that's the dollar price of energy, and then E is the exchange rate. It's the, uh, 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 say, the number of euros per dollar. Um, so E is the nominal exchange rate. Uh, if uh, E goes up, it's a nominal depreciation. Um, and, and so that's one way you can affect energy prices by manipulating your exchange rate. Uh, and then P star for now is taken as exogenous, okay? So, so there's perfect pass-through uh, in this baseline of the worldwide energy price into your domestic prices. Um, and similarly, there's perfect pass-through of the worldwide foreign good price into uh, domestic prices. Now, we're not thinking about the determination of the foreign good price, so, so we're gonna normalize this to one. Uh, so that's the one that's the uh, so The foreign good price is directly uh, equal to your exchange rate. Um, and then finally, the domestic good is produced domestically with linear production and a markup. And so the price of the home good is just a markup times the wage. Okay, okay so that's uh, 
prices and the demand system. Uh, so now let's talk about the determination of consumption. Okay, so this is where the heterogeneous agents uh, come into play. Uh, so think of consumption as being determined by um, a bunch of agents that all are solving this problem of uh, they are living in this small open economy and uh, they, they face idiosyncratic income risk. Uh, so, so in the budget constraint, it's the second term. Um, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do this, uh, but so, um, so in the, in the budget constraint, so, so, so households have uh, a, a certain level of overall income that they make, which is a real wage, product of real wage times N, N is the number of hours they're working. Uh, and then there's fluctuations in E, uh, that's their uh, idiosyncratic productivity. And so that's uh, generated, generating income risk for them. And they insure themselves against this risk by uh, building up a stock of assets and the assets here, there's only one asset in the economy, which is a mutual fund uh, that um, the, uh, agents can accumulate a position in, um, but they face a borrowing constraint. And here, for simplicity, the borrowing constraint is zero. Okay, so they're never gonna be able to have a negative position, but they can have a positive position to insure themselves against these fluctuations. And, and, and uh, so it's a classic Deaton problem. Uh, note that uh, I've, um, I've put the, this utility of labor in, 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 utility, in the utility function, but agents are not choosing their hours. Why? Because here there's wage rigidities, uh, so agents are off their labor supply curve in the short run, and instead they take their hours as given. And the way the model is set up here, all agents are working the same number of hours, N. And so that's not something they're controlling uh, in the short run. Uh, there is a process for determining wages, which is, you can think of this as being bargained on behalf collectively of all the agents in the economy. Uh, so there's gonna be a wage Phillips curve in the background, uh, but uh, agents, uh, from their perspective, when they're solving their consumption saving problem, they're just taking their, their labor income as given. Okay? Um, so that's, um, that's, that's generating uh, consumption uh, for a given individual and then it's generating a whole distribution of agents uh, across the liquid asset and, and idiosyncratic income distribution. Um, and then you can aggregate that across everybody to determine aggregate consumption. So that's the big C, okay? aggregate demand. Um, now foreigners on the other hand, you know, they, they have fixed demand C star, they have a fixed price level, they face flexible prices. So for them, uh, when there's a, an exchange rate depreciation, uh, they, they see a cheaper price and so they substitute towards domestic goods, um, and, and they have their own uh, foreign share, which is alpha E plus alpha F, just to create symmetry in the way this, the system is set up, uh, but we're not gonna focus on this foreign agents, we just think of them as just a source of demand, you know, and if the exchange rate depreciates, that's going to be more demand uh, for, uh, for the small open economy, export demand. Okay. And then um, we're gonna focus on what happens in the domestic goods market, so there's production of these goods uh, uh, according to this linear production, so that's why and that has to be equal to the sum of demand. So there's demand from uh, domestic agents from domestic goods, that's a CH. And then there's demand from foreign agents for the domestic good, that's a CH star. Okay, so just to finish the presentation of the model, we're gonna have three types of assets. Uh, so we have nominal home and foreign bonds and zero net supply. Um, and then we have shares in uh, home goods firms. So remember these, uh, these these firms, they charge a markup of a marginal cost, and so there is a profit that are generated here, and we think of this as, these profits as being just traded in a, in a stock market. Um, so agents can buy and sell shares in these firms, uh, and then the, there's no aggregate risk here, so the, the, the value of the shares, the value of the stock market is just the present discounted value of these dividends. Um, and, then, and then think of asset market clearing, so agents have a total demand for assets, remember these mutual, these mutual fund uh, assets, um, so they're, they're just, giving all this wealth to the mutual funds and the mutual funds are investing in the domestic stock market, that's the V, and then any excess of funds they'll invest abroad, that's the net foreign asset position of the country. Now the domestic central bank is setting the nominal interest rate on nominal home bonds, right? Those home bonds in zero net supply and so it's, it's influencing this nominal interest rate and, and we're gonna be considering a bunch of rules for monetary policy, a bunch of reactions, but for baseline, uh, we're gonna think of a simple Taylor rule with a coefficient on, of one unexpected inflation. Um, so that's like the central bank is targeting a certain CPI based uh, real rate. Right? And that's going to simplify the analysis. 
um, for us and allow us to prove a number of, uh, of analytical results, uh, but we just think of this as like a useful benchmark anyway for thinking about policy. Okay? Um, now, so that's the, that's the domestic central bank. Now, abroad, just think that there is a, a global real interest rate, R star, the risk-free rate on dollar bonds, and, and the, the world is at a steady state, so this R is constant. Um, and so this um, immediately through simple UIP type logic allows us to pin, pin down exchange rates. Okay, so uh, the, the, there's uh, the, 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 the mutual fund manager, UIP condition, that's, that's an arbitrage condition, that's, that's spinning down returns. Um, and so the, because the central bank is anchoring the real interest rate as a, some baseline, that's also the, the exposed rate of return on all assets uh, after date zero where there could be some shock. Uh, but going forward, the, the return is constant and, it, and the UIP condition holds. So because the central bank is holding the real interest rate constant on R and the foreign interest rate is also R, uh, that immediately tells us that the real exchange rate in this baseline is constant. Okay? And so that's simplifying the analysis. So the real rate is constant, and then the, the nominal exchange rate uh, just follows the standard nominal UIP. Okay, so let's, uh, let's study the energy shock. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about representative agents first, and we we'll have a, a simple analytical result, and then I'll talk about what happens with heterogeneous agents. And so, so we're gonna do a tentative calibration to a European country, so something like 4% of domestic um, goods are in energy. Um, and then there is a shock, uh, which we think of a, a shock that proxies for the energy shock we saw in Europe, so something like a, a doubling of the energy price. Uh, and it's, it's very persistent. Uh, and ask, okay, how, the economy is uh, how is the economy responding? Okay, so let me first look at the case of the representative agent model. So here you can set up the representative agent either with complete or incomplete markets. For simplicity, I'm gonna assume there's complete markets. And so there, it's extremely simple to determine what happens to consumption because remember I told you the real exchange rate is constant and there's a Bacchus Smith condition so we, so we know that consumption is constant. Right? So even though there may be a decline in real income that's insured uh, in, a, in a complete market world and so there's actually no effect on aggregate consumption, uh, uh, but there's of course the substitution effect uh, because the, as, as the energy price is rising, uh, households are going to be substituting towards domestic goods, and so that happens through the CES demand system. Um, and similarly, um, yeah, uh, so, yeah, so, so it happens via the CES demand system, and, and so we can, um, we can kind of take this equation, you know, where, where the demand for both the, the domestic residents and foreigners is fixed, and just work through uh, the effect that this has on, uh, on total expenditure switching, so the, the, the rise in the foreign good price, or so the foreign energy price, P star, uh, is, uh, is creating substitution. And then also, uh, because the central bank is anchoring the real exchange rate, uh, that means that the nominal exchange rate is rising with the CPI, right? and so that's actually uh, creating a change in the terms of trade. So it's making the foreign good price a little bit more expensive relative to the home good price. So there's two types of substitution here and both of which lead to an increase in the demand for home goods, okay? And so you, you see the overall effect on, on output is just uh, alpha E, so that's your share of energy over one minus uh, 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 the sum of alpha E and alpha F, so that's your home bias, um, times a certain chi times the effect on the price, right? So there's kind of two things here, and I have an expression for the SEC substitution, so you know, two things to notice. The first is that it's just pure expenditure switching, right? So so in particular, it's a boom. It's a boom that's proportional to the energy share in, in spending. And so, so say it, it's, uh, the baseline would be 4%, and then what's chi? Well, chi is a certain weighted average of the elasticity of substitution, because here you care both about your elasticity of substitution between, uh, between energy and non-energy, and also because of the effect I talked about, you care about the elasticity of substitution between home and foreign goods. Uh, and so it's a certain weighted average, um, but in a relatively closed economy, uh, you think you can see that this is going to be close to the elasticity uh, substitution between energy and non-energy. So it's going to be a small number. So think of chi as something like 0.1 to point, you know, in our calibration is going to be 0.25, right? So it's a small number. Okay, so that's the effect uh, in, the, in the representative Asian model. So just to summarize, the, the level is going to be pinned down by the energy share and, and the elasticity substitution, this chi. 
so on the right is consumption, so consumption is insured, so no matter what chi is, you'll have a completely flat level of consumption, and then there's a boom, and uh, there's a bigger boom if chi is bigger, uh, but think, you think of chi as being somewhere between the, the green and the blue line here, okay? So it's a relatively small effect, but remember, I doubled the energy price, so here we have an effect of something like one to 2% on GDP, so it, it's a non-trivial effect, but it's a boom. Um, okay, so what happens with the heter heterogeneous agents? So, so here, uh, there's a new effect, uh, because first of all, the, the country isn't insured against this shock, uh, and so there's now a decline in real incomes for agents, and agents have high marginal propensities to consume. So, so remember, they have sticky wages, prices are rising really quickly, so that's a big squeeze in real incomes. What do they do? They cut cons consumption. And so there's an effect, there's a cut in the overall level of demand, the overall level of C. In addition, there's the expenditure switching effect, but remember I said chi is probably kind of low. So in our calibration, where we have a realistic level of marginal propensity to consume, like 25 cents on the dollar quarterly, uh, as we start to lower chi towards kind of realistic numbers, so somewhere between the blue and the green line, uh, so first of all, you see consumption is falling, and then that's affecting total demand for domestic goods, and it's now a negative shock to aggregate demand. Okay, so, so this is kind of the first takeaway message here, is if you introduce heterogeneity in these models, you can get these energy prices with low elasticities of substitution to, to be negative shocks to aggregate demand. Okay? And so here we get, we get a recession, like a 3% recession from this 100% rise in the energy price. Okay, so now let me talk about implications for inflation. Okay, so we're gonna wanna, uh, wanna quantify this model, and so we want uh, to add a little bit of realism uh, to think about inflation. So here, I, remember I said there's perfect pass-through of uh, oil shock or an energy price shock worldwide on domestic prices. In practice, it looks like the pass-through is somewhat delayed, and so a simple way to do this is to introduce price rigidities in the energy market as well as in the foreign goods market. So we just say there's retailers, they're buying energy at the dollar price, and then they're selling it domestically, but there's some price stickiness there, and that's going to slow down the pass-through uh, to uh, in domestic inflation. Um, and so, so these are just standard uh, Newkins and Phillips curves for for the energy price and the and the foreign good price. Um, and then on top of that, we're going to have a wage Phillips curve, and so, and so here we're going to borrow uh, ideas from Jordi and um, and Olivia Blanchard uh, that that when you're thinking about an oil shock you may want to add a real rigidity to the model. Uh, and so what's the real rigidity here? It's going to show up as, remember I said there's unions that are bargaining wages on behalf of uh, workers here. Um, and, and those unions, they take into account the standard objective of agents. So agents have a certain marginal rate of substitution between hours and consumption at a point in time. They're looking at the real wage. Uh, but we're gonna say they're, they're maybe putting a, a somewhat higher weight than the normal weight on the real wage. And what's that proxying for? Well, we think there's kind of an anchor uh, of, uh, real, for, of real wages for consumers when they're resetting wages. And it looks like that's discussed a lot in the press. So is your real wage going down? You know, is the rate of wage inflation uh, in line with the rate of price inflation? Uh, but remember here, we're getting these big energy shocks. So the, 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 the price of C the CPI is clearly going up just because of this. And so if, if unions are, are really stuck on ma maintaining real wages, uh, that's going to show up as a chi, right? it's, it's a positive chi. Right? So it's, uh, it's, it's putting extra weight on smoothing real wages over and above what a normal union would do. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about the implications of this. Okay, so, so let's start with the chi equals zero case. So this is, uh, this is a normal union, you know, with the normal function. Um, well, so, so here, the energy price uh, shock is a negative demand shock. So, 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 so this is a baseline calibration with a relatively low chi. Uh, so you see the effect on output, it's a 3% it's a decline in the level of output. Uh, that's very persistent. And it's accompanied with a decline in wage inflation. So, so why, well, yes, the real wage is going down, right? But you're in a recession. And so when you're thinking about the unions bargaining wages, you know, that effect dominates. It's the effect that you're just in the domestic recession, so your hours are, and the consumption are going down. Marco. Zeta is the real wage rigidity parameter. Yeah, sorry if I misspoke. Yes, so zeta is zero, it's the real um, rigidity parameter. So here, standard uh, union objective. And um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm studying first what happens under under the, the standard objective, right? So under the standard objective, it's a it's a it's a negative aggregate demand shock that has puts negative pressure on domestic wages. So wage inflation is actually falling in 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 this parameterization. Now, CPI inflation is rising, and you can see it's rising somewhat persistently at the beginning. Well, that's just because of this slow pass-through of the dollar increase in the dollar price of energy to consumer prices. So it's just imported inflation, right? But after that effect is gone, all you're left with is deflation. Okay, and so we think that there's something missing there, and, and the way to, to fix this is to, add, to increase uh, this zeta, right? So zeta is this, this weight that the unions are placing on, 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 on real wage smoothing. Um, and so as you start to increase this zeta, uh, now you have this new effect. So, so what's happening is there's imported inflation, unions are seeing this, and they're like, well, imported inflation is creating a decline in real wages. I really dislike declines in real wages. And so they start to bid up domestic wages. And so that's actually, when zeta is large enough, uh, it's, it's enough to uh, create an increase in wage inflation. So now you're, you're in a stagflationary situation. You have a very big decline in demand. Output is down. You see the, the zeta here is not really affecting the path of output. What it really is doing for us is it's, it's, it's pushing up wage inflation. And then there's a wage price spiral because, of course, wage inflation feeds into home goods prices and so feeds into domestic uh, consumer inflation and so on, right? And so, so then wage, unions are demanding even more of an increase in wages. And, and so you get the blue line with uh, a, a, a lot of wage inflation and a lot of CPI inflation, okay? So we think that this may be relevant for thinking about Europe today. Um, so the combination of heterogeneous agents that are creating this big uh, negative demand pressure from the energy price shock and a uh, real smoothing objective uh, that may be pushing w up w uh, domestic wages. Okay, so, um, so now I've, I've set up the model. Uh, Can and I ask a question? Uh, of course. A question. Yeah. Um, clarification. Um, what about profit margins? You, you haven't mentioned profit margins, which I think. Profit margins of, of, uh, of firms? Of yeah, energy so producers, particularly. So, so there's kind of multiple sources of uh, sources of profits here. Uh, so, but the, the 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 in the in the basic model. So, without um, without these importers, uh, there, there's just an effect on uh, profit margins are, are basically proportional to output. So, sorry, the the margin itself is constant, and then the level of profits is proportional to output. So, firms are are, are losing profits here. Um, in proportion to output. So basically real wages are declining, uh, w profits are declining, and uh, domestic agents are holding these firms. Remember, they're they are holding a portfolio of, of, um, of mutual funds that are invested in these firms. So the stock market is declining here, and that's actually having a, an, an effect on consumption, even though it's a relatively small effect, um, uh, uh, or you think of this as a smaller effect because the, the marginal propensity to consume out of a decline in the stock price is, is going to be less. Um, but but so that effect is there too. Okay, so 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 basically, stock market bust, and um, you know, in this baseline, that's all that's happening. There's also a small effect on the margins of these importers. Okay, so so let's talk about implications for monetary policy. So the 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 baseline, remember, has constant real interest rates, and so we can think so so constant real interest rates is the blue line on the right, and and so that. Uh, of course, CPI is rising here, so central bank is tightening monetary policy in terms of the nominal interest rate uh, to keep up. Um, and then we're going to think of uh, alternative monetary policy scenarios where the central bank is actually either being e easy, so it's easing, so something like a 2% impact decline on the real rate, or tight, it's uh, increasing the real interest rate by 2%. So that's just, a, just around this baseline scenario, what happens if the central bank tries to tighten more or ease more? And um, so as, as you'd expect, if it eases, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's mitigating the effect on output. If it's tightening, uh, it's going to uh, lower output by more. And so, so here, from a baseline of, say, 3% decline in output, you get a 5% decline in a tight monetary policy scenario uh, because consumption is falling by more. Now real interest rates are rising and, and consumers are uh, lowering their spending. Um, and there's also an effect on exchange rate. Uh, which is maybe something that you'd be looking for in this situation. Remember, the energy price is going up, so one thing you may want to do is to appreciate your exchange rate to mitigate the effect that that has on the home uh, price of energy. 
right? And so remember, Q going down is an appreciation. So in a tight monetary policy scenario, you're appreciating your exchange rate, but notice that you're not appreciating it by very much, right? So, so, so here it's something like a 3% appreciation of the real exchange rate, but the energy price went up by 100%, right? And so the point is, if you want to mitigate the effect of the energy shock on the domestic energy price via an exchange rate appreciation, you can only do so much without really crushing your domestic economy. Right? So yes, you can mitigate the effect, but it's only by so much on, if you're on your own. And so, um, so, so, th so this graph makes this point. It's just looking at this tight versus easy scenario. You're looking at the effect on domestic energy prices. So remember, there's the, the, the initial shock and then there's limited slow pass through to domestic consumer prices. And so relative to that baseline scenario, what happens if you have tight monetary policy? Well, you're just lowering that uh, domestic energy price by a little bit. Um, and so inflation, CPI inflation is mitigated a little bit, uh, but not so much because imported inflation is less, but mostly because you're really uh, crushing the domestic economy, you're lowering demand, and so then wage demand is falling. So, so or wage inflation is falling. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of uncoordinated monetary policy scenario. Uh, but now we want to think about what happens if you have all these energy importers that are raising uh, interest rates at the same time. Okay, so how do you think of this? Well, so remember so far I've taken the small open economy perspective where you take the price as exogenous. Uh, but imagine instead that this is coming from a decline in the supply. Okay, and so this graph kind of shows this uh, visually. Uh, imagine that there's a fixed supply of energy C star, and then what's actually really happening is that there's a decline in the energy supply. And that's the energy shock. And so we're going to read off, well, how much of a demand, of a supply decrease do you need in order to get an energy price increase of 100% given households' uh, demand system for energy? So remember, they have a certain elasticity substitution ADA. Right? And so this is how we're, now we're thinking, okay, the energy shock comes from this. So it's irrelevant in the small open economy, but it does matter for the world economy uh, so if everybody is tightening together, why? Because if everybody's tightening together, they're lowering overall demand for goods, including demand for energy. And so in a, in a coordinated tightening situation, what's happening is that you're shifting in the, the, the demand for energy, and so you're mitigating the price increase. So starting from the initial, the initial price was 100%, now you can really mitigate this if you're doing all of this together. Okay, and so that can have a big effect on the price of energy. So this is, uh, this, is, this is my next simulation. So we're gonna get positive spillovers from increasing domestic interest rates because you're, you're having an effect on the demand for energy. If everybody does this together, we can lower, uh, we, can, we can shifting aggregate demand. Um, and so if they're all hiking now, you can see on the left, you can have a, a, a much bigger effect on, on the domestic uh, energy price because you're affecting the, the price at the source. You're affecting the overall world demand for energy. Okay, and so that, um, so, and, and so that, um, that mitigates the, the, the effect on the domestic economy, both via inflation and also the, the recession that you have to bear. Okay, so now let me talk about fiscal policy. So this is one of the really great benefits of these heterogeneous agent models is you have a, a fine grain kind of view of, of the heterogeneous effects across the population. And so you can start to think about fiscal policies that have you know, much more uh, subtle uh, trade-offs, uh, including distributional trade-offs, than you would in a representative agent model. And so, so here we're going to be con comparing a, a bunch of uh, policies uh, that are policies that have been discussed in Europe uh, for dealing with the energy shock. Yeah. So a simple one is just a, a, a price subsidy, yeah. uh, including going all the way to a price cap. So you just say, add the pump directly uh, when uh, people are buying uh, oil, uh, we're, we're just fixing the price or we're directly, uh, we're directly telling uh, energy companies not to raise their prices. Okay, so it's, it's, a, price, uh, it's a price subsidy and then the government uh, is bearing the fiscal cost of that. Or you can do transfers to households. Um, and so a simple kind of transfer is what's your normal level of consumption? Okay, now energy price went up. Okay, I'll just compensate you for this. Uh, so we're gonna call this a targeted subsidy is based on your usual level of consumption. Now, uh, those types of, of, of transfers, of course, they benefit the rich because the rich consume more energy. Uh, and so uh, if it's based on your usual level of consumption, it's actually going to be poor targeting from the perspective of marginal propensities to consume. Uh, you're going to uh, 
affect the people with low MPC a lot. Uh, or uh, you can do an untargeted transfer, so just send a check to everybody. Um, and uh, if it's the same magnitude as the other one, now that's uh, better targeting from the perspective of marginal capacity to consume, you affect the poor more, uh, and so you're gonna have more effect on demand. Okay, and so we think of these um, as all deficit finance. Okay, so, so what do these do? Well, they raise demand, uh, all of them. Uh, and uh, the untargeted policy is the one that raises demand the most uh, because it's really uh, affecting uh, agents on average with larger marginal capacities to consume. Uh, so that's the green line. Um, and then both the subsidy and the targeted uh, policy are, are, are you know, raising consumption and so they're mitigating the output loss. Um, and and so, so that seems good. Uh, what about inflation? Uh, well, the transfer programs, they raise demand. So the transfer programs are not great for inflation, they're inflationary. There is now a boost, you're fueling domestic demand. Yes? Sorry, uh, I just called to tell you five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Yep, I, I see it in the big screen there. <laughs> um, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so we're deficit financing uh, the transfers. So, so at the beginning, it all goes into, um, into government debt. And then over time, that government debt is, is being repaid uh, via proportional um, tax. Uh, and think of the, the persistence of the debt has been pretty high. So we're repaying this over the next, say, five to 10 years. Um, so, um, so these transfer programs, I was saying, they're inflationary. They're fueling demand. And so you see this in the wage inflation graph. Uh, you're, now, uh, you're now putting all Right, so you're, you're, you're fueling demand, that's like raising wage inflation, that's raising CPI inflation, and, and so on, okay? But on the other hand, these, uh, these price subsidies, they look great. Yeah. Uh, why? Well, because if you're looking at the, um, the effect on domestic energy prices now, it's, it's, it's nothing. I mean, the government is, is basically directly affecting the price. Um, and so, so those look good, right? So those don't affect inflation as much, and they... Um, and they mitigate the effect on demand. So what could be wrong? Well, um, and, and oh, and by the way, it, uh, you can look at inequality, which is another thing you can do with these heterogeneous models is just look at various measures of inequality. Here is a simple one, the variance of log consumption. Um, and, and, and so the initial shock, the blue line is, is raising inequality here. Uh, and then all these programs, they're mitigating the effect on inequality, uh, including the untargeted transfers is actually lowering inequality. Yeah, so, um, okay, so, so the subsidy looks great. Uh, but, uh, of course, if everybody uses it, well, that's a disaster. So you have to think of this in a world economy now. So what if everybody uh, subsidizes the price of energy? You're basically breaking the, the price system. Uh, so there's big negative externalities on everybody. So you, this is over here now. Uh, so the, in, in the subsidy case, you're subsidizing the price of energy. So what happens? Well, households are not cutting their energy demand so, um, or increasing it. Uh, and, then, um, and then at the world level, that's putting even more upward pressure on the demand, and what you're trying to do is to reduce the demand. Um, and, and so it's a huge negative externality on everybody. Uh, and it, in fact, uh, even the, the inequality benefits are, are gone when you do this. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, and I should see this over here, the only way in which you can lower demand, and the only way in which the equilibrium uh, happens here is that there's a very big recession domestically uh, that's actually lowering demand for the world as a whole. Uh, even though demand is much less price elastic, at some point you're reaching an equilibrium in the energy market, but it's one in which everybody is in a big recession uh, and they're very insensitive to the price of energy. Okay, so kind of cautionary tale for thinking about these energy price caps is uh, they are very ineffective at the world level uh, and, you, and, you know, um, they probably have distributional effects across countries as well. Okay, so, so just to conclude, we're using this open economy heterogeneous model to speak to the current energy uh, crisis in, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and so big takeaway is with heterogeneous agents and low elasticities of substitution, as is likely the case for energy, uh, these effects are negative aggregate demand shocks. And if you, in, in addition, add real wage concerns, a la Blanchard and Galli, you can get a stagflationary shock. Um, Monetary policy alone uh, does very little because it only, only does it affects the exchange rate. It just appreciates the exchange rate a bit, uh, but it has positive externalities because if everybody tightens at the same time, you lower demand. Uh, so you want all the major countries to hike together in response to this. 
And then fiscal support alone is very powerful, especially these price caps, uh, but it has these hugely negative externalities. Uh, and likely what happens at the end of the day is distributional effects across countries where some countries like Germany can do this, um, and then some countries uh, can't do this, and so they end up bearing the brunt of the reduction in er energy demand. Um, and so if you have less fiscal space, maybe you'll bear the cost. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> I, uh, so I'm very happy to discuss this, this very exciting uh, paper on a very important question. So we know that uh, energy price shocks are not a thing of the past. And we still don't have much of a consensus about how best policy should respond to them. And we'd like to know if we're doing a good job in the United States and, and European governments would like to know if their policy is, is, is well calibrated also. So this is a very nice uh, paper and a very nice model for thinking through those questions. It builds on some related work the authors have in previous papers. And uh, to understand it all, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a sticky price monetary model in the background, heterogeneous agents, incomplete markets model. And then this is in an international setting, so you sort of have to be uh, on top of international finance too. So, so it's an all-star team writing a paper that they know all of these different pieces. Uh, I'm going to make one small comment, more about language and a framing comment before I, I, I go into much more detail. One is just that I think that internationally, Probably there's a consensus markets are not complete. No trade, complete set of state contingent claims. And so I'm totally sympathetic to that view that we should be modeling international asset trade in an incomplete market setting. There's a lot of papers, though, I would say that do that. So, so, so sometimes in the, in the setting, they talk about complete markets and representative agents as sort of synonymous. But I think you can, uh, you know, you can easily think about a representative agent setting domestically and international markets that are not complete, and there's a bunch of papers that have done that. Okay, so, so their basic model has many, many uh, pieces, a lot of things going on, and um, I am going to try to start with a very simple model and explain how some of these different ingredients work piece by piece as a, as a sort of building, uh, building up to try and get somewhere close to the, to, to, to the rich model that they have at the end in, in the paper. So I'm just gonna start with a, a very simple setup Imagine there are two symmetric countries, each has a representative household. The foreign country has some endowment of oil E that's gonna be shocked. Imagine to start there are no nominal frictions, no sticky wages or prices. Each country produces the non-oil good using labor supply. And imagine that consumption in both countries is just a composite of the non-oil consumption good and oil with some weights alpha and one minus alpha. I think you can think about this aggregator function for aggregating oil and non-oil. You can think about it as, well, oil and non-oil consumption are two different forms of consumption. There's some substitutability between them. Or you could think about it as that being, these are two different intermediate goods that are aggregating in production. So you can think about, you know, this is kind of a intermediate inputs or, or, or different forms of consumption. Anyway, if, it's a, if you have this Cobb Douglas case to start with, then utility just ends up being separable between consumption of the non oil good, oil good, and, and, and labor supply. And imagine these two countries create a bond. So in each country, the budget constraint says spending on the non oil good, spending on oil, 
you can farm them in the pond and you have some weight in there. And then the world resource constraints, the, the oil consumption in both countries adds up to the oil endowment P, and then the non-oil consumption adds up to the total output produced in the two countries. So I think this is sort of a nice little uh, model to start thinking through the effect of a shock to, to this oil supply E. Imagine that there's a negative MIT shock there, it goes down and it maybe gradually comes back over time. So in this simple setup, what happens? So this, this, this is simple kind of you know, stylized model, nothing really happens. What happens? The price of oil is gonna rise exactly by the same amount as the supply of oil falls with this Cobb Douglas aggregator and consumption. Both countries are gonna reduce the consumption of oil by the same amount. Neither country is going to change hours worked or consumption of the non-oil goods. So there's no spillover here from the oil shock to the rest of the economy. There's no change in the value of imports. The quantity goes down. The quantity of oil imports goes down, but the price goes up exactly the same amount. There's no international borrowing and lending. Both countries see real wages fall. They fall because the price of energy goes up. Both see aggregate co consumption decline because there's less oil to go around, so that's kind of reducing total output. The real interest rate's temporarily high. But in this setup, with this coal Obsfeld sort of insurance through the terms of trade, a model with a single bond traded internationally is basically equivalent to a complete market setting. You're getting perfect insurance through the terms of trade, and because you have separability and preferences, there's no spillover from, from the change in the price of oil into hours or, or non-oil output. Second little model. Now, one important ingredient that, that Adrian talked about is the fact that oil and non-oil consumption are probably pretty complementary, right? The, you, if you think about it as a production or consumption, it's kind of hard to substitute between oil and non-oil consumption. So suppose we have the same shock now where these two inputs are pretty complementary. The price of oil is going to rise a lot more than the supply falls. I mean, OPEC has figured that out a long time ago. If you reduce the price of oil, the price is going to go up a lot. So this oil shock's gonna be much better news for the oil producers than it is for the consumers. What happens in this flexible price setting to non-oil output here? So I think the answer is it's gonna depend on how much households care about smoothing total composite consumption over time. If you really wanna smooth total composite consumption and you've got less oil to work with, you're gonna have to work harder to make up for that. Versus on the other hand, how much you wanna smooth this mix of non-oil to oil consumption in your, in your consumption bucket. So to take an extreme example, suppose you really care a lot about this, suppose that oil and non-oil, they enter in, in a Leontier fashion in this, in this consumption aggregator. If you've got less oil inputs, well, you just want less of the non-oil input as well because you can't, you, can't, you can't do anything with this extra non-oil output you're, you're producing. So in that case, if there's a lot of complementarity in the consumption aggregator, the efficient response to a reduction in oil supply is that both countries should reduce hours and reduce non-oil output. So that would be the efficient response. You get a non-oil recession. What about the current account? Well, here, the oil importer, you know, this, this change in the price of oil makes them much poorer temporarily. So they want to borrow from the oil exporter, and that's, the, uh, that, that's what happens to the, to, to the current account. Okay, so the paper says, well, you know, that's a representative agent setting. Heterogeneity is important. They have a very rich micro-founded model with agents facing idiosyncratic income shocks and standard sort of borrowing constraints. Suppose to take a simpler version of that, we imagine there's just two types of workers. There are some, there are some people who will work and they, they are handsome out, they eat their wage income. And then there's another group that can borrow and lend. And in particular, they can access the, an international bond market. Okay. So now the same shock, reduction in the foreign oil supply. These workers, if they have balanced growth type preferences, they're not gonna reduce their hours no matter what happens to the prices that they face. And so hours and output, actually in this, two, in this model with these two types of, of agents, hours and output are gonna be too high when, they, when the oil shock hits. Their model, they are gonna assume that wages are sticky so the labor market doesn't clear, and that's gonna be, I think, an important ingredient in any hanged model, because these hanged models, you know, they have the property, if you have balanced growth preferences, wages are flexible so the labor market clears, doesn't matter what shocks you hit the model by, with, with balanced growth preferences, the workers always wanna work the same number of hours. So hours and output 
are going to be insensitive to any shocks in, in, in those types of models. So I think you want to have sticky wages. Okay, so that's the first problem, you're going to get too much output. The second problem is the importing country, the capitalists can borrow in the bonds, so they're going to borrow, if this is a temporary oil shock, they want to borrow to finance consumption, they're going to end up consuming more than the workers. Okay, so you have output too high, and you get this consumption inequality problem that the people who can borrow are able to maintain consumption, the people who can't are going to consume too little. So the optimal policy is to transfer. You want to, maybe through deficit financing, you want to make transfers to the workers. That's going to increase the consumption of the workers. And through wealth effects, reduce their hours, and that's going to push you in the direction of efficient allocation. So transfers in this flexible, flexible price, flexible wage setting, those are going to improve efficiency, but they're going to reduce output. Okay, so now, now, now the bit that I get uh, you know, less, less comfortable with, I'm going to introduce a wage friction. Less comfortable only because I don't know this, this literature. So introduce a wage friction. So now suppose that workers are reluctant to let their real wage fall. I think that makes sense. I think a lot of uh, workers in the US and in Europe are complaining that prices are rising faster than wages and people don't feel like that's fair. Okay. So suppose now these two countries produce different goods as in, as in Adrian's model and preferences are biased toward the locally produced good. So now with this, this wage friction, this energy shock is gonna lead to a bigger recession. Why? Because, because, because workers insist on, on real wages staying high. Firms pass that on in terms of higher prices and that leads to lower demand for domestically produce, produced goods on the world market. And that lower demand lower, translates to lower sales, lower income, and lower income in a world with high marginal propensities to consume kind of has this multiplier effect feeds, feeds back again into lower demand and you get a further income decline. Yes. Okay, so what to do in this setting? So again, the capitalists, they can borrow. So again, you want to use fiscal policy to, 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 to effectively allow the workers to borrow. Monetary policy now can, can have some real impact on allocations. If the importing government cuts interest rates, so that's gonna stimulate demand, raise the price of, for domestic goods, firms are gonna hire more workers and produce more output. Cutting, cutting domestic interest rates is gonna, is gonna depreciate the real exchange rate by the same amount, so you're gonna preserve UIP. Now you might think that you know, with the right amount of monetary stimulus, you can kind of undo the impact of this wage friction that's keeping wages too high I think you'd want to think through, and this wage setting model is a little, little reduced form here, so you know you want to think in a little bit more carefully about how wage setters, whoever's setting wages in this model, how are they going to respond to changes in monetary policy? I wasn't, I don't think you can really answer that question in this model. And a good point Adrian made is that if you do stimulate demand by cutting interest rates, well, you're just going to increase demand for oil and further increase oil prices. So there's an unintended, you know, an unintended side effect there. Two very important messages in the paper. I think the first one came, Adrian presented very clearly. These energy subsidies are just a terrible idea. They increase the demand for oil. They push oil prices even higher. They look good for inflation, but only because in the official inflation statistics, you're measuring prices after the subsidy. All the extra inflation is sort of buried in the government budget deficit. I think it's much better to make transfers to people to deal with the cost of living, make transfers that people can spend however they like. For example, in the UK, part of the response has been basically to give everybody 400 pounds uh, cash that they can spend however they like. Better to do that instead of paying a fraction of people's energy bills. Second very important point that they made that I, that I liked a lot was this idea that policy matters whether you think about a small economy or a bunch of economies that are coordinating. A single small economy can't do much about the price of oil countries all together tax oil, that's going to reduce the price. If everybody subsidizes oil, that's going to increase the price. And in terms of thinking about coordinated monetary policy, if everybody tightens at the same time, it's going to reduce the oil price. So maybe there's some, 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 some logic for that. But I still think at the end of the day, even coordinated monetary policy is going to be a pretty blunt tool for trying to bring down world oil prices. I think this is uh, another message that I took from reading the paper and from thinking about it. These energy, energy price shocks are fundamentally bad news shocks. Higher oil prices 
shrink a country's budget set. Lower oil supply for the global economy shrinks the set of feasible allocations that, are, that can be attained. So if you think about how to manage an, an oil shock, there's going to be some pain. It's just a bad shock. There's nothing to be done about that. You're either going to have to consume less or you're going to have to work more. And other shocks are going to look similar. It doesn't matter if you think about lower supply of Russian gas, lower supply of Ukrainian wheat, or, or fewer microchips from Taiwan. These are, these are inputs in, that are highly complementary to other inputs in production and consumption. A reduced supply of them is going to be a bad shock. So there's no way to avoid pain. The policy response that you take through the fiscal side or the monetary side, it's just a choice about how you want to inflict that pain on the residents of the country. The US, I would say, has chosen relatively stimulative policy in the last couple of years. So Americans are seeing the pain of these energy shocks, mostly in the form of, of working more hours, and to some extent in the form of higher inflation. Consumption in the US has been relatively strong, but even in the US, I would say consumption growth has been weak relative to growth in, in labor input. Sort of the trade-off you would expect in the face of these shocks. So I'm out of time. Just to conclude, I think the authors are doing a uh, very important, very uh, exciting paper. I haven't really done full justice to everything that's in their paper. I think it would be uh, great to keep pushing in both positive and normative directions. What is the optimal policy response? And can we, in this kind of context of models, can we explain some of the recent developments we see for, for particular economies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for such perceptive comments. Um, we have now 15 minutes for comments or questions. Um, yes. Uh, uh, great presentation and discussion. I'd like to ask a question about uh, uh, what the model can tell, I, I understand it's a, a way of the exercise that has been performed, but uh, uh, one can think that uh, uh, energy prices can move for some global factors that may also affect uh, a small open economy, for instance, moving in our star or some other stuff that may uh, come up, uh, which is a way of the exercise. The exercise try to keep the, try, try, try to be clean in, in that sense. But one may think that, for instance, if the motivation of the paper is going to be the Ukrainian-Russian uh, crisis, one may think that that affect all prices, but that may, that may also affect uh, our star or some other uh, variables, which interacted with, uh, with heterogeneous agents uh, models may give us some lessons that are different from a representative agent model. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Don't see any hands. I, I actually had some questions, if I may. Um, I think the first point was about that I already mentioned in, in the middle of your presentation is because you look at the impact of uh, wages and the role they can play uh, in accelerating or not inflation. But I think profit margins. Uh, may also play a role, particularly I refer here to the profit margins of the energy companies, um, which are supposed to have had quite a, a big increase. And my other question is, um, if I may, um, you mentioned that the elasticity of substitution between uh, domestic and foreign was a little bit higher energy. But I think there's a question there of timing, because it, you know, it takes time, particularly in the case, well, both of wheat and of oil or natural gas, to increase your domestic production. Say if you're going to start producing more renewables domestically or plant more wheat, um, it, it will take time. So the supply will be, response will be slower. I don't know how that would be incorporated. So thank you very much. I see there are more questions now. Please. A very interesting uh, paper. I was wondering to what extent the kinds of rigidities you have in this model 
would also apply to thinking about the uh, energy transition to green energy and to the extent that that's very bumpy and you get shocks and these sorts of supply shortages, does that suggest some very negative aspects of the transition or are most of those rigidities that you have in your model ones that would dissipate quickly? Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Is it okay if we take all in three? Can, can I do it? We have yeah. more? Um, I have one, one uh, I mean, I guess two comments. Uh, the first one is that about the, you know, the real wage rigidity and the sort of the union desire to uh, uh, increase real wages. I think it, th there's some interesting like case studies in the Eurozone, for example, because I mean, obviously countries are subject to the same monetary policy. But for example, Belgium has pretty much perfect indexation of, of wages to, to prices, and while Italy has very little indexation. And stuff. If you look at the wage growth, real wage, nominal wage growth, sorry, uh, in 2022 is over 6% uh, for wages in Belgium, and it's about, you know, less than 2% in Italy. Um, so, I mean, your model has, has implications for, obviously, for the, the extent to, uh, to which these two countries will go through, like, falling output. So it would be interesting to kind of, well, I guess we have to wait a little bit to, to see what happens, but yeah. And, and the other thing is, um, I mean, in a model where you have, say, uh, two sectors, one is that, that is more intensive in energy, the other one is, is less intensive, uh, I guess adjustment would uh, require a reallocation of labor between the two sectors. So it's another form of like real rigidity um, that, uh, uh, you know, you might, I mean, I, yeah. yeah. I enjoyed very much the, the paper. I have a question. You're in your, in contrast with Jonathan's model, which was like a, a general equilibrium model of the world economy, you, you, your baseline model is a, is a partial equilibrium model in which the small open economy takes the dollar price of energy as given. Now, I think it's useful always to, to look at what's the first best response in that context. The first best response, if, if I'm not uh, mistaken, would be one in which uh, wages and prices, uh, nominal wages and the nominal price all increase one for one with uh, the price of oil and nothing real uh, really changes. Again, because we're talking it's a partial equilibrium model was full general equilibrium, uh, uh, that would not be the first best from the uh, uh, point of view of the world. So um, then you introduce uh, wage rigidities, which obviously make the response to deviate from the first best. Now, uh, when you introduce real wage rigidities, I would have expected this uh, real wage rigidity suppo to support aggregate demand somehow because of the higher MPC MPCs of uh, workers, but in your picture, you know, you emphasize the difference in the response of inflation and so on, that was more, more plausible and so on, but the output was, uh, I don't know if it was exactly the same, but it was really one on top of the other, which surprises me. I thought that a nice feature of uh, real wage rigidities in this kind of model with high MPCs for workers is that they support aggregate demand in the face of, uh, of fluctuations. question. Uh, okay. In the case with monetary policy is coordinated, I didn't fully understand it. Do you have like speed overs, demand speed overs from one of the small open economies to another one? And will that change the effect of this coordinated monetary policy or not? Based on kind of international speed overs of demand. Okay. Well, I'm guessing yes, yes. No, this, uh, this is a question for Adrian. Um, so, very nice paper. I, it seems to me that it's uh, more for advanced small open economies, right? So if you were to think about the type of frictions and limitations that uh, emerging markets face, it seems to me that uh, the, the toolkit is even more limited, right? Fiscal policy could not be uh, expansionary because you would run into very quickly into uh, financial constraints and monetary policy might not be as credible, right? So just just to pick your brains on, on this. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay, great. 
So thanks so much. First, let me thank Jonathan for a really great discussion. And uh, you know, we've had a bunch of conversations over the past couple of days. This is very uh, stimulating. So, um, so first of all, just let me say, yeah, I, I agree with your point on complete markets uh, versus uh, incomplete markets represent an evasion models. Um, we tend to take the complete market as a benchmark. It's also, say, in Georgie's work, typically, that would be the, 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 the simple baseline. Um, but I agree that incomplete markets are important. Now, we do study this. The thing about incomplete market representative evasion models is they have low marginal propensities to consume. So for all intents and purposes, they really are very similar to complete market models. Complete markets are just simpler analytically. Um, you mentioned the collapse results, which is with log everywhere. Uh, basically, it, it, even with incomplete markets, it's actually as in a complete market model. Uh, actually, that's our chi equal one case. So it, that's the case in which uh, nothing really interesting happens. So everything happens that's interesting in our model with low elasticities of substitution. And, and you were covering the case with flexible prices, uh, flexible wages, uh, which I think is, a, is, is like a really interesting thing to think about, especially from the perspective of optimal policies. So, so you were mentioning this, uh, and, and Jordi also mentioned the first best. So, so the thing about us is you know, optimal policy is very complicated in this model. Uh, and it has, it's not, so, so you can think of the flexible wage case as kind of a useful anchor, so which is what's, what would happen in the world without uh, this wage rigidity, but that's, that's not all of it. And Alistair's gonna discuss a little bit considerations of optimal policy in, in these models. Um, so, so targeting the flexible wage allocation is one thing uh, you want to do, but you have these other considerations like distributional considerations, monetary policy affects the distribution of agents. Um, and so, so to be frank, you know, in our model, we just don't know what the optimal policy looks like. And I agree, this is a place we want to go. Um, uh, we don't even know, it's, it's kind of hard to define the first best to Jody's question. It's, it's like, we could have a complete market first best, but you know, what's, what's a useful notion of a, of a, of a, uh, um, of a first best that, in, that, that incorporates the, or a constrained, efficient constrained efficiency that incorporates some of the frictions that we're thinking about. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to think about. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so thanks so, so, so much for the discussion. Um, you, oh, you also mentioned like removing the wage friction. So in our model, that would be targeting the flexible wage allocation. So that's, that's actually uh, increasing interest rates. So uh, monetary policy tightening to, to undo, the, the, to undo the, the effect on wages. Um, okay, so on the, on, the, on, the, on the Ernesto's question of moving our star, so we have an earlier paper about this. Uh, so, so there can be shocks to the world interest rate. Um, and, and what those shocks are from the perspective of the, the, the economy is like capital outflow shocks. So say if interest rates go up, that's a capital outflow shock. So it's more reallocation between different countries. We think of this energy shock as a worldwide shock. So it's actually kind of better modeled, I think, as a, as a shock to the world energy price than a, a shock to uh, relative interest rates across countries, which would, would be like distributional shocks across countries. The, they, they'd actually move the real exchange rate for the country. Um, but but the, the types of things that I've talked about are there's very similar mechanisms for an exchange rate depreciation in a country. So if there's capitals that are flowing out of the country, normally that's expansionary in a representative agent model. In a heterogeneous agent model, that can be contractionary because the depreciation also lowers real incomes. And so it's very similar uh, types of mechanisms where heterogeneous agents create a very different perspective. Um, so your true question on profit margins. So I, I answered a, a little bit of it. So. So I, I know that there's a lot of focus on profit margins of oil companies right now and thinking about taxing the super profits and so on. So in our model, uh, the way we have it, we can't really address this. So, so remember in our model, I said, there's this world energy price that goes up and there's actually price stickiness at the, in the domestic economy level. So the energy companies are making losses. They're buying oil at the world price and they're selling it at the stickier price domestically. So, 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 so we don't think that that's particularly a realistic angle of the model. We, we think they're, they're um, uh, you know, you, you need more deviations to think about the super profits. So, so I don't, uh, you know, we don't address this in this paper, but I, I agree that it's a super important and relevant topic. Um, and, and on these questions of elasticity as a substitution, so it's clear that the elasticity of substitution is longer, is higher in the long, long run than in the short run. Um, so we think of this analysis, and this also to Valerie's question on green uh, transition, we think of this analysis as a decent analysis for thinking about the short run. Uh, it's even imperfect because the, 
uh, we have C as demand, which we think of as actually a pretty bad approximation for what's happening to, 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 to demand. Uh, for oil, say, there is a ability to store energy, so, so it's not just kind of today's price that matters, it's also what your expectation of the future price. Similarly, the model of supply is likely more complicated. We've been working on models where the elasticity of substitution can increase over time, um, but um, there's just too much to cover for this paper. But I agree that you know, these are super relevant, important questions for this. Um, and so, so yeah, so Valerie, so the green energy transition, I think is best addressed in a model without these rigidities, just because it's taking place over such a long horizon. Um, and so, so probably a flexible price model would be a better, a, a better model to think of this. Um, Gianluca, I totally agree on, on the wage price spiral. So real wage rigidity is proxying a little bit for these indexations. So, so it's actually formally a little bit different to index directly wages to prices relative to the real wage rigidity that we borrowed from Jordi. Uh, but, they, but it's true, they have similar implications. And, and one of the things, one of the reasons why they, in Europe, some countries de-anchored wage uh, negotiations from CPI was to try to break the wage price spiral. Um, but it's still there kind of in contracts in, in, some, uh, in some countries. And, and, and even if it's not in the contract, I think it is a big consideration that you know, in wage negotiations, people look at the headline CPI rates and then that anchors how much they are asking in terms of wages. And, and so that's why we think of this as super relevant for thinking about the, the, the wage inflation we're seeing now. Some of this could just be uh, these kind of uh, real wage concerns. Uh, so yeah, so Jordi, we, so, so, so I agree that the world economy is the way to think uh, about this. So we have a partial world equilibrium here, which is just the equilibrium in the world energy market. Uh, but uh, in an earlier paper on, on twin deficits, we were thinking about the integrating your type of framework with a small open economy into like an actual global world economy where things like R star are, are determined kind of at the world level. Uh, so I think that that would be the, the type of model to start thinking about these questions. Of, uh, you know, what's the optimum in a, in a world economy. Um, I, I, you know, I don't have the answer for you, partly because it's, like I said, it's a bit hard for me to think about the first best. Um, so Gaston, so you asked about small open economy spillovers. So, 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 so here, yeah, all these spillovers are happening through the energy market. So it's related, a related question. We, we don't model the, the, the equilibrium in the world's good market. Uh, but we do mo model equilibrium in the energy market, we, and, and so there's already a bunch of interesting considerations, and then once you start moving to the, to the world GE, then uh, th there's more spillovers of any domestic monetary policy, say, on the world interest rate. Um, and then on the question of, uh, on this question on, uh, on advanced um, economies versus emerging economies, so, so yes, yeah, so I agree, one of the main things is just the fiscal space is much more restricted, so you know, these energy subsidies that, the, com, that the European countries are doing are clearly not feasible. Uh, w we think of this as super important, especially if you're in the world market for oil, and, and some countries are subsidizing energy and you're not, because you have too limited fiscal space. Um, uh, but but so, so, so that's one place in which there could be a deviation, but you can still f take the general framework and then and just, just put restrictions on how much deficit financing you can do. Uh, and, 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 so, and, and, I, and, and so I'm not saying, I don't think the framework is, is the wrong one for thinking about emerging markets. Uh, um, and then to think about monetary policy, I mean, I, I think one of the things about these emerging economies is that they're much more open. So, so, um, so exchange rates matter a lot more for, for uh, monetary policy in transmission. Uh, in, our, in our model, that would be much less home bias, you know, and maybe a bigger energy share. And so it's, it's uh, I, I think, the same type of framework, but with somewhat different parameters, you know, less home bias, uh, more restricted fiscal policy, uh, is perfectly appropriate for thinking about emerging economies. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank, thank you. you.
de 8.
application to the Chilean economy. And this is a co-authored paper uh, by Elisa Rubo and Mediano Lupini and Ernesto Pastel. And we're delighted that Elisa Rubo will be presenting it. She's an economist interested in macroeconomics and international trade. And she, her research focuses on how macro variables affect different industries and labor markets. She has a PhD from Harvard University. And prior to joining Booth Chicago, she held a postdoctoral associate position in the Department of Economics at Princeton University and at the Becker Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago. And she was selected, congratulations, as one of the most promising young economists in the world by the Review of Economic Studies in 2020. Thank you very much. We have 45 minutes. Organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, so I am really happy to present this work um, on understanding heterogeneous effects of monetary policy. Uh, so um, in this, presenta this presentation, we have two parts. Uh, I will first uh, present a theory model, uh, and then uh, I will move on to a calibration that um, uh, we produced with uh, Ernesto and Emiliano uh, that basically applies the theory uh, to uh, the Chilean economy. All right, so um, the mandate of monetary policy, as we all know, uh, is to stabilize, stabilize uh, aggregate uh, variables, uh, such as uh, for most central banks inflation, some of them also aggregate employment. And so consistently with this mandate, um, there is a lot of work uh, studying the aggregate effects of monetary policy, but only recently people have started to pay attention, um, both from a theory and a, an empirical point of view, uh, to the cross-sectional effects uh, of monetary policy. Um, so the asymmetric impact that they have on different demographic groups or different worker groups. Um, so that's where the paper comes in. Um, I am going to present a new framework um, that um, features heterogeneous workers. And these workers uh, differ in the way that they interact with the production side of the economy. So uh, workers will make different goods and they will buy different goods. And uh, I hope I will convince you that this actually matters for the way that monetary policy will affect different people. Um, and in particular, I want to make the case that monetary policy has a differential impact on uh, their income, their real income, uh, through uh, the interaction of, with the production side. So I know that oftentimes when you talk about heterogeneous uh, agent models of monetary policy, uh, people have in mind a HANK uh, framework. Um, but uh, this paper is going to be something complementary, I would say, with the HANK framework. In that in HANK models, uh, all the focus is on the worker's Euler equation, so on their consumption savings decision, uh, where, um, yeah, whereas I'm going to have like a standard and boring Euler equation and I will focus instead on the production side, so the Phillips curve side. So in particular, uh, compared to HANK models, um, in these models, the cross-sectional real income is going to be independent of policy, it's going to be driven by idiosyncratic shocks, whereas I'm going to really mic microfound uh, the, the real income side of monetary policy. All right, so just to give a more, you know, complete and uh, illustrative sense of the economy that I have uh, in mind, here is a, is a schematic representation of my, of our world. Uh, so actually, I'm, as you can see, I hope from the picture, I'm really like following the structure of the national accounts in the way that I think about modeling the economy. So uh, here on the top, we have a set of primary factors. So these are going to be essentially workers. That's our little smiley or not so smiley faces. And then we are going to have some other primary factors that are basically capital assets. So land, equipment, structures. Um, and all these primary factors are gonna be hired by uh, good producers. So that's our firms. Uh, but uh, different firms will hire different bundles of these factors, right? So, um, so as you can see the red arrows, oops, I'm sorry. The, uh, the red arrows uh, yeah, are a bit asymmetric like Okay. There is not a one-on-one -on -one mapping between factors and firms, but it's also they're not uh, hiring all the same bundles. And then firms will interact uh, with each other in a complicated way, like there's going to be a rich input output structure, they're going to buy uh, and sell inputs to each other. And finally, after the production process is done, then the, the final goods are sold, 
but to define a users. And correspondingly to our primary factors, we're gonna have household, and then we're gonna have investment per user, okay? So in the end, uh, what I care about is the heterogeneity across uh, households. Uh, but we will see that um, it's important also, the, the investment side is gonna be important in creating that. Um, so essentially, uh, this framework will have, as you see, a lot of heterogeneity, and as you see already from the, the diagram, like different firms uh, might have different size, they might be differently connected uh, with the rest of the economy, and they will also allow for them to uh, have different elasticity of demand. So like before, energy is very complementary, other goods might be more suitable. Uh, but it turns out that actually like the, really what drives the heterogeneity is none of these elements, but there's actually two things that are going to matter, which is the degree, the differential degree of price stickiness that uh, different factors, different workers are gonna be exposed to. Um, and the other uh, element is going to be the factor supply elasticity that uh, the different industries face and in turn, uh, different workers are gonna be affected by the, the overall factor supply elasticity faced by their industries. And so that's where um, capital assets come in because maybe a worker is a fairly, has a very elastic labor supply, but it's very complementary in production with a capital asset. And so that eventually increases, uh, so, uh, sorry, um, makes like the supply uh, of factors to, uh, to uh, the industry where the worker is in very inelastic. And so we will see that this is gonna be an important driver of heterogeneity. Um, all right, so uh, let me give you some more intuition for uh, the basic uh, mechanism uh, that is going to create this heterogeneous effect. So like very loosely speaking, uh, if we think about how monetary policy works, we can think of having like some central bank that in some way is able to pin down the nominal demand in the economy. No? And so if we have a monetary expansion, we know that prices and output will go up um, and we will know that the relative response uh, is governed by what we call the Phillips curve and in particular by the slope of the Phillips curve. So that's what I call kappa in my model is gonna be our best friend for the next 40 minutes. Um, so, uh, what determine, so in turn, what does, uh, what does kappa depend on? And uh, it really depends on the two dimensions of it, uh, the, the two things that I mentioned before, um, the degree of nominal rigidity and uh, the elasticity of labor or factor supply. So if you're in, a, in an economy with very sticky prices or with very elastic labor supply, then the Phillips curve is gonna be flat. So we can essentially push output up and we don't get such a big price response, okay? Um, so in the aggregate, uh, if we think that nominal demand is pinned down, then it is, um, there is kind of this trade-off between increasing uh, output and increasing prices because like nominal demand is like the product of prices times quantity. If you increase price a lot, quantity cannot go up as much, right? So we have this idea that economies with flat Phillips curves will have more nominal, uh, more uh, monetary non-neutrality. You can like push demand more, prices don't go up as much, output goes up a lot, right? It turns out that a very similar thing holds in the cross section, okay? So there are going to be workers uh, and primary factors that have flat Phillips curves. And it turns out that uh, their price will not respond a lot. The price of what they make will not respond a lot to monetary policy and their employment will respond more, right? The intuition is a bit different compared to the aggregate. So in the cross section, really in these models, what matters is an expenditure switching channel. So essentially the flat Phillips curve workers or factors are gonna be cheaper. And so people will want to buy, to shift demand towards those goods or factors. And so their employment will respond by more, all right? So this is the basic intuition. I am just going to reiterate it in the simple example. So here we are going to have a, like the simplest possible version of the complicated economy that I showed you before. We are just going to have two workers, the sticky and the flex worker, but you could think also of the elastic and inelastic worker, the intuition is the same. And they are just going to produce a single consumption good with equal shares. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, and so, um, I mean, how do we, how do we wanna think about who these workers are? We could think of the sticky worker as being, I don't know, a minimum wage worker. So essentially they're kind of gonna be stuck at the minimum wage regardless of the business cycle. Oops, I don't know why I keep <laughs> pushing for 
Um, and we can have a flex wage worker, so we could think about maybe a manager, so a lot of his compensation is going to be bonuses, so it's like uh, it can be adjusted very easily at the cyclical frequency. But I mean, as a European, my favorite example is like these are two, actually, these are two countries, Italy and Germany. As we just saw, said before, Italy has fairly steepy wages. Uh, Germany has much more flexible wages, uh, but they both have the same central bank who is spinning down monetary policy for both. And so we really want to formalize and understand how uh, the, part of the fact that different workers are part of the same currency union is going to impact their uh, heterogeneous response to monetary policy. And as I said before, just let's think about a monetary expansion. Um, we have our uh, sticky wage worker. We know that uh, the relative wage of this worker is going to fall because the wage is not going to respond much to the monetary policy. Uh, and so uh, people say, oh, that's good. Uh, I don't know, the Italian good became cheaper, so we can buy more of that. And so the relative employment uh, of the Italian people goes up compared to the German people, right? Um, and so we, we see already that monetary policy is having a cross-sectional effect on employment. We might not just care about employment, we might care about overall income. Here the comparative static is a bit trickier because, as I said, there is a uh, negative co-movement between wages and employment. So if wage goes up, employment goes down. But income is the product of the two. And so it turns out that uh, overall the effect on income uh, depends on the substitutability between the Italian and the German worker. So if they're substitute, the employment effect is going to dominate. If they are complements, the, income, uh, yeah, the wage effect is going to dominate. All right. Um, sorry. So uh, this, uh, this was intuition for the cross-sectional results, um, but the model also has implications for the aggregate effect of monetary policy. So we might wonder, does the fact that there are different people in this economy matter for uh, how uh, monetary policy shifts aggregate employment? And the answer is uh, yes. So essentially the ability of people to substitute towards cheaper uh, goods is going to actually flatten the aggregate Phillips curve uh, and generate more aggregate non-neutrality. However, uh, as I will show you from a quantitative point of view, this effect is actually small. So the important effect is that in the cross-section, there is a lot of heterogeneity, uh, but heterogeneity across agents per se does not have important quantitative implications for aggregates, and I will try to explain uh, a bit why, where this comes from. Okay? All right. So. Uh, I hope you will uh, remember these intuitions because now we're going to move from this uh, nice and simple example to the big complicated economy I showed you before. Um, but essentially what is going to change between here and the big complicated economy is that we will need to pay attention to how we define exactly the degree of nominal rigidity and factor supply elasticity that is relevant for each of our little uh, people, like our little emoji in the, in the graph, right? So a lot of the heavy lifting is really going from like one simple wage stickiness parameter or labor supply elasticity to like some complicated network mediated uh, object, uh, but, but the intuitions are going to be very similar. All right, um, as I said, our, my last uh, part of the presentation uh, is going to be a calibration of the economy I showed you in the picture to the Chilean data. Um, and what, uh, what we find is that there is uh, a fair amount of heterogeneity uh, in, the, uh, in the effect of monetary policy on the uh, employment in and income of different people. Uh, the way this is measured is the, uh, by the cumulative uh, um, impulse response of employment and income to a monetary policy shock. And they find that um, relative to the uh, monetary shock, it uh, ranges between one half and three uh, and three across different demographic groups. Um, and I will also show you that industry heterogeneity is going to be um, a big driver of heterogeneity across workers, and input output linkages amplify the cross-sectional effect. Um, while the aggregate effects of having like heterogeneous agents is actually relatively small, as long as you properly calibrate the input output structure of your model.
All right, um, I already touched on the literature. Let me just uh, reiterate uh, that uh, compared to the Hank model, I'm really gonna ignore the Euler equation side, so the consumption saving and really focus on the production side. Um, also, you might have seen uh, a recent wave of papers that uh, have input output that study monetary policy. I think the main innovation of this paper is in introducing heterogeneous agents and like multiple factors, whereas all these other models are actually representative agents in the buffer model. Um, great. All right, so quick roadmap of the literature. I am going to present uh, the theory first, and that's based on my paper, uh, Monetary Non-Neutrality in Retroception. So I'm gonna show you the model setup um, and then I'll derive results for local and aggregate uh, monetary non-neutrality and show you some examples. Uh, and then we'll move on to the uh, calibration to the Schiliani function. Great, so let's start with the setup. Um, I re I'm gonna really set up the model in a way to follow the picture uh, that I showed you before as closely as possible. Uh, so we will have a bunch of workers. I'm gonna say there's eight of them and then a bunch of sectors, there's gonna be N of them and we'll also have these capital assets, there's F of them. And so here's the role of the capital assets is really, in my view, it's just like creating heterogeneity across workers in the degree of, um, you know, factor supply elasticity that uh, the, the industry they work in face. So my question is like, okay, I'm, I don't know, a, a contractor in New York, I work in an industry that is very constrained by the amount of land that is there, whereas if I am a contractor, I don't know, in Idaho, that's a different, uh, the, I am not constrained in that sense, okay? So that's what I wanna capture and that's why I'll have the capital assets. Okay. Uh, agents are going to consume different bundles of goods. That's the final use stage of the picture before. They are, they are going to uh, have different labor supply elasticity themselves. So there could be like the low income uh, women tend to have like a high outside option of like home production, whereas maybe like high, higher income people will have uh, more uh, inelastic labor supply. Uh, and then I will also allow for, uh, allow for uh, agent groups to own different shares of uh, firms and capital assets. Uh, that's going to be more in the background. Uh, sectors are gonna be heterogeneous in the uh, composition of the primary factors that they hire, so the workforce and the capital assets. They are going to face different degrees of, of price and wage utility and also different uh, demand elasticities, okay? And so to solve this complicated model, uh, I will need to uh, log linearize it. And the nice feature of this log linearized model, as, I, as you will see, is that they can be very easily calibrated to national account data. So basically all the parameters that govern the model, I'm, I'm gonna have my hands tied in the way I choose them because you can measure them in the data. And so there's only a few demand and supply elasticities that I will have to calibrate externally. Great, so let's start by looking uh, at the model primitives. So for consumers, um, I, am, I am going to define preferences for each uh, consumer type. So here I have been like a bit loose as in I didn't really tell you what types mean. Um, essentially the way I think about uh, worker groups is I think about uh, some segmented labor markets. Um, then the way we're gonna calibrate it today is gonna be uh, like different types are going to be uh, different demographic groups like by uh, age, um, gender and uh, income. Uh, but uh, for example, in, in my theory paper, I calibrate two occupations in the US uh, and one could uh, calibrate two regions like Italy and Germany. So essentially what I'm really trying to capture is like a segmented labor market. Uh, and I think we could improve also in the way we measure it, but for today we're doing with this definition. All right, so um, each type will have its own preferences, which means they can types consume different uh, bundles of goods. So there's going to be some conceptual aggregator CH that is specific to the worker again. Um, and then um, they will also have different labor supply elasticity as captured by the inverse fish phi and also by the wealth effects gamma. Okay. Uh, and so workers will um, maximize the present discounted value of utility flows subject to a budget constraint. Uh, and uh, the budget constraint is saying that uh, total consum nominal consumption must be equal to income from labor, capital assets, profits, and uh, borrowing and lending. Great, um, on the production side, um, good producers have constant returns to scale production functions that take as input um, labor, capital assets, and intermediate goods. So essentially, I think this is like a flexible way to represent constant return or decreasing return production because decreasing return, you can have like some capital assets with, uh, that is like fixed and that could be specific to the goods, okay? Um, 
Great, and so producers are gonna minimize costs given factor in, uh, input prices, uh, but uh, they will have sticky prices, so only, uh, I will model this in a Calvo fashion, so only a fraction that I call delta i of producers in sector i at each point in time can adjust the price, and when they do so, they maximize the present discounted value of future profits. Um, so I model uh, within sectors, I use the standard uh, Calvo modeling, so there's going to be a continuum of uh, firm, of fixed mass, uh, and producers and final users will buy a, a CES bundle of their goods. And I assume that there is uh, a subsidy that gets rid of markup, so I can um, look linearize around an efficient steady state. So anyway, this is like classical uh, Calvo modeling. Uh, on top of this, uh, I will also allow for sticky wages in the calibration, and, that's, and the way I do it is essentially I add a fictitious sector that I call the labor union, and the labor union will have sticky price, okay? So whenever you see factor prices in the model, in the theory, those are like, like flexible factor prices that are not what we actually observe in the data. They are the thing that you would stick in the consumers or in the investment, investment producers uh, supply curve to make that hold given observed quantities. But then what we go and see in the data is gonna be the price that in the model is gonna be the one that is charged by the labor unions, okay? Uh, perfect, so last piece of the model, uh, capital assets. So here it's, it's going to be a kind of a stylized model of investment because here I just want to capture the fact that sectors use these like inelastically supplied factors um, so I want to kill kind of the dynamic investment decision, but I want to have like some, ca some supply curve for assets. So the way I do this is kind of like I set up a sort of utilization model uh, where uh, for each capital assets, there are going to be some fixed endowment that I call K bar, um, and that will never depreciate. Uh, and then investment producers can like buy this endowment from uh, households and they can augment it with investment but investment will fully depreciate uh, at each period, right? And investment is just produced in the same way as uh, all the other goods with some constant return production function and I call the marginal cost pi, PI, that's the price of investment. Um, so uh, eventually, uh, and so investment producers are going to maximize profits given the rental rate, the market uh, rental rate of capital and so that essentially is gonna give me what I want which is, a, which is like a, a capital supply curve. Um, all right, which, which has like some uh, supply elasticity phi uh, F for fixed factors. Okay, all right, so anyway, this is just like a modeling device to get some like nice uh, upward slope in capital supply curve. Um, great, so now it's time to introduce some notations, so you, you will have to brace yourself. Um, so <laughs> to make things a little easier, uh, I am going to go back to our economy. Uh, and uh, to put some labors on the, on the edges of this network, okay? So to describe the links between primary factors and firms, I use, okay, that, that wasn't a great rendition. Anyway, so I hope you guys can read it. Uh, but anyways, uh, I, will, I will call alpha the weights of the red edges, okay? And alpha is just gonna be cost shares, okay? So for workers, it's going to be the ratio between like expenditure like wage time hours for each worker in total uh, cost of a given sector, okay? So alpha is a, is a like sector by factor matrix that tells like the weight of the red edges as a fraction of like total sectoral expenditures. Um, the weight of the black edges is gonna be called omega. And so that's kind of the traditional input output table. So it's gonna be omega ij is gonna be how much sector i spends on input j, okay? And then at the blue edges, so the final use side is gonna be called beta. So that's uh, for the consumer, beta uh, consumer h, beta ih is how much the consumer spends on good h as a fraction of total consumption. So if you think about like the CPI, those are like the aggregate betas, but I define betas for each sim single consumer, and you can define also for investment producers, okay? So that's just the final use shares. Um, great. Once we define the input output matrix and the final use shares, we can also construct some use useful um, other derived objects um, that are the Leontief inverse and the Domar weights. Um, so why, why are these objects useful and interesting? Because essentially what I showed you before, like the weights of the edges, are just direct expenditure shares. 
but we actually don't care just as much direct shares, but also about total shares. So let's think about how much I consume of oil, for example. I don't buy oil, I don't have a car, I never buy gas. So you would think my beta on oil is zero, but in practice I consume a lot of oil because I, I, I don't know, someone is heating up my place and I buy things that are made out of oil, right? So that's captured by my lambda. And in a similar way, you could think of like, I don't know, a, a hairdresser not buying a lot of oil, but buying a lot of stuff that is made by oil. So the omega oil for the hairdresser is gonna be very small, but the actual Leontiev inverse element, that's this uh, inverse matrix, is gonna be large, okay? So whenever you see these objects, it means like we're going from final shares or like direct shares to total shares, okay? Uh, and we can construct a similar object that is the product of the alpha and the lambda and that I, I'm introducing here because you'll see it a bunch. And that's essentially telling um, what's the content of uh, each primary factor in the consumption of each final user, okay? Great. So we are done with input output notation. Uh, a bit of notation on the consumption uh, side. Um, essentially, we, we're going to need to define, uh, we're, go uh, we're going to denote the supply elasticities uh, through some uh, big matrices, gamma and phi. So I collect all the wealth effects of the different consumers in this big diagonal gamma matrix and all the fresh elasticities into these phi L and phi K matrices. And if you see phi, it's just like a big matrix that co collects all the phi's of like workers and and uh, capital assets. And then we're going to have, when you see theta, that's gonna be a demand elasticity. Um, and whenever you see delta, big delta, that's gonna be a, a price stickiness. Okay. Great, uh, okay, I promise this is the last bit of notation. Uh, we also wanna uh, talk about moving from, you know, micro level things to aggregate things. Okay, so how do we define aggregates? Uh, essentially, when, whenever I talk about aggregates, it's gonna be some share weighted sum of stuff. And what are the relevant shares? Well, when I um, aggregate, uh, say, prices or like quantities to go from like agent level CPIs to like aggregate CPI, that's gonna be weighted by the income uh, shares of the final users, okay? So, and these income shares are gonna be the final consumption of each agent in total GDP, and likewise, final investment uh, in total GDP, okay? Finally, um, here are the variables, and to close the model, I will also need to tell you uh, how monetary policy works. So uh, we're going to solve the model in terms of uh, uh, two variables, inflation and the factor level employment gap. So inflation is gonna be pi, and that's a vector, sector by sector inflation rates, and L it's a vector of like factor by factor employment gaps. Uh, and we will also define an aggregate output gap that as I said before is the share weighted sum of the factor gaps, and I call it Y bar. So what monetary policy does, essentially it's a pin down uh, Y bar. Um, today, to keep things simple, I will have uh, a, a cash in advance model. So essentially monetary policy is set in the total nominal expenditures. And we have a cash in advance constraint whereby to, uh, total nominal expenditures must be equal to the product of like GDP deflator times uh, total uh, output gap. Uh, the model would be very similar if we had instead uh, the, the central bank setting interest rates, um, but uh, that will add the complications that we need to tr keep track of borrowing and lending across agents. So to get rid of that, I will assume uh, financial autarchy for today's presentation. Okay. Great, so now after all of this notation introduction, we're ready to go on to the, the meat of the results. And so I will talk about um, monetary non-neutrality in the cross-section and in the aggregate. So essentially the model, can, the equilibrium of the model can be pinned down to three equations. Uh, two of them are a bit more familiar, the, one of them is new. So the two more familiar ones are going to be the supply block, so the Phillips curve and the aggregate demand block, that's the cash in advance constraint. And the new part, which comes from this uh, heterogeneous agents model, is going to be the cross-sectional demand block. That is actually what we're interested in because we wanna keep track of the heterogeneous effects of monetary policy on the different workers. But we really need to, to, get to, to get there, to get to the new piece, we really need to understand very well the supply block, the Phillips curves, because as I anticipated before, uh, the workers with flat Phillips curves are gonna be the ones that see a bigger employment response. So we really wanna understand what determines the Phillips curves, uh, slopes for different workers. So here I need to uh, walk you a bit through what this equation is saying. So essentially, uh, this equation is telling us that for each sector, 
we can uh, look at how their inflation rate responds to the employment of each worker, right? So kappa will be a sector by worker uh, thing. Um, and then to summarize uh, how this kappa determines the overall employment, I'm gonna, uh, the, 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 uh, the relative employment response of the relevant workers, I'm going to uh, need the cross-sectional demand equation, okay? So essentially this cross-sectional demand is gonna tell me, okay, now you have the kappa, uh, you need to cook, cook up the various kappas across sectors and like average them out, so you get some summary kappa for each worker, and that's gonna tell you uh, how the employment of the worker is gonna be affected by monetary policy, okay? So the first thing I'll do is I'll tell you what goes in the kappas, and then I'll tell you how you combine the kappas to get the relative employment response. Okay. So let's start with the kappas. All right, what's the, what's the slope of the Phillips curve? Essentially, um, as we said before, we can think of monetary policy as something that like, pushes demand. So there's an expansion. Demand for all the factors is going to go up. And to convince you know, the workers and investors to, to work more, you need to pay them more, so to pay them higher real wages. How much do we need to increase the real wage to get a 1% increase in employment? That's going to be governed by the labor supply elasticity. That's what I call phi here. So we have a first element of heterogeneity. If a worker is more inelastic, then the phi is going to be higher, and so we're going to get the steeper Phillips curve, or like steeper Phillips curves uh, for the worker in all sectors. Then there's going to be uh, another element of heterogeneity, as anticipated before, that comes from the nominal rigidities that different workers face in production and in consumption. So the price rigidity in production will affect the pass-through uh, of wages into prices for different workers. Okay, so uh, we said that we increased the real wage of the worker by uh, 1%, say. So then the question is, what will, how will this affect prices in all sectors? And as you can anticipate, if a worker is in a sticky price sector, then prices will not respond a lot. If it's in a flex price sector, prices will respond a lot more. Okay? And formally, we can, uh, we can uh, write out, or like formalize this argument uh, by constructing this pass-through object, which is a function of the primitives of the model. And essentially, this tells us that the pass-through is going to be given by the combination of the uh, labor, uh, the factor shares, in it, the direct employment shares of the factor in each sector, times this uh, modified Leontief inverse, which tell, tell us it's not just about the direct uh, shares, but it's also about the employment by your suppliers, your supplier, supplier, and so on. Um, and that's captured by omega, but you want to discount the suppliers by their adjustment probability. Uh, so if a supplier is very sticky, it's not going to pass through a lot of the weight shock, and so you want to discount it. And finally, you need to multiply times the sector's own price stickiness. So an increase in cost in a sticky sector is not going to have a big effect in prices. Right, so anyway, this term really captures heterogeneity in the price stickiness in, uh, in the different sectors where the workers are hired. Um, and, and we still have like a middle term that captures price stickiness in uh, consumption. So essentially the idea is if nominal wages go up, uh, prices will also respond by going up because cost has gone up. Uh, and so essentially real wages will go up by less than nominal wages. And this effect is more severe for people who buy flex price goods. So that's what is captured by this middle term. Okay. Great. So essentially now we know that the slope of the Phillips curves for different agents will depend on their, their own factor supply elasticity and on the pass-through of their wage into prices through the price stickiness of the sectors where they work. Okay. So now we can move on to combining these uh, Phillips curve slopes into something that tells us the, what the heterogeneous effects of monetary policy on employment are. And, but before I tell you what exactly goes into the X in this formula, let me just tell you why this formula looks the way it is. Okay? So why does uh, employment relative to the employment gap uh, relative to aggregate output gap, why does it have this specific form? Well, you see this has two terms. One is like this inverse matrix, and then there is a vector of all ones. Okay. So the vector of all ones is what I call the impact effect of the shock, like a direct effect, whereas the, um, the X matrix is going to capture a propagation effect. So intuitively, I mean, this, is not, this intuition is not tied to the cash in advance model. It holds in general that this formula doesn't depend on the policy instrument, but I think the cash in advance is useful to build intuition. So you can think about the central bank as just like being printing money, right? And dropping money into people's pockets. 
proportionally to their initial incomes. Okay, so everyone has 1% more money. What do people do? They spend the money. And so they're gonna demand 1% more. But if people were optimizing before, they're just gonna expand proportionately the, the stuff that they demand. And so basically, the demand for all primary factor will increase proportionately on impact. Like, that's the direct effect. However, the propagation of this shock is gonna be asymmetric. So first, if factors have different supply elasticity, then the price of this, the relative price of this factor is gonna change. Because if, if everyone has to work 1% more, the inelastic guy will want a higher compensation than the elastic guy. Second, even if they were to increase uh, their, the real wages that they demand by the same amount, the pass-through of the real wage into prices is gonna be different because if you work in a sticky sector, then your wage is not gonna pass through into, into the price of the goods that you make, okay? So overall, this like, impact shock is going to have an asymmetric effect of the relative prices of the different goods. All right, and so a change in the relative prices is, not co is no longer consistent with a uniform proportional change in the demand for the various factors. And that's what's captured by the matrix X. So essentially this is gonna tell us, okay, you increase everyone's demand in a certain way, what's the effect on prices, and how does this feed back into demand, okay? To solve for the equilibrium, we actually need to get the fixed point of the mapping X so the, the process will have multiple rounds, and the fixed point is captured by this inverse matrix. All right, good. Um, so now our next step, and that's gonna be like the heaviest slide and then we're done. Uh, <laughs> I will show you what's into this, uh, this multiplier X. So this has two pieces. One is expenditure switching, and the other is income reallocation. So the expenditure switching piece is the one that I kind of gave you some uh, intuition for. So essentially, let's, consider one worker, call it H, um, his employment is gonna, relative employment is gonna fall if H has a steep Phillips curve because this means that the goods that they produce have become more expensive. But likewise, if the co-workers have steep Phillips curve, right, because it means that the cost of the sectors where H work has increased, uh, and so on, right? So in particular, if uh, worker H maybe is like a very elastic worker, nice guy, like sticky wage, but the sector uses a lot of inelastic capital, then the cost of the sector where, work, where H works is gonna go up, and so employment of H is gonna go down. Um, and, uh, but, but the strength of this effect is gonna be mediated by the elasticity of substitution theta. So essentially, if goods are basically on TF, it doesn't really matter what relative prices do, but if they're very substitutable, then it does matter. Great, um, the second piece is gonna be income reallocation, and it's gonna tell us that uh, the employment of a certain worker H is gonna go up if H sells to final users whose real income went up. So uh, final users whose labor demand went up, or maybe like profit earners, uh, or like capital uh, owners, um, and, but importantly, this effect is gonna be strong only if final users buy different bundles of goods. If uh, bundles are uh, relatively homogeneous across people, then redistributing income is not really gonna have an effect on cross-sectional labor demand. And that's gonna be the case in our calibration. It might not be the case in different ones, but uh, you can think of the first effect as being the driver of the quantitative results today. Okay, great. So here are just some simple examples this is just like the previous example in formulas, uh, and I think the takeaway you can get from this slide is the sticky guys will have like flatter Phillips curves, and the cross-sectional effect on employment will depend on the difference between the price stickiness of the two, mediated by the substitution with elasticity theta. Okay, so if you have theta zero, no effect, theta infinite, subs fully substitutable, it goes one for one with the difference in price stickiness. Um, Great, and the point of this uh, example is that to get heterogeneity in the nominal rigidity that people face, you don't just, uh, you, you can even have it if all sectors have the same Calvo parameters, but you have chains that are longer or shorter. So if someone is in a longer chain, they basically get multiple rounds of price rigidity, so they're like sticky and flat Phillips curve. If they are in a short chain, then they are flex. Um, and likewise, if you have complicated chains, you might need to substitute the simple theta between the two workers with a fancier theta, but the formula stays the same. Um, and let me just give you one last example about fixed assets, that's the New York versus Boise example. So there is a monetary expansion, 
uh, I am a New York wor worker, uh, New York construction workers, is my employment going to respond more or less than the Boise construction workers? And it turns out that really this de depends on um, the degree of uh, geographic mobility versus substitutability between labor and land. So if whenever there is a monetary expansion, people say, oh, I have more money. I'm just going to buy a big house in, in Idaho. Then Boise uh, worker is going to be happier than New York worker. If instead people say, oh, I really don't want to move. I have more money. Let's improve my apartment that I already have. The New York worker is going to be happier. OK, great. So I, I am kind of short on time. So let me just give you very briefly uh, the implications for non -neutrality, aggregate non-neutrality. Let's just start from the representative agent formula. We see that effect on aggregate output is going to be inversely proportional to the slope of the Phillips curve. You find that in the representative agent case, in the sorry, heterogeneous agent case, there is a similar formula. You need to define appropriately the aggregate Phillips curve slope. But then on top, you have a covariance term that tells us you get more non-neutrality if employment goes up for the sticky price people, which is the same, which is what we find in the cross-sectional analysis. So overall, this pushes for more aggregate non-neutrality uh, from in, in the heterogeneous agent model. But okay, let me skip this part to move on to the calibration that, um, that we prepared uh, using the Chilean data. Um, so just a brief overview of where uh, where the data came from. So the input output data is. Yes, five minutes. Uh, I'll do it. The input output data comes from the uh, national accounts. Um, and employment data uh, comes from the administration of severance pay payment funds. That's a survey conducted um, on firms. Um, and firms have to report uh, demographic characteristic uh, of, the, um, of the workers. So uh, gender, age quintile, and income quintile. So that de determines the pin down how we define the different uh, worker groups. Um, and great, consumption shares are going to come from the family budget survey. So that's a survey on households uh, where um, households are asked how they split their uh, demand across different goods. And also, they have to report the same demographic characteristics as before. Um, price adjustment frequencies um, are inferred from the producer price data, so from uh, electronic invoices, and also from the consumer price data. Uh, from the National uh, Institute of Statistics. So in, uh, in our view, basically, we will have the retail sectors that are going to be a part of the input-output network, and their price stickiness is going to come from the consumer price data, whereas the other pieces of like, the other firms that are more like uh, selling to intermediate producers are going to be, uh, the data is going to be taken from the producer price. Okay, great. Um, so for to the, the results for today are based on the calibration that incorporates the data before, and so heterogeneity in the sectors where people work and in the price rigidity of these sectors. Uh, down the line, uh, this is still work in progress, so we're still connect collecting some other data. Uh, and some of it we know how to get, some of it maybe we don't know how to get, and it would be great you know, if, uh, you know, whoever is in charge of deciding what data is collected, uh, I think these are great things to, <laughs> to look for. Um, so, I mean, wage adjustment frequencies by demographic group, I think that's something we can approximate. Um, and also sectoral expenditure shares on capital assets we have and investment net or you can construct. But I think the model points at the importance of differential labor supply elasticities across workers, and that's something we don't have good measures of in the U.S. either. Um, and also, I think, as I said before, now we're defining agent types um, as uh, demographic groups, but I do think that the model consistent definition would be more about labor market boundaries, and I think that's a relevant concept for not just this model, but many other macro models, and I think it would be really nice to have a better measure of what labor market boundaries are. Um, and the, I think that would be the natural calibration of the model. Um, great. So, yeah, and an important thing, yeah, I, I just want to underline, I want you to take the results that I present today more as a proof of concept that the model can generate meaningful heterogeneity. Um, I think missing the wage uh, adjustment frequencies and the labor supply elasticity, but even just the wage adjustment frequency across groups is going to generate some results that are a bit counterintuitive. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's going to be fixed when we have the better data. Great. So let me just give you some descriptive statistics. Essentially, this is saying that women, like uh, low-income women, work a bit in uh, gardening and some support activity for mining, but then most women work like middle income, they're like textile manufacturing and hotels and restaurants, and then they're basically all in services. And just as you go up with income, you go from like admin services to like education and health. 
Oh, and also low-income women are in personal services as well, right? Great. Picture is fairly different for men, uh, so they are much more spread out across the uh, sectors. And as you go up with income, you go from agriculture to manufacturing to like uh, low and high skill services. Great. Um, we interact this data with price rigidity across sectors, and kind of like not surprising, mining has uh, flexible prices, a bit more surprising. Admin services here in Chile have fairly flexible prices because they're indexed to inflation, uh, whereas other sectors don't index. But on average, we can, we can think of like uh, manufacturing and uh, primary sector like mining as having more flexible uh, prices, and with the exception of admin, services has uh, stickier prices. Great. So, um, great. So these results, when we interacted with the consumption and employment data, uh, we see that this interacts with, uh, like this creates a fair amount of heterogeneity in the price flexibility of the hiring sector for different demographic groups. And also, we have some heterogeneity in the price flexibility of the consumption baskets, but there is much less heterogeneity in consumption baskets, so you see that this distribution is much more compressed. Great, so when we crank it through the model and we compute impulse responses of uh, employment and income to monetary policy, we see that the, uh, we, we get uh, pretty heterogeneous responses across the various occupations. Here I just sorted it in ascending order. So the blue line represents the cumulative impulse response of employment scaled by the cumulative monetary shock. Um, and we see that it goes from about 0.5 to about 3. And the aggregate is the blue dashed line. If we take away the input output uh, structure, we get low, lower level and less dispersion. And this is consistent with input output amplifying nominal rigidity and so increasing uh, monetary non neutrality. When we look at income, we find a consistent picture. Of course, the level must be the same across the two calibrations because I'm just fixing the change in nominal money supply. But we see that there is more dispersion in the blue line that is the one we had uh, with uh, input output structure. Okay. Great. Uh, last picture is going to compare Chile and the US, and we see that the results are actually fairly similar for the two countries. And if anything, I find more dispersion in the Chilean calibration than in the US calibration. Great. Um, so just to conclude, um, today I, I argue that uh, the interaction of different worker groups with the production side is important for uh, the way that monetary policy impacts these different workers. Uh, in the cross section, employment goes up for flat Phillips square workers, so sticker prices and less elastic labor supply. In the aggregate, uh, the ability to substitute towards these workers create more on neutrality. Uh, quantitatively, even if the calibration has still much fewer elements of heterogeneity than what I think is relevant, we still find sizable cross-sectional effects on employment and income, and the input output structure seems an important driver. Great. So thank you so much. It was uh, an honor to present here. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation, and we will now have a discussion from Ludwig Straub who's an assistant professor of economics at Harvard. And his research areas are macroeconomics, international economics, and his particular focus is on the relationship between rising economic inequality and macroeconomic trends, as well as the study of fiscal and monetary policy in heterogeneous agent models. His PhD is from MIT, and his work has appeared in several prestigious publications. We look forward to your comments, Ludwig. Very nice. You hear me? Okay, excellent. I probably need to switch this off, otherwise we're gonna get. Is this already switched off? I'm just gonna keep a distance in that case. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to discuss this paper. Um, as you can see from my color choice, that I appreciate that we can be here in Chile. Um, um, uh, that, you know, the, the fact that the paper is very fast moving is reflected uh, in the fact that the title is not what you see on the program. So this is uh, Elisa's US-based paper that I'm mainly going to be discussing. Um, there's a very interesting calibration exercise to the Chilean economy, which you talked about, which I'm not going to uh, talk about very much. Okay, excellent. So uh, let me motivate this paper uh, by pointing you to the fact that we live in very unequal times, right? In many countries in the world, we've seen strong increases in 
income and wealth inequality. We've just gone through a very unequal recovery from the COVID pandemic. We're living through the energy crisis that Adrian talked about. And then uh, uh, Valerie already mentioned, we're uh, uh, starting to do a green transformation. And all of those are gonna have winners and losers in the economy. So I think a very natural question then to ask is, does monetary policy, for example, the current monetary tightening cycle, tightening cycle exacerbate those inequalities or mitigate them, right? And so inherently we wanna understand the heterogeneous effects of monetary policy across industries and or across workers. And this is exactly what Elisa's paper is about. Now there are many dimensions of heterogeneity that you can think of here um, that, that can uh, uh, drive these heterogeneous effects. So just give you a few simple examples. Clearly, durable goods producers and investment goods producers are gonna be differentially affected by monetary policy from non-durable goods producers just because durables and investment tend to be more sensitive to monetary policy. What about balance sheets? Clearly, if you are a borrower and the central bank eases rates, probably you're gonna be better off than somebody uh, who, who has a lot of uh, uh, money in, in, in the deposit account. And that's where a lot of the Hank models are gonna be, uh, 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 that's, that's a dimension a lot of Hank models are gonna be thinking about. In an open economy like Chile, you might also think about exchange rate exposure, right? That maybe if you export and the exchange rate depreciates, that's great for you, but if you're an importer, then uh, you might lose out more. And so the, the main source of heterogeneity that Lisa focuses on is heterogeneity in price or wage rigidity across sectors. Um, there's also a part of her paper that is more about supply elasticities. It's not really factored into the calibration yet. That's why I'm not gonna talk that much about it, but I'm gonna focus more on, on the source uh, of heterogeneity. And the main finding there is that this channel alone can be very powerful. The fact that some sectors are gonna have stickier prices uh, uh, is gonna drive a lot of uh, heterogeneity. Okay, so what's the roadmap gonna be like? I'm gonna review the current version of the paper as I received it, and then I'm gonna offer three comments, but uh, take all of it with a grain of salt because the paper is still, uh, still evolving. All right, so the aspiration of this paper and of this model in my reading is to make Bakai Fari useful for monetary policy analysis. So how do we get there? Essentially what we do is we take the most complicated Bakai Fari paper and make it even more complicated, okay? So what do I mean by that? We take their HAIO paper. You might have not looked at that paper yet. It's one of their 10 papers. That paper is the most complicated. What does it have? It has many distinct consumers. It has many distinct producers and it allows for many fixed factors. And then you link them in all of you know, all sorts of complicated ways. We allow for input-output linkages among producers. We allow for heterogeneous consumption baskets across consumers. And we allow for rich ownership patterns, you know, that telling you which consumers own which, uh, which factors. So we take this model, and then we make it more complicated. How do we make it more complicated? Well, we need nominal rigidities to be there, right? Otherwise, we can't really talk about uh, monetary policy. So Elisa adds uh, general price and wage rigidities I'm gonna think about wage rigidities in the same way as Elisa is by just adding sort of a union uh, sector that, that, that sets wages. We're gonna add flexible labor supply and something, and I'm gonna talk about that a bit more, something that resembles investment. We're gonna go fully dynamic, infinite horizon uh, economy, and we're gonna add a monetary policy rule. For now, as Elisa was saying, this is a money supply rule, but she has ambitions also to have uh, a Taylor rule uh, in this economy. So let me give you an example of how complicated things get once you do these things, okay? You have a few equations, looks innocuous, and then you keep going and keep going, and then it becomes even more complicated, and proposition one is already, whew, flies, flies way past you. So compared to this, the Buckeye Fire paper is like a light afternoon read. Um, so this is, this is, you know, tough stuff. And I'm kind of impressed how Elisa, you know, was flying through a presentation in a way that was very understandable and did not have to go through into, uh, a, 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 a go into all these details here. So I'm gonna focus on a more tractable model, which I think is related to one of the special cases that Elisa uh, mentioned in her presentation too, that I think we can actually learn more from that the, than the paper currently uh, exploits. So what is this more tractable model? Okay, the beauty of a discussion is I can just make these assumptions and, uh, and tell you what, what we learn, and then Elisa has to think about uh, what to do with that. So I'm gonna assume preferences and production functions to be Cobb-Douglas. 
I'm going to assume that households consume all the same bundle. It didn't do a lot in her calibration, so I'm just going to assume that they all consume the same bundle. Um, I'm going to assume complete markets. So in some sense, all the households are part of a big family. They share income, and then uh, they, they, they uh, allocate consumption jointly. And then the key assumption I'm going to make here is I'm going to assume an infinite fresh elasticity of labor supply. And anyone who has worked with pricing models kind of knows that that's kind of a nice trick to get a lot of tractability. Okay, I'm going to tell you why that, why that is. So just to put some math here, family of households maximizes log uh, 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 household consumption plus log uh, real monetary balances of the, the entire family. And then there's linear disutility from supplying labor to, uh, uh, you know, as part of the different factors here. And that's where the infinite fish uh, comes in. We have all the different sectors. They have Cobb Douglas production function in, uh, in, in labor and in intermediate inputs. And we're going to think of each sector sort of as being, you know, comprised of a continuum of firms. And each firm has sort of a random probability delta I of adjusting uh, the price. So that's, that's, that's the entire economy. Okay, so what happens in that economy? So let's say we feed in a small, you know, 1% increase in money supply. The way we've rigged it, that immediately means we increase nominal spending by 1%. That's sort of the log log in the utility. And the infinite first gives us that wages in all sectors also move by 1%, which is really convenient, right? Because that pins down uh, 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 nominal wage inflation in all sectors. Now, if prices were flexible, that 1% increase in wages would just translate sort of down the supply chain into 1% increases in all prices and no quantity changes. That's a clean benchmark. What happens if prices are not flexible? What happens if there's a gap between 1 and delta I? In that case, you can actually derive a very neat formula, which I did not uh, uh, find in Elisa's papers. I was proud that I could come up with this formula. So what does it say? It says that the percent change in employment of factor F is related to some sort of, you know, generalized version of a uh, sales to income ratio. That's something that shows up in some of these uh, input output uh, uh, rigidity models. And obviously clearly related to one minus delta I. So what this entire sum tells you is that uh, employment changes more for the factors that are supplied to sort of a production chain, a supply chain that has on average higher uh, rigidities, higher price rigidities. And the sales to income we uh, weights are exactly the way to weight these, different, uh, weight these different price rigidities. So that's kind of a neat result. Let me just illustrate it, what, what it means. I also have my own pictures. So, uh, so we have the primary factors up on the top, the different uh, types of, let's say, workers that, that work in different industries. And then they supply to, you know, supply chains each. So what happens if we say add nominal rigidity down here? Well, clearly that makes the price adjust less here. It means quantities that need to adjust more. And so employment goes up by more for the, uh, 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 for the factors on the left. But now what happens if you add a lot more, a lot richer input output linkages? It becomes much less obvious to see exactly what's going on. And I think this kind of a formula like, like, I want, like the one I derived kind of Give some intuition whether, you know, whether it's, it's, let's see if this works, if it's these guys, if it's these workers on the left that uh, have their employment changed by more, or if, the, or if it's the workers in the middle or on the right. Now, what about deviations from Cobb Douglas? Just to make the model a bit richer, I actually think that's totally doable. You can get a lot, tra a lot of tractable mileage even if you deviate from Cobb Douglas, precisely because we still have wages all changed by 1%. Five minutes, thank you. Um, what about dynamics? Even that, I think you can still do. The key thing, I think, that makes our life very, very hard, and the key thing that causes Elisa to have to go through so much trouble in the paper, I think, is uh, uh, coming in if we want to have a finite fresh elasticity and or fixed factors or partially fixed factors in the model. And so I would appreciate, for example, if the paper went you know, as, as long as it can without making that assumption to build intuition, and then at the end, maybe we have to uh, bite the bullet and actually uh, uh, add those features as well. Just a simple example of what comes out. This is uh, Elisa's calibration to the U.S. Uh, economy here. And, and basically what you see, you see quite a bit of variation, pretty much what Elisa showed in Chile uh, across sectors. And what, what's kind of striking is that the sector that has the most 
employment response, or the, 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 the factor that has the most employment response, are construction workers. Now, I would have thought that's intuitive, right, because construction workers build houses, and houses are a form of capital. Um, but that's not the reason why this happens here, right? This is, must be all about price rigidity, so that's one question for, for Elisa here. Is this all because somehow construction workers, in the way she calibrates the model, supply labor to sectors with uh, sticky prices? All right, let me go to my comments. The first comment, and it's more of a question than a comment, is what is the nature of the paper? What kind of paper um, uh, does Elisa want to uh, write at the end of the day? So a nasty referee too might say, isn't it obvious that you know, greater price rigidity means greater, a greater quantity response, right? What sort of the, you know, is there kind of not to shift around supply and demand curves and, and kind of get that? And I think that's already unfair based on what I showed you, that there's a lot of richness that happens that comes in through the input-output network that, make, make, make this, uh, that makes this intuition uh, uh, um, um, far too simplistic. But there's, I think, two conceptually different routes. They're not mutually exclusive, but two conceptually different routes that, that uh, I can see here. The first route is the more qualitative, you know, insight-based route. I'm going to call this the Gali route. So here it might help to make the theory a bit more accessible so I can read it on, on an afternoon and, and kind of uh, understand exactly what's going on. And maybe you know, one way to go about this is to have sort of these interpretable, uh, interpretable decompositions that I, that I mentioned where you can, for example, show you know, which sector's price rigidity is exactly uh, causing which factor's employment response. So you can exactly show, for example, why construction workers have such a strong employment response in, uh, in the calibration. The second route, I think, is the more quantitative route, the CE, you know, Smets and Routers type route. But here, I think we want more bells and whistles, right? Here, I think we want to, for example, respect the fact that in the data, it seems that inflation is very inertial. And that matters if we're, you know, talking about price rigidities. And I think here, we also need a proper model of investment. What do I mean by that? Right now, the model of investment is not really a model of investment in the sense that it's it's a full depreciation model, and Elisa knows all of this, and there's no time lag between when you invest and when uh, you increase the capital stock, okay? And this means the interest rate does no direct effect on how much you invest, and I think that's sort of an abstraction that we may want to relax if we want to go uh, uh, fully quantitative here. And there's obviously other sources of heterogeneity depending on the economy we calibrate to that we might want to look into. For example, for the Jolene economy, might be useful to have an, an open economy aspect uh, to it. Second comment, here, right now in the calibration at least, the price rigidity is the only game in town, right? That's, that's kind of driving the uh, heterogeneity. Now there's more coming in future iterations of this paper, but, but right now that's, that's in there. And as Elisa mentioned, one, one thing that's hard to get at uh, when, we, when we split households by occupation or specific demographics is heterogeneity in consumption baskets. And here I actually have an, a, a nice picture for you because I have spent a few years trying to disaggregate national accounts in another country that has great data, which is Denmark. And one nice thing you can do there is you can see where people spend. And it turns out that there's a, there's a lot of heterogeneity in consumption baskets once you allow for different locations that people live in. So for example, this is Denmark. This is where Lego is located. This is where the Lego workers spend. You see that it's sort of relatively focused, you know, on, on Billund, this municipality where Lego is located. If I gave you the consumption basket of, say, somebody living up here, it would be much more focused around there. So you get a lot more heterogeneity in consumption basket if you, for example, allow for a region as one of your uh, consumer uh, uh, dimensions. And my last comment is on comparing Rubo 2021 to Rubo 2022. So in my simple tractable model, at some point I realized that um, the predictions for total employment by sector rather than employment by factor is very inde is independent of the number of factors I have in the model. And so I could collapse all factors in a single one, and I would still have non-trivial predictions for employment by sector. And so once I do that, I'm in Rubo 2021 world, and that's something I think that, that uh, Elisa can, can talk about in future iterations of her work. She can uh, uh, you know, compare the, the rich model that has the heterogeneity on the household side as well, and see how much at least of the sectoral implications carry over into a model uh, with a, a single factor. 
With that, I'm going to conclude. I think this is a very exciting new paper, despite, you know, everything that goes into it, and it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot to digest, but there's very interesting implications there, and I see a very bright future for this kind of research. I offer three comments. First, on the nature of the paper, whether we want to go more, more Jordy or more, uh, uh, you know, Smets and Wouters. The second is uh, on the price rigidity, and maybe we want to allow for other dimensions uh, of heterogeneity. And the, and the third was on relationship to her past work. Well, thank you very much uh, again for having me. Questions and comments? Um, yes, please, Sophia. Okay, now it's working. Uh, I have a question related to what uh, Ludwig, Ludwig was saying about other sources of heterogeneity. Considering the Chilean economy, uh, you could look at uh, informality, for example, because uh, Labor informality in Chile is, is quite important. It, it's a sector that is quite flexible. Uh, it usually doesn't use capital, so that could be important. And also, I wanted to ask you if you have considered uh, looking at, in regarding the, the small open economy uh, comment of, of Ludwig, regarding immigration, because for some sectors that could also uh, play a big role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very yes, please. Yeah, <clears throat> Jim Bullard, St. Louis Fed, very nice paper. Um, so one of the things that's happened in the current environment is that we got a sort of global inflation shock and then lots of prices moved very quickly. So uh, I know this isn't part of your model, but I just thought I'd ask uh, what you think about that, um, you know, as opposed to sort of viewing these different markets as having a certain amount of sluggishness uh, that's kind of, you know, there permanently. Did you hear? So, it's about uh, uh, state contingent uh, pricing. Um, so the, one of the things that's just happened just recently in the last two years is that Obviously, there's been a, a big increase in prices across the board. Is that should I really think of that as sticky prices, um, since uh, everyone seemed to be able to react uh, in this environment and move their prices, you know, fairly quickly? So um, I don't know how would that attenuate your results, or would that exacerbate your results, or what would that do? Thank you very much. I just had a really quick question about the delta. I'm here. <laughs> about your capital delta uh, matrix. And you, you showed us a heat map of which is essentially the delta, like what the coefficients are in the delta matrix. Do you have, do you have, happen to, sh can you show us that matrix? Because how far away that is from one is obviously very important for the results. I mean, that's what Ludwig was saying. That's the key thing right now. I just wonder how robust are the results the estimated delta matrix, if you, you know, raised each of the coefficients by a little bit, how robust are the results and stuff like that? Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so I think it's super important to think about the effects that monetary, see, monetary policy has on different types of workers. And, and actually, it, it, this interacts non-trivially with Hank in the sense that the, in a Hank models, you really want to know if the workers that have more cyclical income uh, also have a, a higher or lower marginal propensities to consume. And so that's actually a relatively reduced form thing that you can do, given your model, which is measure cyclicality as given by the model and then compare that to marginal propensities to consume by sector and then and see whether this is something that would lead to amplification or dampening in a hang framework. Um, so that's w one point. And then another one that relates to Ludwig's comment on on um, heterogeneity in price rigidities is all there is at the moment. I, I think that the, there's a fact that Pete Klino uh, pointed out to me, which is that the, the, the sectors that are more interest sensitive in the economy, like uh, 
construction and so on tend to have also more flexible prices um, and also to say durable goods, more uh, sensitive, to, uh, demand is more sensitive to interest rates but also have more flexible prices and so I think that that kind of goes against price rigidities as just the, the single source of heterogeneity across sectors and, and so um, just thinking about how you can square that with the, the facts on interest sensitivities across sectors would be uh, important. Thank you very much. I think that's all. We have quite challenging comments and questions. We look forward to your answers. Okay, so uh, first, thank you Ludwig for uh, the nice discussion. Um, yeah, I very much agree with you that there is a lot of theory but also a complicated quantitative model in the paper. I mean, um, what I'm interested in is more the Galil route than this Metz and Wouters route, for sure. Um, so I agree with you. I mean, I guess my um, what I tried to do in the presentation and I'll try to do in the paper is like make the theory more accessible and like also clarify what's the value added of um, having this complicated model. So um, maybe a couple of things I can say right now. Um, as you presented, like it was very nice, like the Cobb Douglas model you had, and so uh, so I think that's great for intuition. Um, I think there is a lot of value added also in abandoning Cobb Douglas uh, because I think it's a very realistic feature. Like energy is a very complementary uh, good. Uh, other types of workers might be or goods might be more substitutable. Um, and I think a neat implication of this kind of theories is that you have a clear concept of what's the relevant substitutability uh, that you need to use when you're thinking about uh, each worker, right? So I think that maybe I didn't emphasize it as much, but in microsectional multiplier, the expenditure switching term is really giving you that elasticity, and I think that's a nice contribution of the theory. Um, yeah, I, I guess you also pointed out how does this relate with the uh, Bakay and Fadi uh, papers. Yes, it's a very similar framework with a few more bells and whistles. Um, they have more of a technical analysis, like, okay, this is like pro forward propagation, like from cost to prices, backward propagation from demand to, to um, like, uh, yeah, essentially uh, to fact from good demand to factor demand. Um, I think, yeah, I think like what they do is like, I, I think I have kind of a neat trick to solve the model explicitly, which, uh, which they don't. Uh, and I, I feed different shocks, but I, I want to acknowledge it's their framework. So it's a, yeah. Um, Great, so uh, to Sophia's question, uh, thank you for the suggestions. I very much agree that the informality dimension is something we could look into. Um, and I, I agree with you, it would imply probably more flexibility uh, in prices, uh, and, uh, but potentially also a more inelastic uh, labor supply. I think informal worker might just disappear from the workforce easily, I don't know. Um, and on the migration side, I'm not sure how easy it is to measure, but I, I very much agree it's an important component and it would be very cool to, I think both dimensions kind of neatly can be mapped into some wage stickiness and labor supply elasticity parameter. It wouldn't fully capture all that you're saying, but I think it would be, uh, still capture some, so I think it's great. Um, to Jim's question, so the short answer is like, it's a Calvo model with all the defects and like drawbacks of a Calvo model. So I am not uh, going, like, I mean, the model is as good as, the, as like, the estimate of the delta parameter. If you get a big shock and people wake up and, and suddenly delta becomes very big or very large, then the model is not gonna be good anymore, right? So if everybody has delta equal to one, then you're done. But on the, on the brighter side, I think there is a lot that this model can tell about uh, interpreting inflation movements. So, I mean, I have, um, another paper in like a, the same family, which is um, really using these disaggregated models to speak meaningfully of uh, supply side shocks and inflation. So a big drawback of like representative agent models is that, and like not just representative agent, like uh, representative sector models, is that you don't really have a way to talk about supply side shocks and inflation. Like cost push shock is a change in desire markup, whatever it's. All right. Uh, whereas these disaggregated models instead uh, allow you to map some like cross-sectional changes in demand or productivity into something that affects CPI inflation. Okay, and uh, so it, this is like maybe not exactly related to your point, but I think it's uh, I, I think these are very interesting models in the sense that it would tell you that um, a shock to flexible price sectors, so like capital-intensive sectors, which 
kind of goes together with like what we see that right now, like oil is very flexible, um, supply chain bottlenecks are like happening in somewhat like capital constraint or land constraint sectors, all those shocks through the lens of this kind of models would give you inflation. Um, and I think another nice thing that these models produce is somehow you can use inflation data to tease apart what component of inflation comes from an aggregate shock like monetary policy and what components come from a, a cross-sectional like demand or productivity change. Uh, and like in my calculation, I find that it's about half-half right now in the US. Um, and I mean, you can see it because if you look at the equations I showed before, like inflation is like, you can basically boil it down to one component which comes from the aggregate output gap and the remaining things that come from cross-sectional stuff. So yeah, I think that's, a, and you can tease, it, the model gives you a way to tease apart in the data. So. But of course, I mean, it's a linear model, so uh, the deltas are a function of stuff, and even the, phi, the, the elasticities of labor supply could be a function, or like even of capital supply. Like maybe capital is fairly elastic up until you, get, you hit the constraint, and then it's like very inelastic, so yeah. And uh, to also this question, I mean, of course, uh, it's sensitive to the calibration of delta. In this calibration, it's literally the only element of heterogeneity I have. So if you kill that one, <laughs> you just kill everything. Uh, but you still have input-output stuff. So even if the delta becomes uniform, like if you're in a longer production chain, then you get, uh, you get more of an effect. And I think that's why the construction workers seem to respond a lot, because construction is a fairly short chain. So I think that's why they're like, they end up being like, more um, respond more just because they have fewer accumulated rigidity. That's, I mean, that's my best uh, intuition for that. Uh, and so I think this is less affected uh, by the issue of the investment uh, or like interest sensitive goods being more cyclical because the length of the chain is what it is. Um, I very much agree on the interaction with Hank. It would be hard to model meaningfully, you know, a saving decision with um, jointly with the in real income side. Uh, probably the, the things that you develop, like the Jacobian methods, would be great. Uh, <laughs> but of course, it would be hard to get close form solutions. I don't know um, how, even just empirically, how the predictions of the model correlate with estimates of MPCs across the income distribution. But that's definitely, I think Christina Patterson has a paper on government spending that where she does something similar. Uh, but it's a different application, and I think it would probably be a different answer to what one would get. And it's, if you're interested in talking about it, I am pretty interested too. Um, all right, so any other question? Yeah, Ernesto. Not really a question. Uh, just uh, trying to respond to s some of the stuff. So uh, about informality and migration, uh, those are great comments, and I think that the bank is in a good position to answer them, at least for the open uh, for a for the, for the Chilean economy in some extent. Um, about the, the uh, to Adrian, basically, it's, uh, um, I agree very much that heterogeneity in price rigidity is not the only thing that may matter for the aggregate propagation of uh, sexual shocks, but something that we learned from the input output literature is that it's not only the characteristics of their own sectors what matters, it's also what is going on for uh, in the rest of the economy, the way that uh, sectors are interlinked. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be great to have something like uh, Otonello Wimbery interacted with input output and s sectors and all of that. Fortunately, we're not there yet, but maybe it's something we could talk over lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. A very interesting paper, interesting comments. Um, yeah, I think we're supposed to be back here at 1.15. Please. Now uh, we go to have lunch in the room next to this one. Uh, everybody here is invited for lunch. And the second one is that we are going to move the program 15 minutes later. So, so that we have a one hour lunch and we come here uh, at, uh, at 1.30. 1.30 for the keynote speech.
し。はい、This is t o m Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Thomas. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect, perfect. May I share my screen? Very nice to meet you.、Uh, yeah, we're going to try to see if everything is. So everything works smoothly, so. Yeah. Shall I try my screen? Yeah, just, just one second. I can see you. Just one second. Let me share my screen.、Uh, one sec. Just get my,、uh, my thing up. One, one second. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Right, right now, people are actually having lunch, but like in, in 10 minutes, we're going to start and, and someone's going to introduce you. Okay. And then, then you, can, yeah, you can present. So if I do this,、uh, that's everything's fine. You can see me. I mean, you can、uh, see my slides. Good. You just let me know when it starts to go. And they told me I have 45 minutes. Yeah, you have 45 minutes. Good. Okay. I'll just be here. Oh, that's a good idea. Remind me to unmute myself. <laughs> Okay.
Mr. Sajan, are you there? Hi, how are you? This is I'm Sophie. Here. I'm here. I, uh, I think you cannot see me, but uh, I wanted to let you know that we're still at lunch. We might take 10 more minutes. Would that be okay with you? Sure. I'm very sorry. <laughs> we're running late, sorry. So I will meet you in... Uh, more, 15 more minutes. 15? 15. 15, yeah. Okay. That's uh, 20 to yeah. the...
Keynote session. Okay, I'm not gonna. So I'm gonna continue where I was when I was speaking. Okay, so Professor Sargent received his PhD in economics from Harvard University. He has held positions at University of Minnesota, University of Chicago, Stanford University, and since 2002, he is William Berkeley Professor of Economic and Business at NYU. Professor Sargent was awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize for Economics for their empirical research on costs and effects in the macroeconomy. His work has helped us to understand how the economy is affected by unexpected events and changes in economic policy. He is the author of many books, classical textbooks, to which many of the participants in this conference have devoted countless hours. Thank you very much, Professor Sajid, for accepting the invitation to deliver our Central Bank of Chile annual conference keynote speech. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm going to talk about uh, distributions and aggregates in uh, heterogeneous agent old Keynesian models and new Keynesian models. So here goes. Um, so. I'm going to basically function as an intermediary. I'm going to I'm going to tell you uh, some thoughts of uh, Keynes and Samuelson about macroeconomics. I'm going to tell you some different thoughts of Kenneth Arrow. I'm going to talk about uh, resuscitate an old debate between uh, Burns and Mitchell on the one side and Koopmans, Marshak, Hurwitz, and a whole string on the others. I'm going to talk about some Indian, what I'm going to call Indiana macroeconometrics and functional vector autoregressions, which are the natural econometric tools for heterogeneous agent models. And then I'm going to talk about heterogeneous agent New Keynesian subversions. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll begin with uh, Keynes' macroeconomics. Um, so, Recall the senses in which he intended his general theory of employment, interest, and money to be general. Uh, three senses. First, it explains equilibria with excess supplies or unemployed resources. Uh, just, just a question. I'm hearing an echo. Are you okay on your, on your side? Can everybody hear me okay? I'll just keep going. The second sense uh, is it, it it collapses to the classical or Valrhesian theory when resources are fully employed. And the third sense is it, it justifies minimal, and I'll describe the sense of minimal, fiscal monetary interventions to attain full employment. So what were Keynes's minimal policies? They had basically two or three parts. One was he wanted to sustain a price level target. He wanted a zero inflation tax. I'll tell you where I'm getting this from. He wanted two government budgets, a current account budget and a capital account budget. He wanted the current account budget always to be balanced period by period. He wanted the capital account budget balanced to the present value standard but he wanted to time deficits 
and surpluses to finance public works to, to attenuate the business cycle. Um, he was thereby endorsing an American proposal by uh, two people, Ketchings and Fosters, in the, in the 1920s to use public works to, to support full employment. Keynes' stipulation behind all of it. This is old Keynes in heterogeneous. He assumed his light-handed macro policies presumed that it, there was an adequate United Kingdom's 1920s-style social safety net in place. So what was the heterogeneous agent old Keynes in punch line? It was what was called the neoclassical synthesis. The idea was that you, you achieve full employment by using well-time public investment to sustain adequate aggregate demand. And then once full employment prevails, you allow the Valaisian system of markets to set relative prices and allocations. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to I'll just give you some beautiful quotes from Keynes. The neoclassical synthesis. Um, I mean, I'm getting these quotes mostly from the general theory of 36 or his um, track on monetary reform of 23 or 24. So read this. He says, the complaint against the system, present system, is not that those 9,000, 9 million men who are employed to be put to task, but he wants additional tasks for the remaining 1 million men who are unemployed. So it's determining the volume, not the direction of actual employment that, that the existing system is broken down. Um, so who embraced the neoclassical synthesis? Well, a whole bunch of really smart people. Paul Samuelson, James Tobin, Milton Friedman, uh, Robert Lucas, and a whole string of others. Um, and in terms of macro theory, in terms of econometrics, Koopmans, Hurwitz, Coles Commission, econometric modeling tradition, was aimed at building uh, Keynesian econometric models. Um, so then, uh, later I'm going to talk about s subverting the neoclassical synthesis. Uh, and some smart people have been interested in doing that. Uh, but, but just remember who they're, who they're arguing with. Um, Kenneth Arrow, I'll come to that. Uh, Violante, Nuno, Golosov, and a whole bunch of people. Um, many smart people uh, on the program at this conference. So let me describe, uh, uh, before talking about subversion of the neoclassical synthesis, let me tell you how uh, Keynes got to it. So how did Keynes get to the neoclassical synthesis? So what I, rec I recommend that you do is, so Keynes was thinking about these things for a long time. Uh, read uh, a tract on monetary reform, the first chapter. And what he's, he's, Keynes is preoccupied th uh, with through in the whole book, but uh, throughout, uh, especially chapter one, he, he, he sets the stage. He's concerned with the effect connections between inflations and deflations um, and uh, the, distribu the distribution of wealth and consumption among, and these are his words, investors, uh, those are portfolio holders, the business class, those are people that, uh, borrow to create capital and earners, wage earners. So he's concerned with dis distribution on the one hand and production on the other. Um, so, so here's a digression. A modern counterpart, a modern counterpart of uh, these things that uh, Keynes is, is, is concerned with is, is Menabom, Loden, um, Bandari and Evans and, and so on imputation of the welfare consequences of alternative government policies and Hank models that flow from agency. And that's intimately connected to Keynes's distribution of wealth and consumption versus production. Okay, so, so here's where Keynes goes. He, he, he gives a powerful case for price level targeting. And he, he was serious uh, of this about this through the end of his life. And he, he talks about um, and, and he's writing he is writing at a time when when uh, when those who believe in market economies are under great stress from things going on in the Soviet Union and Italy and then ultimately uh, ten years later in Germany uh, um, uh, various versions of communism or 
National Socialism. And he says, those who are not in favor of drastic changes in the existing organization of society, and Keynes was a conservative in that sense, he believed that these arrangements, uh, you know, markets are in accord with human nature and they have great advantage advantages. But he says they cannot work properly if money, which they assume is a stable measuring rod, is undependable. Unemployment, the precarious life of the worker, the disappointment of expectation, the sudden loss of savings, the speculator, the profiteer, all proceed in large measure from the instability of the standard of value. Now, he's a price level targeter. And then, and then he deplores re redistribution via unforeseen inflation. Um, and this is going to be a theme we'll come back to. He says there's no record of a pro prolonged war or a great social upheaval which has not been accompanied by a change in the legal tender, but an almost unbroken chronicle in every country which has a history. It's a broad statement. Back to the earliest dawn of economic record of a progressive deterioration in the real value of successive legal tenders which have represented money. And he doesn't like that. So he says, moreover, this progressive deterioration in the value of money through history is not an accident. And he has to have behind it two driving forces that he wants to arrest. The impecuniosity of governments, yeah, the inflation tax, and the superior influence of the debtor class. And then he says, he also says, he notes that the, 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 the benefits of uh, depreciating currency are not restricted to the government. All sorts of debtors who are liable to pay fixed money dues share in the advantage. Um, uh, so, okay, so, so, so here, I want to ask, uh, just as a digression, that's a little fun, is uh, about Keynes's quality as an historian and as a forecaster. So I'm going to peek at some U.S. price level and public debt ex ante return data that were assembled by George Hant Hall. I'll show you the 20th century. Uh, most of these data happened after Keynes made those statements. And then the 19th century, and they're going to raise the question. So here's... Here, on a, here's the log of the price level in the U.S. Uh, starting at zero after the start of, of two world, world wars, World War II and World War I. And um, look at World War II. You you see the log of the price level heads north. Uh, you know, Keynes is a pretty good predictor. World War I is more interesting. It heads north for a while, comes down in 1920. This is 20-year span. This graph has been rigged to match this start, the this, this start days of the war. So zero is either 1941 for the US or, or 1914. And if you look at World War I, uh, notice prices stabilize in the 20s. Then they, then they drop like a very fast in the, in, in the, in the, after, during the Great Depression. And they come back, that's gonna have a role. Um, uh, real returns on government debt um, for the first 10 or so years, uh, uh, and, and, and beyond that, 20 years, uh, cumulative real returns of people who held U.S. government debt uh, were bad, uh, just like Keynes said. World War World War I is an interesting story. Notice that they, that, that they recover in the Great Depression, uh, something, something uh, Franklin Roosevelt didn't like. So if you extend this digression on U.S. debt default um, beyond 1933, it sets the stage for Sebastian Edwards' uh, book about American default, um, and um, in you know a subtext for that is Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory, and using monetary policy to redistribute and repair balance sheets, influenced the Roosevelt administration's decision to default. So, so both Fisher and Keynes, who are who are price level stable stabilizers, um, are instrumental. Their ideas are instrumental in convincing Roosevelt do what he did. So read uh, Sebastian Edwards' book to see about how distribution affects uh, were front and center um, on these Keynesian policies. Well, uh, so, so Keynes' forecaster he was pretty good for the 20th century. Uh, and actually, if, if, you, if you see what's happened during in the US during the war on, war on COVID, uh, Keynes looks 
pretty good then too. But what about the U.S. in the 19th century? What about Keynes as a historian? Well, in the 19th century, I'm going to show you again. These these are counterpart graphs. The Civil War and the War of 1812. Big inflation. There's a log of the price level from the beginning of the war. Big inflations during the war, and then after the war, deflations that actually, uh, you know, did what Keynes said you should do. They in the Civil War, the U.S. brought the price level after 20 years, uh, back down to almost to where it started. In the War of 1812, it, it did even better. And so what happened is it gave high cumulative returns to people who, who held U.S. legal tender currency. So that raises a question, what's going on? Why was the 19th century pattern so different from the 20th century pattern? Uh, well, who chose what when? That's all about this. And so why am I talking about this in a, in a talk on heterogeneous agent macro? Because uh, heterogeneous agent macro is as old as the hills. And, um, and there was a, if you wanted to look at the political economy, uh, you drill down, there were advocates of partial default. Um, uh, and after the civil war, there was, there was a big controversy um, that, that was about what Keynes was talking about. So the president of the United States in 1868, he wants to, he wants to default by, um, by, uh, he, he wants to tax and, and pay lenders, not back in gold, but in a depreciated currency. And he says, this is scary. The lessons of the past admonish the lender that it is not too well to be over anxious in exacting from the borrower rigid compliance to the letter of the bond. That's what he says. And the Democratic Party embraced that in, in its platform. Uh, well, the, what did the Republican Party say? Um, it said the Republican Party, you could read their whole platform. He says, we denounce all forms of repudiation as a national crime and national honor requires the payment of the public indebtedness and the utmost good face to all creditors at home and abroad not only according to the letter, but in the spirit of the laws in which it was contracted. And that prevailed, and that explains why those post-Civil War returns looked very different than the post-World War I and World War II returns. This is just scratching the surface on, on why these distributional, uh, uh, the balance of uh, interests changed between the 19th and 20th century. Okay, so Keynes's policy pri priorities, so look what he says. Um, he says, he says we must make it a prime object of deliberate state policy that the standard of value in terms of which they are expressed should be kept stable. Adjusting in other ways, the redistribution of the national wealth, if in the course of time, the laws of inheritance and the rate of accumulation have drained too great a proportion of the income of the active classes into uh, spending and control of the inactive. Um, so, so that's that's the case for Keynes's uh, Keynes's neoclassical synthesis: uh, light-handed touch, uh, separate uh, redistribution policy from aggregate demand policy. So now we're gonna, in the theme of this conference, we're gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a take on uh, questioning the neoclassical synthesis. Um, by the by the way, I can. Uh, if you, if you say you didn't think Friedman uh, embraced the neoclassical thesis, well, read his presidential address when he defines the, na the, the natural rate of unemployment. And he talks about it as something ground out by the Valrasian uh, system of equations. That's his language, uh, which created a big debate between the... Uh, anyway, I could tell you more about that if you ask me. Okay, so here we go to Arrow. We're gonna, I'm gonna uh, quote from something I highly recommend, Kenneth Arrow's review of Paul Samuelson's collected works, uh, 1967. Uh, Samuelson uh, has not addressed himself to one of the major scandals of current price theory, the relationship between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Neoclassical macroeconomic equilibrium with fully flexible prices present, that's the Valrasian system, presents a beautiful picture of the mutual articulations of a complex structure, full employment being one of its elements. 
what is the relationship between this world and either the real world with its recurrent tendencies to unemployment and labor, and indeed of capital goods, or the Keynesian world of an unemployment under an unemployment equilibrium? Well, you know, Samuelson had given a, an answer. He, he bought Keynes. He says, if the neo if the neoclassical model with fully full price flexibility were sufficiently unrealistic that stable unemployment equilibrium be possible, then in all likelihood, the bulk of the theorems that Samuelson himself, Arrow, and everyone else from the neoclassical assumptions are also counterfactual. They're wrong. The problem is not resolved by what Samuelson is called the neoclassical synthesis, in which it is held that the achievement and a full employment requires Keynesian intervention, but that neoclassical theory is valid when full employment is reached. It's a direct challenge. And now he, 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 gets, he gets nerdy. Uh, so, so read this. Uh, he, he writes down two models, a K of G. G is a bunch of policies. K is the Keynesian model. And he writes W of G, Valrhasian. And he, and he says, uh, if, if G star is such that full employment holds in K of G bar, can it be true that theorems and value valid in W of G bar are also valid in K of G bar? He says no. And that's the heart of, uh, of, what, about a, of what a bunch of new, new Keynesians are up to. Um, so that's a direct challenge. Um, and then, and, uh, uh, you know, my job is to not tell you what I think, go read, Go read Errol's whole paper. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, another thing he says, you know, Samuelson, uh, uh, Errol notes this, Samuelson was really unsympathetic to the econometric branch, the, the Koopmans, uh, Hurwitz branch, using econometrics to, to fit Keynesian models. He was very unsympathetic. Uh, Errol was sympathetic to that. And he noted that the major developments in, in macro theory the developments of more subtle theories of the consumption function and the distributed type theories of investment have been closely associated with econometric uh, investigation. He's talking about Friedman, uh, Modigliani, and Ando, Jorgensen's theories of investment, which were which were active at that time. Look at the date, 1967. Okay, so 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 this uh, observation of of uh, Arrow. So it's it's the bridge. Uh, he recommends taking econometric uh, uh, findings theory seriously. So now let's kind of fast forward. Let, let let's go to back to the basics, and then we'll we'll jump to econometrics that I think at least are pertinent for um, for for uh, New Keynesian macro models. So so just, I'm just going to go back to a a formalism that's both very old and very contemporary in terms of these days of machine learning um, and uh, big data. So I'm gonna, uh, what's a statistical model? It's a probability distribution F of Y given theta of a random vector that could be a, a sequence indexed by parameters theta. That's what statisticians and macroeconomists mean by a, a statistical model. Well, there's two types of statistical models both of which are useful, but they're very different. There's a descriptive model where there's a set of parameters theta descript, where the parameters are data reducers like regression coefficients, shock covariances. They're not fully interpreted in terms, or maybe interpreted at all, in terms of objects intelligible to an economic theorist. They're data descriptors, and that's all they are. Um, what's a structural model? Um, well, theta structs, if you have a structural model, the parameters are fully interpreted. Uh, now, in nowadays, uh, you know, post-rational expectations econometrics, they're, they're interpreted as, as pinning down preferences, technologies, endowments, information structures, surprises that instigate Keynes's great phrase, mistakes of foresight. Um, okay, so what are the purposes of statistical models? Well, different purposes. Descriptive models are dimension reduction, data compression, pattern recognition, noble, noble purposes. What, what about structural model? 
they're designed to uncover invariants that, uh, and, and this is a language from physics, but it's a, it, but, but it, it got imported to economics by Koopmans and Marshak, and then Lucas uh, uh, adopted it, uh, uncover invariants that can uh, support theoretical analysis of unprecedented policy interventions. The word unprecedented is going to is going to be important. Things that you never observed in the sample, but you might want to try. Okay, so <clears throat> let, let's let's put this to work and talk a, do a little a little history. Um, so, Koopmans versus Burns and Mitchell, uh, really an important debate. And uh, Koopmans measurement without theory. I recommend reading that carefully. Uh, it's a model of of constructive criticism. Uh, constructive, uh, sympathetic, and devastating criticism. He said that Burns and Mitchell's measuring business cycles, which provided the procedures that are used today, till today, to, by the National Bureau of Economic Research to date business cycles, they had constructed a descriptive statistical model. And Koopmans made a bunch of uh, suggestions for uh, sympathetic suggestions how to improve that, basically using dynamic versions of factor models. Um, that various people picked up with profit. So, so, so what Koopman said is, if you really want a structural model, you want to use this to do policy, and he wanted to use it to do policy because he was on the on the on the group of people uh, uh, devising a, a statistical methods that could be used to estimate Keynesian macro models. So, in his book, which I recommend. Uh, is uh, uh, the editor uh, Koopman Statistical Inference and Dynamic Economic Models, a wonderful book. He wanted to construct structural Keynesian econometric models so that they could recommend aggregate demand management policies that would implement the neoclassical synthesis. So see, for example, Koopman's forty-six paper in the AER. So, so what's what are the connections between the two types of statistical models? They, they're intimately connected. Uh, so what did Koopman want? Koopman wanted? He wanted theta descriptive to be a function uh, somehow. That, so you have a descriptive model. You come to me and you have, a, you have these thetas, which are data reducers. He wanted to get a function uh, where those were a function of some other parameters in a, in a, in a structural model. So he wanted to construct this F. Um, and actually, you know, Matt ring a bell. Uh, uh, this is this is the link between structural and reduced form models in Koopman's language. So why did he want that? Well, maybe he could try to recover theta structural uh, from by applying F inverse uh, to an A structural model. Uh, that's that's the key thing. Now that may ring a bell because that's the key idea of of indirect inference. Uh, which is, which is a really powerful tool. So, uh, just to remind you what that structure is, um, it, it came out of the '90s. Tony uh, Smith's thesis is one of the first, but th th there's there's other uh, uh, precedents. There's an auxiliary model. Uh, so, so you're a structural uh, Hank guy, and you have a let's say or a, a, a H A O K guy. And you have a you have a structural model, uh, and you want to estimate it, but it's too hard to do maximum likelihood. So you write down an auxiliary model. It's a descriptive model that is a likelihood function that describes the data well, and you can compute the likelihood function and, and maximize it easily. So what you do is you that's step one with a with a descriptive model, and then you estimate the structural model by using scores. Um, you know, take the take the log likelihood function, take the derivative constructive force of an auxiliary model to generate the appropriate GMM criterion. And Gallen and Tau can describe beautifully how um, how that's a really good procedure, a remarkably good procedure. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, here's the way I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about uh, what's a class of of uh, descriptive models that uh, a heterogeneous agent, uh, New Keynesian economist might be interested in. Well, uh, 
it's it's a, it's what's called a functional autoregression or a, or a, a functional stochastic process. So so what a so what a, a heterogeneous agent that a, a person wants to do is 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 a huge state space. He has a he has a density uh, like a cross section density of some stuff, some wealth, some consumption, or something else. And a density is an infinite dimensional object. So let's call the, the log density uh, uh, L. And uh, what's, a, what's a, a functional autoregression? Uh, you, just, you just run, um, you run an infinite dimensional VAR. So that first line there is LT plus one of X. X is the density. Um, you just run that first order VAR where, uh, you, where, where, we, and, and you can write it as LT plus one equals BLT plus UT plus one. Looks like a VAR. You just have to remember that L is of dimension infinity by one and B is infinity by infinity. So how on earth could you estimate that? Well, okay, and if this rings a bell, it's people are doing related things when they're computing equilibria of heterogeneous agent models. We're gonna approximate LT of X, that density, uh, by, by taking a finite dimensional basis, psi ones through psi K, and some coefficients on the basis. We're gonna fix the basis, and the basis functions psi I of X, those don't involve T, they're either sieves or functional principal components. There's infinite dimensional principal components you can do. So, that, so that's what you can do. And then whole, what's the whole idea? You run a, vi, a VAR, a finite dimensional VAR on the basis coefficients. And then you use the, the basis functions to back out uh, approximations of the density. Uh, that's the idea of functional vector, uh, functional autoregressions. Okay, so, so this leads to something. So th there's people doing this. Um, I'm going to call it Indiana Macro. Um, there's a group at Indiana. There's other people. They fit functional functional VRRs to cross section densities uh, of interest to macroeconomists. So there's Chang, Hu, and Park, um, and they've pushed this in clever ways. They've described how to incorporate cointegration, and and you could you could extend that to do additive functionals, a la. Lars Hansen's Econometric 2012 paper. Um, there's uh, another paper out of Indiana. There's a thesis out of Indiana. And then there's a Yale Penn branch of this, which I'm gonna mention. There's a, there's a paper by Chang, Chen, and Shorefide. And they do VARs for aggregates and uh, cross sections of con uh, consumption den density, which they beautifully estimate as a hidden Markov model. And they are, uh, 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 not so much the Indiana group yet, but the, the Yale Penn paper, you know, they are, they're definitely motivated by um, contact with the, the, the Hank models. So I'm gonna talk about that. Oh, so, but before I do that, uh, I'll just stay uh, nerdy, geeky for a while. There's another uh, uh, promising line. And I, you know, I think this is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna come. There's a, there's a, there's a 90 year old paper uh, by someone who wrote papers with John von Neumann. Uh, he's a very important figure, uh, Bernard O. Koopman, uh, this paper. Uh, and, and, and he, he, um, he described, he'd invented something called, they're now called Koopman operators. And it's a trick for mapping lower order nonlinear systems into higher order linear systems. And the whole idea is shrewdly choose your measurements of states. Um, you function. You choose a measurements of the states. They turn out to be eigenfunctions of a certain operator, and um, and these Koopman operators are, are used now. Uh, they they've incited a, a a literature in fluid dynamics about how to estimate um, the nonlinear dynamics. And and the key thing is a singular value. It's basically running regressions on tall and skinny data matrices X. So this is using machine learning techniques uh, on, on, on data. The, there are promising links between this uh, and functional autoregressions. And how do I know that? It's a hunch. It's because the same objects are in play. Uh, they're, they're different attacks on the same objects anyway. So 
what's what's the findings from this uh, econometric stuff? Um, well, uh, this paper, Heterogeneity and Aggregate Fluctuations by Chang, Chan, and Shurfidey, it's hot off the press. What do they do? They fit a descriptive, it's, it's purely descriptive, you know, in this language that I said, they fit a descriptive functional VAR and they, they fit it uh, beautifully as a hidden Markov process. They, they acknowledge that uh, their observations on the cross-section are noisy observations on the density. They do the inference beautifully. And then they have a very informative discussion of, of a mapping uh, that I talked about that Kuhlmann's wanted, a theta structural uh, as the inverse of this, uh, of a, of a, they, 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 they study a mapping from the descriptive, there's descriptive parameters to the structural parameters that a, that a Hank person would estimate. And they, they, they do that uh, using some simulation methods. So that's, that's a really interesting part of their paper and how they make contact. And then they have sophisticated um, uh, interpretations. I'm gonna give you uh, kind of my own interpretation. So, so, so what they do is, is they talk about, uh, they talk about uh, with this functional VAR, they, they stack a functional VAR with an ordinary VAR for the aggregates. And they talk about cross relationships between uh, movements in the cross-section densities of consumption, say, as an example, or wealth, uh, and how that interacts with the aggregates. They could go both ways. They study kind of the Granger causality between the, 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 the distributions and the aggregates. That's kind of what they're onto. And, and uh, uh, I advocate reading their paper. They can be interpreted as describing how well uh, they have a subtle description of, of what their results mean. Uh, I regard them as, as uh, describing how well off equilibrium unprecedented uh, uh, feedbacks from cross-section dynamics to aggregates have actually been made to disappear through the prevailing social safety net and aggregate demand policies uh, that have been in place in, the, say, the post-war US. Um, that's kind of a mouthful, but uh, so there's, there's, there's feedbacks that, that can't be detected because they've been offset. If that reminds you of something, think about how the right way, in my opinion, the right way to read Lucas's cost of business cycle uh, either his 87 or his 2003 paper. It's, um, it's, it's, that, it's is that the costs have already been ameliorated by, by policies that Volcker and uh, Greenspan and others put in place. Um, uh, so this, the, the Shurfati et al. Penn stuff uh, goes beyond that. So there's more Indiana macro on the way. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say that. Uh, I just got a paper yesterday. So the, the, way to, the, the way to say this, and I'll come back to um, this remark about Shurfati and also my earlier remark about Keynes's caveat, that, that his recommendations were assuming that there was, a, there was a, um, a, a safety net in place that was operating well. Uh, this, this new book by Graham, Eklund, and Early, that just came out this summer or this fall, um, is about American inequality. And if you look at this graph, I, I, this is this is uh, they 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 look at the how uh, some of the transfers and uh, taxes in the U.S. have gone a long way toward equalizing the uh, after tax transfer income of the lowest of the first, second, and even the third quantiles quintiles in the United States. It's a striking graph. So look at the black line and the and that green line is those taxes net of transfers. And I think they've actually neglected because they don't have the number, some transfers that are in place. So there's, there's, so there's a lot of, uh, of uh, transfers already going on. Uh, I just saw a new paper um, by an NYU graduate student uh, who, who talks about how uh, consumption fluctuates uh, over the cycle, much lower for, uh, much less for, um, for, uh, for low income workers than for higher income workers. But that's related to this. So I'm just going to, uh, with this, this welfare is really being import, important, uh, Keynes's caveat. So um, how do we think about welfare? And I'm going to loop back to something. Um, 
So kind of the state of the art, in my opinion, talk about uh, work on optimal welfare provision, both theoretical and, and applied, is to uh, apply recursive mechanism design. That is uh, dynamic programming squared, which represents history dependence via continuation values of states. So, uh, so distributions matter and, um, and history dependence matters as it does in incomplete markets models and also models and in, in, in models of, uh, of uh, optimally managing um, incentive problems. So uh, like in my opinion, a gold standard papers is Pavoni and Violanti's optimal welfare to work programs. They put this machinery to work um, in, in a kind of, in a micro context. And I, and I think uh, they're designing things to improve this graph. And then um, there's a follow-up paper by Pavoni, Setti and Violante. Um, and they talk about how, how the principle of the government can use a combination of welfare benefits uh, to minimize the, the, the costs, the social costs of, uh, of, uh, of smoothing. Um, so, so that's in place. Okay, so now I'm gonna return how these Violanti style tools have been, have been, used, uh, have been used by some people to uh, subvert the neoclassical synthesis. Um, and um, so, so there's this there's this paper by Bondari, Evans, and others. Uh, this isn't the only one. What they do is they apply Violante style dynamic programming squared to to ex ante heterogeneous Hank models. So so there's um, there's different types who who have different risks. Uh, uh, they're exposed to different business cycle uh, risks that are. You know that are that are calibrated to capture some of uh, not sure fighties, but uh, um, um, other other people's uh, grooving and other people's evidence. And then what they do is they they compute Ramsey plans, uh, the best under commitment, and they compare outcomes and policies under optimal history dependent policies with those recommended by an ordinary Taylor rule, an ordinary Taylor rule. Um, you know, Taylor's rule of two, it's very simple. And then they interpret the differences in terms of motivations of the Ramsey planner. And I want, I want to compare those motivations to, to what Keynes said that the, that the macro person should be doing. And, uh, and uh, what they find is that responses of optimal, in this paper, of optimal policies to aggregate shockers, shocks differ qualitatively and quantitatively from what they would be in a, a, a corresponding representative agent economy. Um, and they're, they're much larger. And the Taylor rule can be, can be much improved on. And there's a motive to provide insurance that arises from the heterogeneity in the incomplete markets. And it, it completely outweighs the price stabilization motives. There is a, there is a, price, there is a price targeting motive embedded in these models, but it's swamped by these heterogeneous agent uh, considerations. So, so um, you know, in this, in this paper, um, a, a, the, a, using one of these, uh, an updated version of the Benabou Floden um, welfare decomposition, the sources of the welfare gains, uh, they're, they're quite different from what Keynes was advocating. The insurance component is positive and greater than 100%. The redistribution component is small. Uh, uh, that's aligned with Keynes's neoclassical fences. But the aggregate efficiency component is, is, is negative, which is the opposite of, uh, of, uh, of Keynes's instincts. Um, you know, his instincts were, were, were you know, use aggregate demand to take care of aggregate efficiency, get yourself to the full employment uh, frontier. Let the so social safety net from other sources uh, act. And then, uh, okay, so you'll see that this is different. Okay, so, so, uh, so I'm just quoting from this paper. Essentially, all the gain, welfare gains from optimal Hank policies arise from the additional insurance that they provide. Provision of insurance comes at the cost of sacrificing price stability, which creates losses and lowers aggregate resources available for 
assumption. Um, well, that's subversive of the of uh, of the of the neoclassical synthesis. Uh, maybe Arrow would like that, uh, but uh, I don't think Samuelson and Keynes would. Um, okay, so I'm I'm ready to conclude. So so you know, these are my half baked thoughts about. Hank versus heterogeneous agent old Keynesian models. I'll just say that I think they're they're enduring and important issues, and um, I look forward to he hearing what uh, uh, economists younger than I and, and almost every economist is younger than I have to, have to say. And I, I I'm I'm ready to I'm done. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Professor Sargent, for this wonderful lecture. So we ha I think we have time for questions. If anyone wants to share. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? We're seeing you. Pablo Garcia. Hi, Professor Sargent, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, regarding your, your mention of the importance of price level, of price level stabilization, it would, be, would it be correct then to assume that uh, you believe that inflation targeting, which is purely forward looking, where the price level is somewhat indeterminate, is uh, dangerous or not an efficient way of conducting monetary policy? So, so, so here's, here's my answer to that. Um, so it's not, what I believe doesn't matter. I, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, I was playing my role of, of, being, um, of being an intermediary. And it's, it's really, it's, it's clear I, I was representing as well as I could from my reading, rereading of uh, of Keynes, what he wanted, uh, and he he was um, he was a, a he, he was a he, he was a price level targeter, not an inflation target. It, it's very clear from from reading that, and and he acted on it. If you if you look at if you look at um, what he did at Bretton Woods, um, he he, and and the reason and. Many things he did. He wanted to target. The reason he wanted to leave the gold standard is he he thought he could create something that was more stable. Uh, same with Irving Fisher. So they were not in. They were not two percent people. No question about it. And Milton Friedman, when he wrote down what he thought the optimal problem, he was actually not a. He was not a. He was not a two percent either person. He he wanted a deflation effectively. So um, and and um. So what I think doesn't matter. I'm I'm talking about the the, the history of thought and and how this how how, how um, and I you know my role my role is to kind of to put on the table about how um, how how you know what what happened in this in a in a number of of models uh, that are new Keynesian models they have. They have sources of price stickiness that look a lot like they're they're just imported from the the standard New Keynesian model, which had some kind of Calvo stickiness or something like that. Uh, imported that directly, but when you add this heterogeneity um, and and you and you compute optimal what the central banks should do, they're quite different. And if you kind of think uh, these are just if then statements. If you kind of ask, uh, well, how does that how does that affect a dual mandate? You know, um, you know the, you know when, you know when you solve a Ramsey plan or or or, or something like that, uh, you don't start with the dual ma mandate. You start with a welfare criterion, and what you should do pops out. Okay, so what pops out of this is uh, 
is it's something that's not light handed. Okay. And, um, you know, you know, that has that has consequences. And, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, so this, 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 this contrast between these two types of, uh, of Keynesian models, the, the old and the new, the high oak, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, that's something that's been with us for a long time. Um, actually, the, uh, in some sense, the heterogeneous agent model predates the, it predates the, 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 the new, new neoclassical synthesis model. People were talking about redistribution um, before they were talking about stabilizing the macroeconomy. At least in my own country, 19th century, 18th century macro policy wasn't about assuring full employment. It was about uh, reallocating between creditors and debtors of all types. You know, and it wasn't until anyway. So, I'm I'm not answering your question, but because uh, I don't know. James, yeah, uh, this is Jim Bullard. Hi, Tom. Thanks for the nice uh, lecture in the Bandari Evans paper. I'm not sure who the other co-authors were. Um, the Ramsey planner, you know, when you do Ramsey problems, you have to say something about what the planner can do and what the planner cannot do. And it seems like in um, actual economies, we have sprawling governments that have many policy dimensions. And uh, if you try to compact them down just to the central bank's interest rate policy, you might get a different answer than if you had a more fully specified range of alternatives for the entire public policy approach to macroeconomics. Yep. So uh, it's, it's really worth looking at that. And it bears on, remember it bears on uh, what I said was Keynes's caveat. Um, you know, it's like uh, in, the, in the background, I'll, I'll just have some fun with it. In the background, you know, somebody has solved and implemented the the Violante uh, Pavoni uh, optimal redistribution. That's in the background, uh, and 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 so it's off the plate for the central bank. You know, that's kind of the thrust of these. And and what you properly point out, Jim, is, uh, and it's really important to to look at in, in these uh, in in these papers like that Bandari Evans et al. paper. Uh, lots of lots. Okay, lots of these structures of the Ramsey problems is you, you, you ex cathedra say that lots of things can't be done and the, and the only things that can be done are, 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 are what the model gives, model builder gives to the, to the, to the Ramsey planner. And uh, actually he or she, the Ramsey planner uses uh, the things that he can do to, to offset the things that can't be done. So, um, yeah, you know this uh, this pro provision of insurance, the monetary authority for pro providing insurance by monkeying around with inflation and interest rates and redistributing between uh, bondholders. Um, you know, you know, you know, you know th that's why you know what what Jim spotted is you know that's why I went back to the 19th century and had that debate between Andrew Johnson and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, which was a debate about how to redistribute. It's a lower frequency. And the Bandari Evans thing is we're going to do that high frequency. But um, it's, a, it's a good point. And it actually, you know, what's, what's, what's amazing, uh, Jim said, it's like it's amazing that uh, all the discussion of uh, you know, central banks, you know, there's some people who thought that, well, the central bank actually can't, it can't stabilize inflation or it can't stabilize the price level, even do that on its own, unless it gets a lot of help from the fiscal authority. Uh, go across the border to Argentina uh, and get, get a few observations. Uh, so, so now various, various, places uh, say, well, not only should you do that, you should also do all sorts of things that, uh, you know, 
the, the, the Congress and the president can't do anything about global warming, but, but maybe, uh, maybe the central bank can. Um, anyway, sorry to go on for that, but that's where, that's where Jim's question, thinking about Jim's question, gets one started. Um, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for your very inspiring uh, uh, keynote. So I'm, I'm the director of the Monetary Policy Division at the Central Bank. We're currently designing our uh, five-year-ahead uh, working plan, and it's quite important to uh, figure out correctly which are the areas on we, which we should be investing, especially in terms of the, the modeling uh, challenges going forward. So. My question is related to that, uh, and I guess it's a follow-up on Pablo's, uh, Pablo Garcia's quest, uh, question, or at least it's a follow-up on your answer to his question, I guess, which is uh, there are two implications, the way I see that, two main implications of adding heterogeneity into models, uh, or motivations, if you want. The first motivation is that once we add heterogeneity, either significant heterogeneity or sig heterogeneity in the right places, we're gonna get significantly quantitatively different results from the ones that we, we used to get from just representative agent models. And uh, they might be significantly different, uh, different uh, in terms of uh, implications to macro shocks or maybe monetary policy responses to these shocks and so on. So that's one motivation. Adding heterogeneity changes the quantities. Now the other motivation is that maybe it doesn't change the quantity so much. Maybe the aggregate effects are sort of similar, but the dis redistributional aspects are important enough that maybe the quantity variables that we look at are not good proxies of aggregate welfare. So I, I get a hint from your talk and your answers that you're sort of pushing this second one. So I would like to know if uh, in your synthesis of the modern uh, uh, you know, a heterogeneous agent uh, discussion so far. Which would you say is the predominant force? Of course, they're not mutually exclusive, but which would you say holds more promises? Is this about getting the quantities right or maybe rethinking about which are the, the aggregates we should be actually targeting? Thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna be, okay, sincerely, um, So you know what, so because you asked that question, so lots of, th lots of times, you know, what identifies a smart scientist or economist is, is framing the right questions. Um, and um, so, so you did that. Um, and so I, I, I don't, have, the, 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 the way to make, you, you don't want to hear me thinking thinking about that. You want to hear the the people that you invited to the conference, you know who um, who uh, they're the future. Um, and and uh, look, like I, I know I looked at the program. I know I okay. So um, I'm a consumer. So um, and my little caveat about how to interpret Shorefides, you know, a, a superficial reading of the of the pen. Yale paper would be well. That's kind of a, a. It's kind of negative on heterogeneous agent macro. I don't think that's the way to read it, and I think it inter interacts with Bullard's question. It interacts with Bullard's question because you interpret that the right. You got to figure out. Uh, uh, and the and the beautiful thing about an astructural model, it's silent on on actually, actually with the source of the distributions that we see, and then. Um, and, and, and I also mentioned that Graham thing, that Graham thing is, there's measurement issues about that. So, um, um, yeah. Anyway, I, 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 so once again, I failed to answer a well-framed question. Thank you very much again, Professor Sargent, for your uh, presentation, provide us with key insight for this conference. Uh, let's give him another round of applause. Thank you again.
Thank you. We're ready now to move to the next session. Session, session number two, uh, in which we're going to discuss hang models, optimal policies, estimation of hang models. So it's going to be a very, very interesting session. The first paper of this session is uh, Optimal Policies Rules in Hank. Alistair Mackay from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is going to present the paper. Uh, Alistair holds a PhD in economics from Princeton University. He's a senior research economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Before joining Minneapolis Fed, Alizer was associate professor of economics at Boston University. He's currently associate editor at the American Economic Review. His work has appeared in several prestigious publications, including American Economic Review, Econometrica, Review of Economic Studies, and Journal of Monetary Economics. Alizer, the floor is yours. So thanks very much. Thanks for, very much for having me at this. Uh, Great conference. So uh, this is joint work with Christian Wolf, and the usual Fed disclaimer applies. So, so um, Tom Sargent's talk was a great sort of setup for what I'm about to talk about today. So there's this interest in how stabilization policy, monetary policy, or fiscal policy is different when you introduce heterogeneous households. And some of the papers, like uh, the one that uh, Tom just discussed, say things are very different when you introduce these redistribution considerations. Okay? And so in my talk, it just was brought up at the end of the Q&A session, I think it's very useful to distinguish between what I'll call transmission mechanism and objectives. So if we had a certain policy tool and we move it, we want to know what happens to, say, output or inflation, and that could be different if we have heterogeneous households. Okay? A second consideration is what we're trying to achieve. The objectives of the policymaker could also be different when we introduce this heterogeneity. That would maybe be these redistribution considerations. So I'm going to try to be clear about how both of those two considerations play into answering this question. Okay. So what we're going to do, what we do in this paper is sort of the familiar linear quadratic approximation to the policy problem that's familiar from representative agent models applied to a heterogeneous agent model. Okay? And then we're going to derive optimal policy rules in the form of forecast target criteria that would apply for any aggregate shock hitting the economy. And so there, there's two or three benefits of taking this approach. Some that are going to be more salient today than others, but one, this approach allows us to sort of separate these two transmission versus objectives considerations. So I'll be able to tell you how does the transmission mechanism change and what does that imply and then what happens when we also change the objective function. Okay? Second, we can write our optimal policy rules in terms of objects that could in principle be directly measured in the data. Okay? And so this sort of directly points to what types of data are going to be informative about the strength of these considerations. Okay. And then a third is that this is quite straightforward to compute. This, these, many of the papers in this, in this area are, are somewhat technical. Ours sort of because of this linear quadratic approach is a little bit more straightforward computationally. Okay, so in terms of results, I'm going to start with sort of an ad hoc loss function. So we're going to take the usual dual mandate loss function, so where the, the policymaker wants to stabilize inflation, inflation and the output gap. And I'm going to argue that the optimal policy rule is independent of the demand block of the economy. 
And in this model that I'm gonna show you, heterogeneity only affects the demand block, so the optimal rule is independent of the heterogeneity. Okay. So in principle, this mapping from interest rates to output and inflation could be different, but what you're trying to achieve in terms of output and inflation is not gonna be affected by heterogeneity. Then I'm gonna go to a Ramsey problem, and when I do this second order approximation of the Ramsey problem, I'm gonna get the same two output and inflation terms that are familiar, but then a, a third inequality term that's gonna say that the, the policymaker wants to stabilize the distribution of consumption across households. Okay? And whether or not this third term exerts a strong influence on the optimal policy depends on how strongly policy can influence that third term. Okay? And, and so there's different models have different implications along those lines. So in the Bandari et al. paper, mo expansionary monetary policy is strongly progressive. So policy can sort of exert a lot of influence on that inequality term. At the like, opposite extreme, Yvonne Verning has this uh, aggregation result, if you will. In that context, policy is completely unable to affect that inequality term. And so then the optimal policy kind of doesn't really take that into account because it's something it can't affect. Okay? So what we do is we write down a fairly rich model and we're gonna sort of try to use the model to infer how strongly the policy can influence this inequality term. And in short, we're gonna find a world that's very close to this Verning result. That the, the impact of expansionary monetary policy on this inequality term is very small, and therefore the optimal policy that comes out of this Ramsey problem looks very similar to what you would get if you just were pursuing the dual mandate objective function. Okay. Okay. So I wanna take just a couple of minutes to give a little bit of background that will set the stage for some of the analysis and modeling decisions that will, will come next, okay? So first, how, what's the sort of standard approach to optimal policy in the representative agent New Keynesian world? Well, you set up a linear quadratic control problem where you take a second order approximation to the social welfare function around an efficient steady state and you get this loss function here. So you're trying to minimize the deviations of inflation and output. And then you have this linear constraint set which is a Phillips curve, sorry, an IS curve and a Phillips curve, okay? And so you're gonna minimize that loss function subject to these two constraints. And what you get out of this problem is an implicit rule shown here at the bottom that gives a relationship between inflation and the change in the output gap. Okay? And so that's sort of the implicit rule that determines optimal, that characterizes optimal policy. So I'm showing this because we're gonna find similar types of implicit rules for the Hank model. Next, what are the mechanisms, or what are some key mechanisms through which monetary policy can affect household balance sheets and inequality more broadly? So from Adrian's uh, job market paper, we know that the duration of household assets and liabilities matters crucially because that determines how these, the, the value, the present values of these assets and liabilities react to changes in real interest rates. So in the model, that I'm gonna write down, we're gonna include a variety of long duration assets and try to match those up to household balance sheets. Okay. Second, incomes of low income workers tend to be more cyclical than incomes of higher income workers and so that sort of differential exposure of labor income is another consideration that we're gonna build into the model. Okay. Oh, and let me say, oh sorry, go back. So another, another thing that's sort of important in this class of models is the distribution of income between profits and factor income, okay? And so the standard sticky price model would say uh, prof expansionary policy leads to a drop in profits and a rise in the labor share. Empirically, the labor share doesn't move very much or fall slightly, okay? So that's, that's something to keep in mind in, in when you're building a model in this class. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna have special features to match these different considerations. So we're gonna have capital, long-term bonds, short-term bonds, 
for assets that households are holding to try to match the duration of household balance sheets. Okay? We're going to redistribute profits to ensure a constant labor share. Okay? And so that's going to kind of neutralize that share. I, I said these are non-standard features. And then I remembered that Gianluca and Felipe have these in, in one of their papers, so I should say they're like canonical features now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so the model. So we have a, a continuum of households. They have preferences for consumption, disutility for labor supply. Now we're going to model their earnings, EIT, as being sort of generated out of an, an incidence function, people call this. So here, ET is aggregate earnings. Okay. Zeta IT is somebody's exogenous idiosyncratic event. Okay. And this function is going to map, you know, for a given amount of aggregate earnings and your particular type, what are your, your earnings that day? Okay. Now, this shock, this, this variable M is going to be an aggregate inequality shock. So that, that's going to move around this distribution of income. For any given level of income, this is going to be a shock to the income distribution. Okay. And then the other feature that's an important to notice or for me to explain here is that the, the distribution of income the way this, this function spits out income for each individual can depend on the level of income. So that can build in that differential exposure to the business cycle, okay? Okay, so now the budget constraint. So households consume, they purchase assets. I'm gonna be more explicit about what that is on the left-hand side. They have some value of the assets that they brought from the last period, including returns. They get some earnings, net of taxes, and then they get some some lump sum transfer tau x, okay? So the tau x, I'm gonna sometimes call that like a fiscal stimulus payment. Think of it, every household gets $500, okay? Now the, the tau y is a constant, a constant labor income tax, and the tau e, think of that as a, a tax that's gonna slowly adjust to maintain long run budget balance, okay? So like the papers this morning, um, we're gonna use a union to intermediate labor supply. So in the end, all households will work the same hours and there's gonna be a union that's involved in wage setting. So I'm gonna come to that very soon. Okay, production. So produ out intermediate goods are gonna be produced out of capital and labor. These firms are gonna be subject to standard Calvo rigidities. Now a key, a key issue is that they're going to uh, share one minus alpha of the profits that these intermediate goods producers make is going to be given to workers in the form of some kind of profit sharing or bonus. And this is what's going to ensure that the labor share is constant. Okay? We're going to assume in the aggregate that capital is fixed, but there's some maintenance slash depreciation cost each, each period. Okay. So this, this is like a, a crucial, uh, a qualitatively crucial bullet. So, um, so our unions are going to be willing to supply hours based on a marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure. And they're going to think about aggregate consumption when they're deciding on that, that labor supply decision. Okay, so by make, so the, we are sort of neutralizing any distributional considerations on the supply side of the economy here. So we're saying, when this labor supply decision is sort of made by a pseudo representative agent that's making this decision. So I say that's a qualitatively important assumption because it's going to give us a qualitatively stark prediction. At the end, I can come back and tell you why this is not a quantitatively a strong assumption. Okay. Okay, so this supply side of the economy, we can, we can summarize it with a New Keynesian Phillips curve, and then this equation that says aggregate earnings are just a constant labor share. Okay. 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 So now here's I want to discuss now what assets the households have access to. Okay. So here they have I'm showing three different assets, and I'm going to show the the real return on each of those assets. So there's Aggregate capital stock. So if you own a share of capital, you get the factor payments to capital and you get some part of the, the, the monopoly profits. So you get a share alpha 
Y distributed among all the, the capital owners. Okay, so there's K bar shares of capital outstanding. You pay some depreciation cost, and then you have a unit of capital remaining. This QK is the price of a share of capital, or a unit of capital, okay? So this, this ratio is the real return on capital, right? Next line, you, there's a short-term bond. The Fisher equation gives us the real return on the short-term bond. And then lastly, we have a long-term bond. So we model this in the standard geometrically declining coupon way of modeling a long-term bond. So you get some coupon payment, and then you retain a share one minus sigma b of the long-term bond position, okay? So now we're gonna, we're gonna look at a perfect foresight transition path. That's gonna be our equilibrium concept. And so along this perfect foresight transition, all the expected returns have to be equalized, okay? These, are, these assets are perfectly liquid. There's no risk along this transition, so the, the expected return needs to be equalized by no, no arbitrage. But at date zero, when there's some news about policy or some aggregate shock, these asset prices can jump. The realized returns ex post can differ, okay? So, so we have this variety of assets but what it really amounts to is at date zero, there's gonna be some redistribution according to who owns more of one asset or another. So if there's some lower interest rates, lower real rates, then say the price of capital is gonna jump up. If you're a household who owns a lot of capital, that's good for you, okay? So what does this mean? So, so now in the budget constraint, I'm just gonna keep track of the value of every household's asset position. I don't need to keep track of their individual holdings. But, so on the left-hand side, I don't need to have some kind of portfolio choice. I just need to think about the, the total value of savings that you're gonna do. So, sorry, that should be RT in the denominator there. On the right-hand side, I need to keep track of the, the value of your asset position coming into the period, inclusive of returns. At date zero, that's gonna, that's gonna be determined by what portfolio you held sort of coming into date zero. But then after, it's just a function of what you chose in the previous periods, okay? So what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use data from the Survey of Consumer Finance to look at household portfolios and then think about how they would be exposed to surprise returns on capital or, or bonds and sort of get, try to discipline those redistribution effects sort of directly from the portfolio, portfolios we see households holding, okay? So this is related to something by Adrian and, and Matt in, a, in another paper. Okay. okay, so the government has two tools that we're gonna focus on. They can manipulate nominal rates and they can, they can send out these fiscal stimulus payments, okay? Okay, so now to sort of summarize in equilibrium by s combining various equations and linearizing, we can express in equilibrium in terms of two equations. So here, think of this as this bold-faced notation as a, a time path, like a, a vector of how, say, inflation responds along this transition path, okay? So we have a new Keynesian Phillips curve equation and then we have sort of an aggregate consumption equation or generalized IS curve. Where, where this is coming from is from thinking about how a household would respond to different prices that they face in terms of their consumption decisions and then substituting in, say, the government budget constraint and various asset, might, asset pricing equations to express sort of the aggregate demand side of the economy in terms of various key aggregate variables, okay? Okay, so now I wanna discuss dual mandate policy. So why am I doing this? It's not any kind of social welfare function. So there's two reasons. One, it sort of allows me to separate the the impact of heterogeneity on the dynamics of the economy from the impact on the objective function. And two, this might be the relevant objective function for a central bank whose mandate, say, is to stabilize output and inflation, okay? 
So we're gonna have this standard loss function, and now we're gonna switch it into our sequence space notation, okay? So, so remember, the boldface variables are vectors of how that variable responds over the time path, okay? So this, this discounted sum of the squared output and inflation paths now becomes this sort of geometric, this quadratic form of the output and inflation vectors, where W just is this diagonal time discounting matrix, okay? And then the constraint set are these two linear equations that I showed you to characterize the equilibrium, okay? So now we're trying to minimize this quadratic loss function subject to these two linear equations, okay? And so this is, you know, it's a little, you need to know like Adrian and, and Ludwig's like uh, Python package maybe. If you know that stuff, then doing this calculation is kind of immediate, okay? Because those, those C tilde matrices are, are more or less things you can get from their, from their, their package, okay? Okay, so the optimal monetary policy rule is characterized or th by this implicit equation, which is exactly the same one that you get in the representative agent model. So, so Jordi is gonna say, this is obvious. To derive, to derive this rule, you forget about the IS curve and you say that's a slack constraint. We don't need to think about it. Monetary policy can have whatever demand it wants, so we don't need to think about exactly how it does that. And so that, that's the logic here. The demand side of the economy, if you don't have a ZLB or something, the demand side of the economy is not a constraint on monetary policy in the linear model, right? Okay. Okay, so what does this mean? In the, in the representative agent version of this model and the heterogeneous agent version of the model, you would get the same paths for output and inflation in response to any non-policy shock. Now, where you care about the demand side of the economy is how do you implement that, say, that, say, that path for Y? Right, because that's how you would, you would think about this. I'm gonna minimize the loss subject to the Phillips curve, find the optimal pi and y, and then I'm gonna use the IS curve to figure out what interest rate path I need to get that output path. And now if I change the IS curve, I'm gonna change the interest rate path that's needed to implement this outcome. Okay. So in principle, that could be a big deal, okay? So here I'm plotting the response to a cost push shock under the Hank version of the model and the representative agent counterpart, okay? So the, what I just showed you before is that for output and inflation, you get, by, you know, by that result, you get the same answer. So what's interesting is over here, what nominal rate path is needed to implement this outcome? And it's pretty similar. That's just what the model is telling me. But I'm, I'm gonna go a step further and argue that it kind of has to be that way. We can see empirically what happens when interest rates change to say output or inflation. And so we can measure the whole transmission mechanism that includes these, micro, you know, these issues of microeconomic heterogeneity. And so if it was the case that the Hank model and the Rank model had very different mappings from interest rates to output, we would be able to go to the data and say, well, that model is, is not consistent with these aggregate empirical results. So any kind of model that has the discipline of trying to match up with the empirical evidence that relates interest rates to these aggregate outcomes kind of has to be ballpark similar in terms of its predictions for what happens when you change interest rate. Okay, so now the Ramsey problem. So this, this slide is gonna take a little bit of, of explanation. Okay, so here's my social welfare function. Let me just explain the notation as a first step, okay? So on some level, I'm, I'm taking a weighted average of all the utilities of the households, but I'm using a particular type of notation and particular Pareto weights. So zeta, without any subscript, is a history, an infinite history of idiosyncratic 
events. Okay? So in this model, it's like a model in the Ayagari tradition where the households are ex ante the same, and they only differ because they get a different history of shocks, of idiosyncratic shocks. That, that heterogeneity among the households can be described in some sense by how people have experienced these different histories. Okay, so think of Zeta as a different history. Okay, and so we're gonna be adding up over all of those histories instead of adding up over all of the households indexed by I. Okay? Now, I'm not writing consumption, I'm writing omega times aggregate consumption. Think of omega T of Zeta as the consumption share of a household with that history at that date. Okay, so it's just a change of variables, okay? And then this psi of zeta is I'm attaching a Pareto weight to each history. Okay? So I wanna evaluate this social welfare function to a second order using a first order approximation of the dynamics of the economy. So I'm going to want an efficient steady state that I'm taking this approximation around. So the usual thing is you just, you put a, a production subsidy to correct for say the monopoly distortion that corrects the average level of activity. So I'm gonna do that, but then I'm gonna do something more. I'm also gonna sort of use this, these Pareto weights as sort of a free parameter and back them out from the steady state of the economy so that the planner is happy with the steady state. So I'm choosing those Pareto weights so that in steady state, the planner doesn't want to do any redistribution. Okay. And then when there's a shock, the planner is going to want to move the consumption distribution back, or the consumption share distribution, back towards the steady state distribution. So this, this, like, this, loss, this objective function that I'm, I'm constructing here captures concerns about how the cost of some business cycle shock are distributed, but it doesn't incorporate any consideration for long run redistribution, okay? Okay. So then we can do a second order approximation of that social welfare function and derive this loss function, okay? Where the first two terms are exactly the same. As what, we, as what we had in, say, the representative agent version of the model, including those coefficients, okay? So what's new is this third term, which is for each type of household, each zeta, we're thinking about how their consumption shares are gonna be affected by this shock and this policy response. And then, so the, the, om sorry, the omega hat is how that differs from its steady state consumption share. So we're trying to minimi minimize a weighted average of the squared change in their consumption shares. To put it in sort of plain English, the planner wants the consumption shares to look like they are in steady state. Look, so like that distri distribution to look like it is in steady state. Okay, so now the constraints we still have the Phillips curve and that IS constraint from before. We also have to add these asset pricing equations because how these consumption shares move depends on how those initial asset prices jump in response to the news, okay? And then we need some equation that tells us how those consumption shares are determined, okay? So this is a little bit of a black box. There's some relationship, linear relationship, between this vector of aggregate variables and the consumption share of a particular type, okay? The logic here is that a household's consumption is gonna move because its income or the prices it's faced, it faces move. And so this distribution of consumption shares is ultimately driven by the variables, the aggregate variables that affect the household's budget constraints, say, okay? So I'm gonna take this complicated object, you know, for each zeta, for each type of household, how its consumption share is changed, 
And I'm gonna express it in terms of how aggregate variables change. Then I'm gonna take this expression here and substitute it up there. And I can integrate out the zetas. And I get an objective function that only depends on aggregate variables, okay? Sort of a long story short, you can convert this complicated thing that involves integrating over all different types of households into a problem where you're just trying to stabilize a list of aggregate variables, okay? And so then, as the analyst who's trying to code this up, that's something you can handle. So relative to what I did before, I need to calculate a particular matrix that gives me the loss function for fluctuations in, those, in that list of aggregate variables. And once you've done that, you're solving the same kind of linear quadratic problem that we had before. Okay, so anyway, that was supposed to say this is easy. I'm not sure that was a successful uh, argument. Okay, so here we go. So you can write the optimal policy rule in terms of these matrices of impulse response functions, okay? So let's just take uh, theta pi i. The first column of that matrix would be how does, what's the impulse response of inflation to a one-time shock in interest rates that happens today, okay? The second column is how does inflation respond to an anticipated shock to interest rates that would happen next quarter? And so that's, a, that's what these matrices are. They're a bunch of impulse response functions to changes in policy at different horizons. Okay. So here, we have how do the consumption shares of different types respond to policy at different horizons? Okay. So that's, that's a complicated, thing to measure, but we can me maybe measure things that give us some, some, in, some understanding about what that is. So in particular, we can look at what, what does a, how does the consumption for a household say with low income and low wealth? Like in, in the model, the zeta maps into wealth and income. So we can look at households with different levels of income and wealth and how their consumption is affected by policy. That's kind of the kind of data that this model wants it to be disciplined by. Okay. All right. Okay, so next. How important, so these two terms would be this, would exist in a representative agent model. And so what Tom Sargent was kind of getting at with this strong redistribution considerations is this term. That there might be some aggregate shock that would lead to a big move in consumption shares. Okay, so there's some big change in the omega hats. And then if policy can undo that, then that would say these, these theta omega i's are big. Policy has a big influence on the consumption distribution. And so then, in that world, this third term can exert a strong influence on the optimal policy. As I mentioned in the intro, the Verning special case is where these theta ome omega i's are identically zero. So then that third term, poof, it's gone, okay? Okay, so, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the model to derive these theta omega i's, and then I'm gonna show you some data that kind of speaks to them, and, and we can validate the model. I say in quotes, because it's not gonna fit perfectly, but that's gonna be the idea that we're going for, okay. So in the model, so what are, what are the kind of main channels that we're able to capture in this model? So we have the income cyclicality, so Gouvenin's work is sort of a key reference on that, and so, when we calibrate this income incidence function, we're kind of making reference to those results from Gouvenin et al. Okay. Then we have sort of balance sheet effects. So debt service payments. So when interest rates go down, maybe people with a mortgage are able to refinance and pay lower interest rates. Okay, so that's one kind of consideration. Capital gains, if you own long duration assets, then those assets might appreciate in value when interest rates go down. And then we're gonna have 
sort of revaluation effects through unexpected inflation. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna incorporate that first channel through that incidence function, and then these next three channels through those sort of surprise revaluation effects at date zero. Okay. And so I said we're gonna use data from the survey consumer finance to to get it at how how strong those effects might be. Okay. So. To explain that, that part of the calculation, let me show you this table which comes from the distribution of financial accounts for the US. Okay, and so what, that, what those accounts do is they take the flow of funds data and then they use SCF data to impute it to different, the aggregate flow of funds amounts of say real estate to different parts of the wealth distribution. Okay. So let's first just look at the total column, okay? So these numbers are expressed in percentage points of, of GDP, okay? So, so households in total own assets of real estate and durables that amount to 167% of GDP, okay? So this is what you see in the data. Real estate, equities, government bonds, mortgage liabilities. And these are the categories that we have in, in the model. Okay, so the, the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna take each of those rows in the top panel and sort of map it into some bundle of these things down here. So for example, uh, equity, like corporate equity, that's gonna be a leveraged claim on capital. And so we make an assumption about the, the leverage ratio and how much that leverage is short-term bonds and long-term bonds. And then, so we map, if you hold some amount of equity, then that maps into some mixture of these things, okay? So for each of these categories, we're mapping it into these categories, okay? So that expresses the assets that you would see in the survey of consumer finance in terms of things in the model. That's step one. And then if we go across a row, this table is showing you how that 167% is distributed over levels of net worth, okay? So we're gonna take that kind of idea from the survey of consumer finance to, to sort of create a function of net, map net worth into a portfolio, okay? So at the end of this, this calculation, what we have is for, for any level of net worth, we're gonna impute a mixture of how your net worth is held in terms of these assets, okay? So what, what is that, we're gonna have households who have, have gross positions larger than their net position. So you might have a household who has low net worth or moderate net worth, but they have you know, a house and then they have a mortgage. And so that opens the door for sort of larger redistribution effects than you might think just based on their net worth. So this is kind of like a key figure from the talk. So on the horizontal axis, I'm showing the percentile of, of your percentile in the wealth distribution. And on the vertical axis, I'm showing how your consumption responds on impact after an uh, expansionary monetary shock. And the key thing in this figure is that it's pretty flat. So guys in the low wealth bucket and guys in the high wealth bucket, they, their consumption reacts similarly to this expansionary monetary policy shock. So in terms of those consumption shares, the consumption shares aren't moving much. If everyone is moving their consumption in the same proportion, then the consumption shares aren't, aren't changing much, okay? So this, this is sort of gonna tell you the result, right? So I'm, I'm just showing you that that omega, that theta sub omega is close to zero. That's what this figure says. Okay, so I said I was gonna validate the model. So here's data from Norway. So what, so Holm et al, they look at percentiles of liquid wealth and then how consumption change, changes to an expansionary monetary shock. I have two lines because, you know, the, in, empirically these things play out over time. And so this line is sort of looking at a horizon of two to three years. This line is looking at a horizon of four to five years. And you're probably thinking to yourself, that doesn't match very well. Why did you show it? But 
the key point is, in, take this line. This guy is responding similarly to this guy. So if you had a shock that was sort of bad for the low, low wealth end of the spectrum, you would not be able to say use expansionary monetary policy to boost this guy up without having the byproducts that you're boosting this guy up to. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's. Let me show you kind of what comes out for two different aggregate shocks. Okay. So first, I'm going to look at a distributional shock. Remember, in that incidence function, I had the m that's going to tilt the income distribution. So this is a shock that's going to tilt the income distribution away from low-income people and towards high-income people. And you can kind of see the effects of the shock over here. So this is under the dual mandate optimal monetary policy. The low-income guys, their consumption falls. The, high, the high-income people, their consumption rises. Okay, so that's sort of what this shock is doing. It's an aggregate demand shock, so you're taking income from the, the high MPC people and giving it to the low MPC people. So interest rates, in order to stabilize output and inflation, are going to fall. Okay. Now here's what happens if you do the Ramsey monetary policy. Okay. So you cut interest rates further, but for a very rather short amount of time. It's really in the first, first quarter after the shock. There's about 100 basis points further cut. And then thereafter, you kind of follow a similar trajectory. But you're really not able to achieve very much at all here. And in terms of output and inflation, you're really not deviating very far from the dual mandate policy. So if you look at the vertical axis here, you're saying you raise output to 10 basis points above steady state. Now, there was a question uh, from Jim to, to Tom Sargent about what if you have a different tool. So now I'm going to use that fiscal stimulus payment. Send everybody a check. Same check for everyone, but the planner gets to choose how big the check is. Okay? So here's the black line where you're going to use monetary policy and these fiscal stimulus checks. Okay? So on the right, you can see that those do a very good job of smoothing out this inequality issue. And on the left, you see that when you're sending out these checks, you actually don't need to cut interest rates. You slightly increase them. And the logic there is that you, you've kind of neutralized this aggregate demand shock by sending the checks to replace the lost income of the low-income people. And so then there isn't kind of a demand shock that you need to deal with with monetary policy. And so in contrast to that monetary policy figure where it was flat, Here's how consumption responds to these checks. So the low, the low wealth people, they increase their consumption strongly in percentage terms for two reasons. One, they have a high MPC, but also for a low wealth guy, 500 bucks is a big deal, and for a rich guy, 500 bucks is not a big percentage deal for him. Okay. Next, I want to, and I'm going to be done pretty soon, so we're going to look at a cost push shock. Okay. So this is an inflationary cost push shock. The dual mandate says increase interest rates to fight the inflation. Consumption shares, the low income guys increase their consumption share. My interpretation is that's coming through this, these asset revaluation effects. It's not an extremely large impact, though, if you look at the magnitude. Okay. Now, monetary policy, the do, Ramsey monetary policy does almost identical policy here. Okay. And, uh, and by extension, then you get very, you know, almost identical outcomes for output and inflation. Okay, so let me wrap up. So, so the question that we're trying to address is how does household inequality affect optimal stabilization policy? And so when we look at a dual mandate objective function, we get the same output and inflation outcomes with the heterogeneity and without. And so I mentioned that I made this strong assumption about sort of suppressing the distributional considerations of on the supply side of the economy, right? 
Now, what I showed you was that this monetary policy doesn't have strong distributional implications in this model. So if you incorporated sort of, instead of doing the marginal rate of substitution with aggregate consumption, you did the average marginal rate of substitution, it would look very similar to what, what I'm showing you. All right, so, so I think it's, it's quite possible that the, like the Hank literature could say something more about the supply side of the economy and how distributional implications impact on the supply side of the economy. But from our paper, our perspective is that monetary policy is not gonna be the driving force of that, but sending out checks could be the driving force. But for Ramsey policy, you're gonna deviate from the dual mandate if monetary policy has strong distribution implications. Our model says it doesn't, and so then you're gonna stick close to the dual mandate. Um, but our model says that fis these fiscal stimulus payments do have strong distributional implications, so to the extent that we have that tool, and at least in the US, it's been used in recent business cycle episodes, that could be a, a more effective one to use. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Alistair for your excellent presentation. Now the discussion of this paper is Jordi Galli. Jordi Galli earned his PhD in economics from MIT. Currently he's senior researcher at the Center of, for Research and International Economics and professor of uh, Universidad Pompeu Fabra. Uh, he has held academic positions at Columbia University and NYU. I was one of his students. Uh, he was very young. Uh, in 12, uh, in, in 2012, he served as president of the European Economic Association. Among other awards, uh, Professor Galli has received the National Research Prize for the Government of Catalonia and was co-recipient of the Jan Janssen uh, Award. His work has been a crucial guide for the implementation of monetary policy. Professor. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me and for asking me to, <coughs> to discuss this uh, paper. It is commonplace in in discussions like this to, to start by saying that this is a great paper and uh, here I really mean it. I think this is a wonderful paper. Uh, it, it belongs to any reading list on uh, monetary policy design in Hank models for sure and my forecast is that it will be highly cited. Maybe for the wrong reasons but it will be highly cited. Okay, so very good. So mm, in a sense, uh, Alice there's presentation was a bit different from the, the paper, and I will stick to the logic of the paper, and then, uh, then we'll see. But the first part of the paper, which Alice there didn't emphasize so much in today's presentation, is a description of um, uh, what I call here the McKay-Wolf approach from a previous paper. And this approach, which I, I'm a big fan of, I think it's great, um, can be described as, as follows. Uh, the idea is to, to set up a, a, a policy problem as a, a, a linear quadratic optimal policy problem using a sequence space representation of the equilibrium, those uh, vectors that Alistair was uh, um, uh, referring to with the, that describe the responses of, of variables to, to exogenous shocks. And then to complement that with um, a mapping from instruments, policy instruments, to targets, to the, to the variables that appear in the welfare criterion, okay? But that mapping is not based on a theoretical model, instead is based on empirical evidence, okay? And it essentially contains impulse responses from policy instruments to uh, the variables that enter the, the welfare criterion. If you have these ingredients, you can solve for optimal policy without actually having a model. It's ex in incredibly ambitious because we think of models as you know, rough approximations to the real world. Uh, so this tells us, look, you don't need a model. You just need to know what is the mapping, the empirical mapping from instruments to, to targets. And of course, you need a welfare criterion, which could be an ad hoc welfare criterion, could be inspired by a model, and so on, okay? So this paper, at least in the paper, 
um, uh, is meant to be an application of this uh, um, approach to uh, the optimal monetary policy problem in a Hank environment. So that's extremely promising. Um, now, in the paper, they don't do this, uh, which it was a bit uh, you know, disappointing to me. I think the paper is still very good, but uh, um, I think it would have been great to, to uh, you know, hold uh, to its promise and do the, to apply the, Mac, the pure McKay-Wolf approach. They think they have the, 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 the data and the tools to, to, to do it, but they didn't do it. I, I know I'm a bit, uh, um, I'd like to ask uh, Alice there, why didn't go all the way through in applying their own approach that they have been selling so well in a different paper? Very good. Now, let me um, put things a bit in context. This will be related to, to Alice there's presentation. And I, I think to, it's useful to have as a benchmark the rank model, the representative agent model. Okay, so here is, this is taken, uh, sorry, this is taken from chapter five, just cut and paste from chapter five in my textbook. So uh, you have, you have uh, um, uh, a central bank that minimizes uh, this loss function subject to a new Keynesian Phillips curve, a dynamic IS equation, pi is inflation, x is the, the gap between output and the efficient level of output, i is the nominal rate. I mean, all the variables, I think, are the notation is self-explanatory. It's important to notice that the solution to this problem has a recursive uh, structure. Okay, so using one and two, you can solve for the optimal inflation output gap plan, and then you use three only to back out the interest rate rule that will implement that optimal plan. Okay, so this is important for um, Alistair's paper. Now, there are a number of key insights that come out of, of this analysis like in response to efficient shocks that uh, here are captured just by the, this efficient real interest rate. You want to fully stabilize output and inflation, so that's the divine coincidence result. That's optimal and possible. And you want to deviate from zero inflation and zero output gap only, only in response to cost push shocks. In that case, you want to accommodate partly the inflationary pressures from the cost push shock. And that calls for engineering a recession that is persistent. And actually, any um, increase in inflation today, you undo later. And effectively, the price level reverts back to its original value. Okay, so that, so those, those are the insights that, that emerge from the, the optimal policy problem in the ranked model. And then the question is, well, how would the introduction of inequality affect uh, some of those conclusions? No? Um, qualitatively or quantitatively, and there are three possible channels. There's no way around it. There are only three possible channels. Inequality may affect one, it may affect two, or it may affect three, or obviously some combination of those, okay? Now, in their paper, they, um, following much of the uh, Hank literature, they make assumptions such that, two, the New Keynesian Phillips curve is not affected. Okay. And I think to a first, uh, I think this is a, a, a reasonable strategy, at least to, uh, to begin with. And, uh, and as Alice there said, I mean, you know, we may want to think further about ways in which household heterogeneity, not firm heterogeneity, uh, may affect uh, the inflation, uh, inflation dynamics. Okay? So two will hold throughout. Okay? So then the question is, well, shall we change one? Shall we change uh, three? Okay. Now, in the first framework, it's a dual mandate framework, what they do is to keep one unchanged. Okay. And the only thing that, uh, they allow for, uh, that they allow for is a change in three, the dynamic IS equation, the mapping between interest rates and, and, and uh, output gap. Okay. So obviously, if we keep one and two unchanged, and here's where I should say this is obvious, no? the outcome for inflation and the output gap is the same, is unchanged, okay? But then, uh, and then the question would be, well, but maybe the implementation, the introduction of inequality changes the implementation. But they make an argument which is very interesting, which say, look, it doesn't matter because irrespective of whether there is inequality or not, you want the mapping from interest rates, say, to output gap and inflation to, to, to match the empirical evidence, okay? Ir independently of whether there is inequality or not and if it, whether inequality is important or not. So the conclusion is that, 
Now, to the extent that this mapping from interest rates to macro outcomes is quantitatively relevant, that is, it matches the empirical evidence, then the path of interest rates is unaffected by whether there is inequality or not. Okay, so that's what I call inequality relevant, irrelevance result. Now, my first comment is, well, suppose that um, we didn't have evidence or good evidence on that mapping, okay? And that we wanted, we prefer to rely on the transmission implied by a model, okay? So that's, I think it's legitimate. Now, inequality, from my, my reading of the literature, does not seem to affect much the mapping between interest rates and macro outcomes in typical Hank models, okay? So the, the conclusion would not be that different. And, and Alice there today showed the, uh, a picture, a figure that, that uh, made this point. Here is a, a couple of figures, the first one taken from a paper of mine with Davide de Bortoli that shows just the response of um, aggregate output to an exogenous monetary policy shock in the rank model in blue and in, the hang, in a typical Hank model in red, so the difference is not, um, is, is, is tiny, okay? So the transmission, the introduction of inequality doesn't seem to affect the transmission much. This is from uh, um, uh, Daniela Smirnov, uh, who is a, a, a brilliant uh, graduate student at UPF who's on the job market this year, and that illustrates the point in a slightly different way. So take the, I guess the, the optimal policy in rank is the blue line, okay? So it's fully stabilized. Uh, so this is in response to technology shock, okay? So you fully stabilize inflation and output, you know, declines in proportion to TFP so that the output gap is fully closed. And the, the real interest rate that supports that outcome is the one that you see in blue, okay? Now, so this is what we could call a strict inflation targeting, okay? Now take the Hank model, Okay, which is very standard in, 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 in his case, and then impose that policy in the Hank model. So it's not optimal. It turns out not to be optimal in his, in his approach, but in, you know, for strict inflation targeting, you see inflation is fully um, stabilized, and you can see that, well, output by constructions that is the New Keynesian Phillips curve is not uh, changed, it follows the same uh, pattern, but notice that the real interest rate that supports that policy is very similar, okay? So the implementation doesn't seem to be affected by the introduction of inequality either. So from here, we would conclude, again, this inequality relevance result that I was mentioned earlier. But now let's look at the, at the second case, uh, second framework, which holds more of a promise in order to, to make inequality relevant. Okay, so that's the Ramsey policy, and the Ramsey policy, as Alice there explained very well, includes, implies that, and by the way, he didn't mention it, I think, in the presentation, this, is, this was not an ad hoc uh, term that they, they included in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the loss function. This is derived from first principles, okay? Uh, from an approximation, a second order approximation to the, to the utility of, the, of, the, of, of, of households. Okay, so there is this additional term that involves these deviations of consumption shares from the steady state, okay? So uh, that, may, uh, affect, um, um, that may affect the, po uh, the optimal policy to the extent that in, in the absence of that consideration, uh, the, policy, the optimal policy response w w was one that would have implied large um, uh, changes in the distribution of consumption, okay? Now, so here in principle, the optimal inflation and output gap uh, outcome is different from, from, from rank, okay? But this will be the case only, and this to me, this is the, I mean, in a sense it's trivial, but it's, it's, it's a powerful insight. It's, this will be the case only if the policy instrument affects the cross-sectional consumption, affects cross-sectional consumption inequality. If it doesn't affect inequality, then it doesn't matter how much weight the, 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 central bank, uh, the central bank puts on inequality, okay? It, that will not affect policy, okay? So one way to think about it is, um, you know, many central banks seem to um, be uh, very concerned about climate change, with good reason, okay? However, the fact that they are very concerned about climate change, if monetary policy, hypothetically, were not to have any impact on climate change, climate change should not affect uh, the design of monetary policy. So that's, the, the, that's um, the, the, the key message. And um, so 
the, they calibrate the model based on evidence on the distributional uh, effects of uh, monetary policy shocks, and the model it just happens to be such that monetary policy is distributionally neutral, okay? So this condition is satisfied, and hence, optimal policy is not affected, or hardly affected, by um, the introduction of inequality. Okay, of course, when it comes to transfers, things are very different because transfers affect the cross-sectional distribution of consumption uh, strongly, and they are much more powerful, okay? So the division of labor is clear. Monetary policy should just focus on inflation and the output gap, let fiscal authority take care of uh, inequality. So some quick comments. Um, inequality irrelevance is not a general result, okay? Uh, the monetary policy may not be distributionally neutral in other economies or in sample periods. It happens to be kind of neutral in, 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 in their paper, but, uh, and even for the US, the evidence is not unambiguous, okay? So in cases in which monetary policy may, is not distributionally neutral, neutral, it will have a role to play in addressing a distribution motive. And here are two examples, the Bandari et al. paper that has been mentioned several times and this paper by Smirnov, in which the optimal monetary policy actually is different and quite different from um, the one in the representative agent model because their assumptions are such that it's not distributional, distributionally neutral. Now, can it beat transfers from a point of, uh, distributional point of view? It's not obvious, but still, a conditional an analysis re remains valid. Whatever transfer policy is in place, you know, it's, it's interesting to see what is the optimal policy. Now, in the inputs of the pure McKay-Wolf approach are a loss function and a policy, policy in, um, uh, impulse response functions. Now, there are practical problems with these. Available estimates of impulse response functions do not always yield robust results. Different people estimate different impulse response functions, and they may be distorted by endogenous response of some other uh, policy instrument. Now, in practice, in this paper, the calibration of the Hank model is informed by evidence on distributional channels, not really by these impulse response functions of, say, policy instruments to consumption, which is what the pure McKay-Wolf approach would have called for. So model validation using evidence on cross-sectional response of consumption uh, is, is done. And, um, well, and this is, I mean, I won't let much into this. Uh, Alistair was very honest about this. It's not obvious that the match uh, is, is, a, is a strong one, okay? Uh, in fact, it's not clear what one should look at. I mean, this is just the, the the, the response of consumption on impact, okay, after a monetary policy shock for different uh, uh, wealth uh, percentiles, okay? And, and there you see the response in the data after two years, uh, after four years, but this is it's taken from the whole metal paper. If you look at the response on impact, which is what, if anything, should be compared to the, 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 their, uh, respo the response on impact in their model, that's the, that's the line that you see that it's upward sloping, okay, which suggests that, that monetary policy would have some redistributive effects on, on impact. Okay? Just very quickly, because I'm out of, of time, just a couple of comments. The, the authors assume an efficient steady state, and the efficient steady state in their case uh, requires um, a subsidy for the usual reasons to eliminate the monopolistic competition distortion and the optimality of the, this, uh, the steady state distribution of consumption. One question that I have for Alice there, I think it's, it's, it would be nice to relate this to the timeless perspective approach. That's what Vanilla Smirnov uh, follows in, in, his, in his approach. And um, talking to him, we've reached a, no, a tentative conclusion that it may, they may be actually equivalent or close to being equivalent. And of course, this would provide a theoretical justification for, for what you do, which now it seems a bit ad hoc. And finally, there is I, what I found missing in the in the in the in the paper was a discussion of the role of borrowing constraints, and and how they interact with policy in this Hank models. Borrowing constraints, usually binding borrowing constraints, uh, play uh, an important role, and how the you know how the changes in the fraction of of uh, constrained individuals uh, um, interact with policy, I think this, this is something that is worth discussing. So final comments, a great paper, tentative conclusion, 
Inequality considerations do not, do not overturn the main insights from the ranked literature regarding how monetary policy should be conducted. I should be happy about this because that means that the conclusions from chapter five in my textbook are, remain valid. But I have to admit that this conclusion is not without challenge and, and that more work uh, is needed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jordi. We have some minutes for questions from the participants of the conference. Hey, so uh, great presentation and great discussion. Um, so, so, so there's a little bit of an asymmetry in, in the paper in the way you treat the IS curve and, and the Phillips curve. And the IS curve is something that you argue one, sh one can basically take from aggregate data. Um, whereas the Phillips curve is, you just assume to be the the same as the standard new um, Keynesian models Phillips curve. Um, but in principle, if one took your approach to the limit, one could also say, oh, we should just take the Phillips curve from the data. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the Phillips curve from the data looks very different from the Phillips curve that you assume. For example, there's backward looking term in inflation and so on. Um, so I wonder how you think about this and, uh, and whether one could extend your approach to thinking about taking a Phillips curve from the data. Hi. Yes. Jorge here from the bank. Uh, very interesting. Thank you for that. So two things. The first one, um, there is this paper by Midman, Brower, and others that show the effects of monetary policy on separation rates. And, and there you see some kind of downward sloping incidence of monetary policy, which might be interesting for, for, for this analysis. And the other thing is that in the model, right, so you are using the balance sheet data and then use that to map to consumption behavior in the model, right? So I guess balance sheet is a one-to-one -one mapping to MPCs, right, in the model because you're not estimating the responses directly although you use this other paper. But my, my comment is that there is a lot of evidence on MPCs and it's not super clear that it really depends on asset holdings the way you're assuming in this experiment. So maybe other types of uh, structural heterogeneity that determines MPC might be relevant as well. Just so. Whatever. This paper and, and thanks, and also the discussion. Very interesting. In these discussions, I always like to emphasize the life cycle aspects because I think they're very important to understanding the income and wealth distribution. If you think of the fiscal transfers that you got here, uh, where you want, I guess, to transfer from the high end of the wealth distribution to the low end, or maybe the high end of the income distribution to the low end. Uh, these are people that are at different points in the life cycle. So you'd be distorting the whole economy and changing the interest rate around. And so in particular, the ones in the high end of the wealth distribution are gonna be older, and those in the low end of the wealth distribution are gonna be younger. So you'd be, you'd be uh, uh, transferring between these agents, but it's not clear that you can hold the interest rate constant if you're, if you're gonna do that. Okay, so yeah. great presentation and, and, and great discussion as well. I, I want to make like very, very quickly, I promise, five points, <laughs> but I promise very, very quick. <laughs> okay, so first I, I want to kind of reemphasize this idea that I, I, I think uh, Jordi uh, explained very well, but just want to restate it because I think it's important that essentially this inequality irrelevance that, um, that how Jordi sort of um, uh, labeled it, it's a quantitative, uh, it's, it's, a, it's because you, you sort of, you calibrate the economy and you're at a particular point in the parameter space where so this happens that these effects can offset each other, but it doesn't have to be that way. And you know, as Jordi said, other economies, other points in time, things will look different, so uh, yeah, fine. The second one, I would like to, to know what you think about why you find uh, different results from Bandari et al. Three, uh, there is one um, um, component of these um, models that is missing in, this part in, in your paper, but it's prominent in other models, which is uh, counter-cyclical uh, income risk. Uh, and you know, um, and uh, the fact that that could be, could, 
So the way it varies across the distribution um, could also matter. Uh, doesn't have to be just one, uh, one number, but it could be a function also of the particular um, income level or earnings level at which you are in the distribution, and that can, I think, uh, can affect the, uh, the design of optimal monetary policy in a, with a global solution. Um, finally, again, very quickly, I mean, it, it's, I think it's great that you went through this um, uh, in, in a great detail through all these assets of household balance sheets. There is one, though, that is um, extremely uh, uh, relevant for, um, uh, for um, you know, uh, this counter present value of, of income and consumption of individuals, which is human capital. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is, there is evidence that shows that, uh, you know, aggregate shocks have a persistent effect on human capital, and this effect varies across the distribution. So I'm saying this because, you know, the paper uh, that Felipe is presenting tomorrow has this flavor. And I think that, that is uh, another dimension on which um, uh, there could be effects that are unequal. And this is not the return on human capital. It's like the, the, the stock itself of human capital that, that could be affected differently across the distribution. And finally, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, it seems like you have a lot of capital, a lot of wealth in this economy. So what is the MPC, uh, the aggregate MPC? Because that also uh, determines to some extent the uh, transmission mechanism um, or shocks. Thanks. All right, great presentation. Um, so I have three quick points. Uh, first, I really like uh, your results that the new term in the welfare function can be just a deviation from uh, CDC shares. Um, I think it's super interesting. I would love to see more of a discussion of what are the assumptions under which this is true and how general. I think Jordi pointed out uh, like having an optimal redistribution in city state versus timeless. I think also that boils down to you not caring where consumption come from, like is it from like wages versus employment, like you don't have like a differential cost for like having people work too much or something. So I think it'd be great to clarify that. Um, second point, uh, I wanna echo everyone in saying I, I love the approach of like estimating impulse responses and using them, you know, to compute the effect of policy, but I also think it'd be great to have some discussion of like when would a kind of look at critique apply and like what are conditions when we could expect those impulse responses to be primary. And finally, I, like just on a connection between what you do and like a more like a richer model of the Phillips scope side, which of course is the horse that I have in the race. I would think that like the way I see your, your approach is saying, I care about one specific source of inequality related with monetary policy, which is people's asset position. And so I think your discussion is tailored and focused on that aspect. I think this is a very fair perspective. I just think maybe you could somehow make more explicit what are the assumptions that allow you to discuss this aspect like it's separate from the other aspect, which is what I consider it is more like the production side Phillips curve aspect. Next up. Thanks. Um, there are tons of questions in my mind right now, so I'm going to just gonna say that I'm, I want to second all of the questions that have been done. I think that the exercise is a beautiful exercise to provide a benchmark. It's a very useful benchmark and we need to understand better what conditions make a deviate from that benchmark. That said, I want to raise one point uh, that is a little bit different, is uh, about instability. So we saw that the implementation of interest rate is in equilibrium is about the same if you ignore this uh, distribution component but there is a big discussion too about the conditions in which we can get into some spiral, instability spirals, stuff like that, of inflation, for instance, whether the Taylor principle uh, still applies, whether lessons uh, on, on that front still apply, and I'd like to hear your thought about it. Thank you. Um, very nice paper, a great discussion. Two, two quick points. Um, if you can elaborate Eto Pareto weights, because um, it, uh, it went, the discussion I think went uh, a bit fast there. Uh, I, I think almost from a philo philo philosophical point of view, it's hard to deviate from uniform Pareto weights. Uh, so uh, unless there's a mandate, right? So how, how to think about that and how does the Ramsey planner look like if you were to impose these uniform Pareto weights? And the second one is on, on implementation. Uh, if we were to take Jordi's great point that this irrelevance might not hold, um, 
and you were, t you were to implement Ramsey, would that fall more on the fiscal side or on the monetary policy side? Thanks. Okay. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. I'm going to be really brief. I was just curious, Alistair, uh, so first of all, great presentation and discussion, but I was just curious if you had tried putting an investment, because one thing we have found in our work is that actually that breaks some kind of inequality irrelevant in the sense that it you know, generates, for example, differential aggregate responses to monetary policy in Hank versus Rank, and it actually loads more heavily on the indirect effects on the hand-to-mouth folks, and so there actually you might get more of a tilt in the uh, consumption share response to monetary policy. Thank you. So um, th thanks for all the questions, and thank you, Jordi, for the, uh, the great discussion. So I have four and a half minutes to cover a lot of uh, questions. So, um, so Jordi asked, why didn't we, we he, he said, we set up this, this approach where we could use this empirical evidence directly. Why didn't we follow through on that? And I would have loved to do that, and I think it, for some questions, you maybe could go all the way just with empirical evidence, but getting you know the whole impulse response of the consumption shares for different types, that's a, you know how that responds to monetary policy at different horizons, that's a very complicated object to measure directly. So, so the way I, I think there's a little bit of a continuum of you know we have that purely empirical uh, approach or you know and then we have like the full model based approach that we're doing today but there's something in between where you can a use use that sort of logic of the impulse response functions to motivate what types of data you should be looking at and that's sort of the direction I was trying to go in today um, but you could also use sort of a model to fill in for the data that you're missing so you could use some some of those theta matrices estimate them directly and say, for this other theta, I need to impose some structure on it, structure that could come from a structural model, and then estimate that theta from a model. So I think there is a little bit of a hybrid approach that one could potentially try to pursue, but th this is like a ongoing uh, desire to kind of flesh out that implementation of that approach. Um, you asked about, Jordi asked about the role of borrowing constraints, and, and I think there, w when I was thinking about that question, I was thinking, yeah, there is going to be a logic where monetary policy could potentially relax or tighten borrowing constraints, and that would have implications. And that would be going on in the model, and it would manifest through this consumption distribution. That's, so at the end of the day, what the, the loss function is capturing is, can people more or less effectively smooth their consumption? And so it was sort of behind the scenes. OK. so. Um, Yeah, so let me, I'm just going to cover some things where I feel like I have, like, uh, can clarify some things, and if I don't cover your question, please see me. Okay, so there was a question from the back about what was the role of the balance sheets and how we, balance sheet data and how that related to MPC. So I just wanted to clarify what we were doing there. Were we really using that balance sheet data to understand how people are differentially exposed to different asset prices, but then the MPCs are really coming from the model. So Gianluca had a, a series of questions. So, um, so how does this contrast with the Bonderi et al. results? So, you know, there's there's difference in their methods, in their objective function, but there's differences in their model, and I can speak more directly to those differences. And so, so in in their model, this labor share issue is kind of behaving rather differently from the way it does in our model. So if you think of a cost per shock, in the very standard sticky price model. That's gonna, that's gonna drive markups up, drive the labor share down. And then monetary policy is very well suited to undo that, that change in markups. So the, the firm owners wanna charge higher markups and then the central bank comes and stimulates the economy to drive the markups back down. And so that when markups have this strong distributional implication, 
you can actually, you know, monetary policy is very well suited to address that issue in that model. We made this different assumption about how monopoly profits are distributed, which kind of short circuits that, that logic. Um, okay, so Gianluca asked about the aggregate MPC. So our model does a good job of matching like the top end of the wealth distribution. It, it's not so great on the bottom end and a bunch of people are piled up at the constraint. So we get a high MPC, 15, 20%. But it, it's coming from like a counterfactual massing of people at the constraint. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, Andres asked about, elaborate on the Pareto weights. So this, this, is, this is not like coming from like a philosopher point of view. This is coming from A, what, can we, what do we need to assume to make this work? B, we think it's reasonable. So, I think that it, it, it may, or it may be more reasonable. It may be reasonable for a central bank to say, um, we're gonna think about how we respond to the cycle and we recognize that that affects different types of households differently, but we're not gonna think about long run redistribution issues. And so uh, the social welfare function that we write down incorporates concerns about distributional effects on consumption, on the consumption distribution, but by construction, it eliminates any desire to change the steady state distribution. So, but I guess I'm, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been informed that we have changed, uh, we have a change in the, in the program. We have now the coffee break. We're gonna have 15 minute coffee break now, and then we'll come back for the remaining two papers in the, for this session. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation, very nice paper.
uh, and a CPR uh, research fellow. Uh, he has a research that focuses on the use of general equilibrium models in forecasting and policy analysis and, and has generated significant contributions for monetary policy implementation. Marco, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, thank you very much. So let me start by uh, thanking the uh, organizers uh, for putting this paper in this program as part of this fantastic, really fantastic conference on heterogeneity. I am so happy to be here, if anything, because I'm really learning a lot. Um, and I, I, I'm sure it, this will continue over the next uh, uh, two days. Um, the other thing that I want to do is apologize with my discussant because he received uh, the slides at 8 a.m. this morning uh, as we've been working through the night to get some of the uh, results that I'm going to show you. I did send the discussant uh, a few um, months ago, a, uh, a week, no, we have months, weeks. Um, a, a few weeks ago, a, a very earlier version of that paper that, you know, an, an, an older paper that has a little overlap with what I'm going to present, but really not that much as I will discuss uh, uh, in a minute. Okay, as you see from the long list of co-authors, uh, it takes a village at the New York Fed to, to write a paper. Um, actually, many of these co-authors are former uh, New York Fed RAs who over the years worked very hard to build a code base that made this project possible. And we thought it would be uh, important to recognize their work and, and via the co-authorships. Um, I should say that, as a matter of fact, uh, the disclaimer that is at the bottom of these slides applies not only with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System, but also to most of those co-authors who have no idea of what I'm going to present them because... <laughs> um, two people know very well, I mean, Don Gilly, a, a, a new colleague, and then the, the two current arrays who really worked very much on this. Uh, Sikatlas and Gupta, and Aidan Gleich, who is applied to graduate schools now. And, uh, um, you know, we were talking about greet, and he showed a lot of greet last night as he, as he worked through the night to, to get the results. So I'm very grateful to him. Um, okay, I guess that concludes the introduction. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is two things. I mean, the main thing that I want to do is talk to you about a set of tools um, that, you know, central banks, but arguably also, you know, uh, academics can use to uh, estimate Hank on a routine basis and in general estimate models that are difficult and computationally expensive to estimate. Um, and I'm going to use these tools as an application here um, in, in two things. One is a forecasting comparison applications where obviously by its very nature you need to estimate this model over and over and over for many periods which is you know for uh, quite costly and we're going to make it quote unquote easy and then I'll, I'll have if time allows a little bit on uh, DSG VARs for Hanks uh, although I don't have yet results in it, there, there, I, I, there will be in the final paper. And then, in, in terms of substantive contribution, I will use these tools, and for now, most of the forecasting comparison, to kick the tires of a frontier Hank model. And by the way, as Gianluca said uh, earlier this morning, if you have any question clarification, don't hesitate to uh, interrupt and ask them. No, nope, the other way around. Okay, so in, in the paper that we, we sent Marcus, um, we are, we've, we ha we've had a, a Hank model at the New York Fed for, for, um, uh, for a couple of years now, but that model was a one asset Hank model. And given what we wanted to do in this paper, it really made sense to take a frontier model. 
And so we took a two asset model that I will describe in a second by Bayer, Born, and Ludwigke. Um, now, why did we take that model? Well, precisely because, you know, if you read the paper, the title of Bayer, Born, and Ludwigke, from now on I'll call them BBL uh, paper, is shocks, frictions, and inequality in the US business cycle, which is intended to be a reef of Smith and Wouters, shocks and friction in US business cycle. And the whole point of the paper is to interpret uh, the business cycle through the eyes of a Hank model and contrast it with the rank model, the Smith and Wouters rank model interpretation. But of course, Arguably, Smith and Waters were able to write that paper because they had some validation suggesting that you know, their model was a model that could describe business cycle data decently. And one way that they provided that, that, that such validation is by showing that their model could forecast business cycle variables as well as if not, as if not better than reduced for models such as VARs. And arguably, this evidence was one key reasons why, you know, after, uh, after in, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s, a bunch of central banks, uh, you know, uh, uh, started using uh, Smith and Butter style DSG model. Because before, you know, DSG models were viewed as just an acad academic divertissement. So, you know, if BBL are going to do, tell them, tell us their model's interpretation of business cycle, I think it's important to ask, well, how well does their Hank model fare in terms of forecasting accuracy for business cycle variables compared to any benchmark, as Manson Wouter seems like a natural one. Second, uh, a related but important question is to whether incorporating distribution of data slash measures of inequality help or hinder the forecasting accuracy for business cycle variables. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Okay, a couple of caveats that are important. First of all, forecasting in itself is not an uh, end all uh, for, for, for most people. And in fact, you know, even, even from my perspective, it's not an objective per se. The whole point of forecasting, and this is why in, at the New York Fed uh, we publish actually every quarter our rank for so far, rank, but soon maybe also a Hank, models forecast, is precisely to confront the model's prediction with the data. And that's one way of disciplining yourself and figure out where the model succeeds rarely and fails most of the time. And so that's, I think, one way, you know, to really, uh, uh, one, one way to, yeah, force yourself. And, and, and second point, I mean, regardless of how well Hank forecasts business cycle variables, heterogeneity and inequality is important for policymakers, and for obviously ranked models are silent about that. So there's a reason to look to study Hank models. Okay, let me spend uh, uh, really a couple of minutes because this is not our model, so there's no point in me, uh, um, you know, spending a lot of time on, on BBL's model. But you know, maybe not all of you are exactly familiar what the, on on how the model works. So let me say two words. So this is an heterogeneous. I mean, in one sentence, BBL wants to be the heterogeneous agents version of Smith and Wouters. In BBL, heterogeneity arises from two sources. One is a persistently different productivity across workers. And actually there are, you know, Gianluca mentioned earlier, um, you know, income, uh, um, income variability shocks that are kind of cyclic in BBL, uh, that is one of the source of the shocks in the model. The second reason for heterogeneity in their model is that uh, uh, there are both workers and entrepreneurs, and so ra and randomly, a la calvo, these are switch, there is a switch from one to the other. So for instance, I'm Del Negro, a worker, I'm walking, and I may get tapped on the shoulder, 
and beca become uh, uh, Sam Bankman Fried and go make millions. And then, you know, I become rich. And then all of a sudden, I get tapped again and revert to being a Del Negro or worse. Um, so that's, uh, this example just shows uh, that the model is realistic <laughs> from that point of view. Okay, agents uh, trade uh, liquid bonds uh, uh, and in liquid capital, differently from the Hank model of, of, of Gianluca and company, in liquidity here is model exogenously a, a la calvo as opposed to transaction cost. Um, and all, the, all, the, all of these features, as discussed at length, uh, imply heterogeneity event PCs. So to this kind of heterogeneity structure, um, BBL add most of Smets and Vodder's bells and whistles, such as real rigidities, investment, adjustment cost, variable capital utilization, and nominal rigidities, such as price and wage stickiness. So that really the key difference uh, between these models uh, as Metz and Vauders is in the representative, uh, again, I'm just repeating something that, that has been repeated throughout the day, in the representative agents on their equation that determine aggregate consumption. This implies that, you know, when looking at the forecasting performance of this model, it would be particularly interesting to look at the forecasting performance for consumption, meaning we would really hope that at least in terms of predicted consumption, this model would do better than a, than a rank model. Okay. Now, uh, I had, um, I wanted to talk about estimation in a broader sense, or, or like uh, uh, um, following up on, on Tom, talking about the challenges, and, and which are very interesting, in terms of estimating Hank model, or the econometric challenges of estimating Hank model. Um, but since, and, and these are basically that, you know, you want to fit a light and a rank that just fits a time series, most, uh, mostly aggregate data. Here you want to fit both time series and cross-sectional moments. And in the other paper, we talked about, you know, uh, trying to figure out whether there is a trade-off between, fitting, again, aggregate data and fitting distribution. In BBL, really, we're going to, because in this two-asset model, computing the steady state is extremely costly. And so, you know, we need to figure out how to computationally we need something computationally very different from me and from what I'm going to present today to really estimate the steady state parameter. That's not what, what we're going to do in this paper. So we're going to follow BBL, not estimate any, any of the parameters that determine the steady state. And so essentially then that implies that the, that implies that the method in terms of you know, econometrics is standard, um, you know, common filter. For the, for the various time series. And by the way, uh, the, in terms of time series, they use the standard as Metz and Vater observable, which you all know, plus a bunch of additional variables. Some are related to taxes, because this model is non-Ricardian, so obviously having information about taxes is extremely important. But, and some, you know, for, uh, um, are, of course, related to inequality. So in particular, the wealth and income share of the top 10%. Okay, so as I said, let me skip this part and I think get to the, to the, um, to the toolkit that I will try to prom promote. So we want to make repeated estimation for computationally difficult model feasible. Now, the standard approach that, I don't know if you ever estimating, estimated a, a rank model um, is used, or, and that is currently used even for, for Hanks, as far as I know in the literature, is uh, what's done in Dynair, which is Markov Chain Monte Carlo. In Markov Chain Monte Carlo, the way that this works is that you start with one particle, so 
one particle mean one estimate, one, one, one draw for the vector of the parameters, and then you randomly visit uh, the entire posterior distribution, and then you keep all these random draws, and you, know, you call it your distribution. There are a couple of problems um, with this approach for models that are difficult uh, to, uh, you know, computationally challenging, both to you know solve and 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 for which the likelihood is computationally challenging. I mean, one is a general problem is that this uh, market chain model often sometimes they get stuck, and particularly multimodality is something that they don't explore very well, but. For computationally challenging models, this is a, you know, it's Markov. And being Markov, you cannot parallelize it, meaning that to get to draw J, you know, 1,001, you have to get to draw 1,000. So, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck. Um, and this is not a very, a, a great fee, uh, feature. So I'm going to propose a different approach. I'm going to briefly explain it to you and then, uh, um, argue that it can be more profitably used. So first I'm gonna give you a somewhat superficial uh, overview, which is like, as opposed to having one particle, you, you're having a swarm of particles, and then you let each of these particles travel. This may give you a vague idea of what the method does, but I wanna give you a little more, I wanna go a little more um, in, 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 in detail so that you, know, you can see that this method is actually ready, readily ap applicable and potentially useful to you. So this method is called sequential Monte Carlo. And what it is, is incremental importance sampling. So importance sampling was one of the, of the first approaches uh, ever used to estimate an invasion model. What it amounts to is that if you have a posterior that you want to estimate, so the posterior is this last curve here. Um, if you have a posterior that you want to estimate, but you don't know how, because you know, it's, it's not a, a standard uh, distribution, what you can do instead is draw from the distribution that you know how to draw, let's say some Gaussian, and then use draws from that Gaussian as an approximation for the posterior that you're interested in. Well, how do you move one from the other? Using weights. And those weights are proportional to the ratio of the distribution that is your target and the proposal. Well, this important sampling may work pretty well if you have a simple unidimensional system because you know it's pretty easy to cover much of the real line. But if you have a multi, you know, many parameters as this model have, you're dead in the water very soon because you, to the extent that your proposal isn't any good, 99% of the draws are gonna go like in the middle of the ocean where the likelihood is zero and only two, you know, will really get anywhere. So that means that if you draw even a million, you really have an effective sample size, which is that object over there, which depends on the weight, really, you know, a handful. And as, as you can imagine, with a handful of draws, <laughs> there is no robust inference can be conducted. Okay, so what's the idea of this sequential Monte Carlo? Well, let's start, does this work? No, okay, it works in the wrong way. Let's start by, you know, multiplying the likelihood by an exponent phi n, and let's start with a phi n that is really close to zero. Then the target distribution is essentially the prior. Well, for that target distribution, the prior is a fantastic proposal because if you want to fit the prior, the prior is great. So, you know, you have a great set of particles with weights that are all uniform and everything is honky-dory. But then the idea of this is that you can increase 
that Cn very slightly up. And the previous iteration is going to be a great proposal for the next iteration. Why is it going to be a great proposal? Because in between, you let the particles travel. If they didn't travel, you, you would be stuck with the original particles and you wouldn't have solved anything. But if you let the particles travel via, you know, just like you do in, 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 in Marco Che Monte Carlo, then they will move, right? They will move from here toward where the mass is higher in general, right? And, uh, and basically that makes the distribution, you know, better and better. Yes, please. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, you're familiar with, with Marco Che Monte Carlo. What do you do in that, right? You take a part, you, you have a proposal centered at the old particle, you give it a random vector, and then basically you always accept if you go up, and sometimes reject, uh, sometimes accept if you go down the posterior. And that's exactly what I mean by make them travel. You know, there might be more efficient way of that. Hamiltonian is another way that is better, but it doesn't matter. As long as this particle move in the right direction, then, then you got it, okay? Yes? No, every time you go one step at a time. I mean, what's the problem here? Is that The problem is that if um, the particles have zero weight, then you're kind of dead in the water, right? You don't want, right? And so as long as you let the particle move, okay. Um, and if you do that gradually, then eventually, boom, right? You split your, you make your problem harder and harder, but only incrementally, then the end, the end point is gonna be a pretty good approximation of your final posterior. Um, and you're home, okay? Um, I mean, why am I tell, uh, just one more thing? What's going on? Okay, no, I'm going, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, one more thing, I mean, obviously, uh, what schedule, what rate should that phi n go to one, right? That's, from a practical point of view, that's key. Well, Herb Semsterfeide for the for a rank model, they had a specific schedule, but that may not work for your model. And so we discuss, I mean, we propose an adaptive system where basically you actually choose the step so that the effective sample size doesn't decrease that much. So at every step, the problem is made only gradually harder. Okay, so, so far, you may say, okay, don't they grow? You just gave us another approach to random walk metropolis testing. I mean, maybe we trust you that it's any better than, than, than metropolis testing, but then what? So what? Why do I have to hear about it? Well, because it has some benefits. The benefit is that the particles, you don't throw them away. Every time, say you have a new data set, right? So you estimated the model up until last quarter, now you got a new quarter. You want to re-estimate the model. With Metropolis Hastings, you have to start from scratch. You know, there's no other way. With this, you can use the previous quarter as a proposal for the new likelihood. Obviously, since the likelihood hasn't changed a lot because you just got a new quarter, then, you know, what's the big deal, right? Boom, in a, in, in very quickly, you, you can, um, right, the, the particles will adapt and you'll be done very soon. But I think that in general, this proposal, right, is, is for, 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 for people who, again, want to estimate difficult model is much more um, promising. Why? Because let's say that, as it often happens, you want to try robustness to a slightly different prior, change a slightly different things in the model. 
or use a coarser solution method. You want to start with a coarser grid and then, you know, have a finer grid. Then, you know, again, the same principle apply. The, the estimation that you just ran is arguably going to be a much better proposal than starting from scratch, starting from the prior. And so you can use that and do all the things that we do all the time when we write papers, you know, pretty seamlessly in, in this approach. And so this is why, this is why it's, it's important. But again, when it comes to estimating a model every quarter, because that's what you want to do for a forecasting comparison exercise, then, you know, this is really important. Okay, so I'm done with the, with the I'm done. and by the way, well, we already have um, a package that does some of that in Julia, and, and, you know, as a byproduct of this paper, I, I, we will build a new package that, that specifically does that for the, for BBL Hanks model. And, okay, now briefly, I mean, why estimation of the Hank parameters matters? This is actually using the, the one asset model, but I think we would find something very similar using also the two asset model. What I'm doing here is compare a forecast that I'm for whatever, doesn't matter what variable, say GDP growth obtained using an estimated Hank where I estimate all the parameters and one where I fix, I basically calibrate all the parameter except the shocks. And that's the, 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 the thin line. As you see, I mean, you get pretty crazy forecasts if you don't estimate the parameters. So, you know, there's a lot of value in just doing calibration, and I mean, we learn a lot from calibrated model, but if you want to use it in terms of projection, there is arguably the case that you may want to think about estimating these models. Okay, um, and, and now the stuff that, that we work until 3 a.m. To, to, to deliver. These results, like all 3 a.m. obtained results, are very preliminary. <laughs> so don't, uh, um, yeah, um, we'll see if they hold. But what we're going to do is, is basically take a sample period that we, we use from 2000 to right before COVID. So we don't have any COVID data here in, in this comparison for obvious reasons. And uh, uh, we compare the RMSCs for various quarters ahead, one through eight, for three models. One is BBL with all the observables. The second is BBL using only the, the Smith and Vouders, so not using as observable at all the um, uh, the, the inequality and uh, uh, variables. And third, in green, uh, the, the plain vanilla's meds and vouters. Um, I would not focus on period one because that's a now cast. You know, these models are not very good for now casting anyway. So, for instance, in the, at the New York Fed, I mean, if anything, because, you know, uh, uh, they don't, the econometrician does not have the information that all the other people who now cast, like, a lot of high-frequency data have. So, when we, when we run forecasts at the New York Fed, we you always use somebody else's now cast. So, the Fed, as Matt and the others, you know, does poorly for now cast, it's not so important. But from two on, it's fair game, actually, to actually look at these RMSCs, and what we find is the following, that basically, yeah. Are these quarter, what are these? Yeah, so I'm forecasting quarters ahead. Quarters. Yeah, so one through eight quarters ahead, two years, right? Um, so basically, the, 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 for GDP, from two on, there's not a, a heck of a lot of difference between Smets and Vouders and, and BBL, and actually, to some extent, uh, B, uh, BBL without, with, with just as Smets and Vouders does better than, than, than all of them in the short run, but are really, I mean, from four quarters ahead, 
you know, and to some extent, really, when you look at the DSG model forecast, I mean, it's three to four quarters ahead of the horizon that you're looking, not so much the near future. They're all the same. I think a very interesting result is that when it comes to consumption, and I hope, I, 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 uh, you know, this model do a ha seem to be doing a heck of a lot better than, than, uh, than, 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 than Smith's and Bowder's. The results from inflation also they seem to be doing better here. To be honest, I'm a little suspicious of what's going on, partly to make the models comparable. We has also estimate SW on uh, the mean data just to follow BBL. Maybe that wasn't a great idea, but we'll, uh, well, I'll, you, you'll see to what extent those results are, are robust. But I, I, I thought that the consumption result was, was kind of in line with what we would have hoped to find, and we're glad we did. Okay, um, the, the rest of the presentation is gonna be something that we don't have results yet, but I'm just gonna describe uh, very quickly. It goes maybe in the direction of, of what uh, Alistair was talking about earlier, which is trying to use a hybrid model to estimate the uh, um, Hank models. Um, and the idea goes back to an old methodology which was called DSG VAR, which um, Fra with Frank Scharfeide, we came up uh, several years ago. And the idea is, is the following. A linear DSG model, including a Hank model, a linear Hank model, is nothing but a VAR on the observable with cross equation restrictions. So if, you know, here phi is the VAR parameters and the black line is the likelihood, right, the, 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 uh, describing the fit of the data, a Hank model just, you know, puts a cross equation restriction on this. So Hank model says that phi, the VAR parameters, are equal to phi star. Now, one way to judge how well your Hank model fits the data is to ask yourself, well, how much should I relax? So, I, okay, I can view this cross equation restriction as a prior for the VAR parameter. So if I believe in my, in my Hank model, you know, and I have to say, okay, how do the data, what's the VAR representation, how does the VAR look like? Well, my a priori belief is that the dynamics are those from the Hank model. And then I ask myself, how much do I have to relax my a priori belief in order to optimally fit the data? And so, you know, the choices are, are as follows, right? If this line is very much in the tail of the distribution, so my, my Hank model is really bad, then the answer is that to fit the data, I really wanna relax a lot the cross equation restrictions. If on the other hand, I'm close to the peak, I really don't wanna relax them all that much. And so one way of judging, one way of judging the, um, how good your model is, is by looking at something like this plot. So for instance, the black line is, is for this Metz and Vauders model. What the, what, what the model tells you is, you know, the, what I'm plotting is the marginal likelihood for this Metz and Vauders model. What it says here is that, and lambda is the weight on the, on the cross equation restriction. What this plot says is that, you know, this is the, the marginal likelihood as Metz and Vauders, that if I relax the cross equation restrictions, then I'm going to improve fit. So, you know, this is clear evidence that this Metz and Vauders model is misspecified. But at the same time, there is some value in this model because if I relax it too much, the marginal likelihood goes down. Um, and so I think it would be help, you know, we haven't done it yet, but we will do it for this paper, to do, to do the same thing for a BBL. And ask, okay, and access the same thing. The other thing that I can do 
is once I figured out how much I have to relax across the question of friction, I can look how the dynamics in the VAR change from the dynamics in BBL. So I can decompose the VAR parameters into phi star, the BB, you know, the cross equation where frictions impose, the, 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 the Hank model impose dynamics, plus some deviation. And from learning about this deviation, I can learn something about where the model fails. Now, of course, <laughs> Just staring at VAR parameter is not particularly informative for anybody. So what you really want to do is to translate those deviations into impulse responses. So in this sense, and this goes back to the discussion that we had with, uh, you know, we were having with Tom and, and then Alice there, you know, I mean, Alice, her position is that we have, or which we used to be, Christian Eichenbaum position, right? We know what the impulse responses look like from VAR. Let me write a model that is close to those impulse responses. Our, you know, the, the DSG VAR approach is a little different in that, you know, I mean, quant since there is a lot of uncertainty quantitatively or how actually the simple responses look like, let me use my DSG model as a prior and just figure out, you know, how much relaxing the cross equation restriction change the fit and the impulse responses. And we hope that this is going to be a useful, um, a useful approach to, uh, you know, again, kick the tires. Of, of Hank models. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, we describe a set of tools that central bank can use both to estimate Hank on a routine basis and to assess their ability to fit and forecast object of interest. We use them for forecasting comparison and we will use them in the paper, final version of the paper for DSG VARs. We kick the tires of a frontier Hank model such as, such as BBL well, the results look uh, so far pretty good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Now we have uh, the discussion of the paper. The discussion is going to be uh, done by Marcus Kirchner. He is the head of macroeconomic analysis in the Monetary Policy Division at the Central Bank of Chile. He earned his PhD in economic at the University of Amsterdam. He has published his work in journals such as Review of Economic Dynamics, Journal of Monetary Economics, International Journal of Central Banking, and he works on macroeconomic, macrofinance, and apply econometrically, uh, econometrics. Most importantly, he is in charge of the forecasting process at the Central Bank of Chile. So he's there. He's on those ways. Turn on your mic in order to make it for the people that is. Okay. Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this paper. Um, so I work at the Central Bank of Chile, right? So just a disclaimer: the views I will, I will express are mine and don't necessarily reflect the position of the Central Bank or its board members. And something else I want to say, I'm going to show a couple of exercises and what well, I'd help for that from Italo Gonzalez. Italo is one of the junior analysts at the Central Bank. Um, if you ever get an application by Italo for a PhD program, you should have a good look. By the way, that applies for any other of the junior analysts uh, that we have at the bank. Okay, so having said that, um, just a brief summary. Um, so this paper applies an approach for estimating a Hank model, matching both macro time series and micro moments. And it analyzes its fit and forecasting accuracy. So um, following the previous work, so the, here's two papers of Marco and co-authors, um, Kai et al. 2021 and Achari et al. 2020. The authors use also in this paper sequential Monte Carlo to make estimation feasible through par parallelization. But there's some novelties in this paper, right? So they use frontier 
a, a Frontier 2 as a tank, as in Bayer 2022. That model includes Matt's Walters features. Right, so these features seem to be important to, to, to generate good forecasting properties and good empirical fit. Um, the more substantial contribution in this paper is that they do that forecasting accuracy analysis and, and fit. So, so I read uh, the previous version, read the chariot eye paper, and didn't see the forecast until now. Um, I think if I had seen them before, but be a bit more enthusiastic here. So one of the main findings is that the model seems to produce reasonable forecasts. Uh, seeing your charts, it's, uh, they, it actually seems to produce quite fantastic forecasts, right? So um, uh, the root mean squared error with respect to the smets routers rank version uh, is, is reduced quite significantly for consumption and inflation, as we have seen. And another finding of the paper that Marco didn't comment is that uh, in the previous version, they found that the macro data and the micro moments seem to complement each other in terms of estimation precision. So uh, the posterior distribution is reduced in terms of its, um, right, it's, it's a more pointy distribution. And that uh, uh, happens both if you introduce micro moments or macro data. Uh, if you introduce at the same time, the macro data seems to be informative for the distribution of parameters, right? So share of constraint agents and the MPCs. So I think in your previous paper, you conclude that uh, inequality matters for macro and macro matters for inequality, right? So that's uh, one of the slogans of the Hank literature. Okay, so that's um, a brief summary. Uh, as a general comment, I think this paper is yet another important contribution um, well, by Marco and co-authors, also in a series of papers by other co-authors that are opening the way for using Hank models for practical macroeconomic forecasting and, and, and policy analysis at central banks. And why? So the reason is simple, right? So we need estimated models matching empirical moments to pr produce satisfactory forecasts and forecast-based policy prescriptions. So I think these papers are very important in order to move forward in the use of Hank at Central Bank, right? Well, that's the title of the, of the paper. Um, so actually, in the other version, you also find that, well, also in this one, that calibrated Hank models don't seem to produce very reasonable forecasts. Right? So you might ask yourself whether these models are useful for other exercises, but of course, that depends on the, on the question at hand. That's right? so at least the, the estimated model seems to have a very good empirical fit at least in your preliminary results. Okay, so the rest of my discussion, um, I never worked with Hank models. Uh, I never conducted any sequential Monte Carlo estimations, right? So you might ask yourself, well, why am I discussing this paper? So I do have some experience with using uh, DSG models, estimated DSG models for inflation forecasting and monetary policy analysis, so I'm gonna talk about this. And also, I would show you some exercises for for Chile with one of our state-of-the-art models that we're using currently. And then some specific comments. So where do I, I see one of the most relevant points of, 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 of uh, these G models with heterogeneity um, for macro forecasting and policy analysis? So a prototypical rank type DSG model, right, which well, many central banks use these kinds of kind of model they satisfy the Ricardian equivalence proposition, right? So uh, the forward-looking rational agents uh, internalize the government budget constraint. So among other things, a debt deficit financed increase in government transfers doesn't affect the equilibrium allocation of consumption output, inflation, and other variables. Of course, it affects private savings, right? Because forward-looking households know that in the future they have to pay the taxes, so they don't uh, change their consumption and basically save uh, the transfers that they receive uh, in order to, to smooth consumption over time. Um, so agent heterogeneity is one way to break Ricard and equivalence. There's other ways, right? You could use risky government debt, distortionary taxes, or imperfect rationality. And there's other papers, also earlier ones, that 
already made this point. So uh, two agent mutation models that have a fraction of hand to mouth consumers that consume all of their dispos disposable income, right? also known as non Ricardian households or liquidity constrained agents. Uh, in those models, Ricardian equivalence doesn't hold. And, well, of course, in Hank, you have uninsurable idiosyncratic income shocks that generate a wealth distribution and different marginal propensities to consume. So, in those models, then uh, fiscal the impact of fiscal shocks on output and inflation and also the monetary policy response to fiscal shocks can be very different. But right? actually, they're, they're, they are very different. <laughs> um, so I wanted to show you that. One example, so here's the practical relevance of this. During the pandemic, large fiscal transfers were reenacted. So you see the case of the US and Chile um, over 2020 and 2021. Uh, the average increase in, in government transfers in the case of the U.S. was about 10 percentage points of GDP, right above the 2013-2019 average. In Chile, we also had a very important increase in government transfers, so here it was 12 percent of GDP. Of course, in terms of the amount, uh, the case of the U.S. is much bigger than in, in Chile, but um, nevertheless, um, we have, we've also had in Chile an, an important fiscal expansion. Um, intense in government transfers. And so the timing deferred a bit. So one exercise that we did is use our uh, current DSG model that we're using at the central bank. So um, that's uh, XMAS. It was published in 2019, an extended model for analysis and simulations. So that's a pretty large DSG model. It has a lot of features. It's a small open economy model. It has nominal real agilities has search and matching in the labor market, um, and it has a kind of uh, well, extends fiscal policy block, right? So among other things, we have uh, well, government investment and we have transfers, and these transfers have an impact on, on macro variables because there's uh, non-Ricardian households, right? So we have a share of uh, hand-to-mouth consumers or non-Ricardians that consume all of their disposable, disposable income. So in our baseline calibration, so it's an estimated model, in the baseline calibration, there's 50% of non-Ricardians. You can conduct a different exercises uh, with different shares of non-Ricardians. So what we did is to, um, okay. so to simulate this increase in government transfers as a fraction of GDP over one year and the second year equal to three percentage points and nine percentage points, Right, so that's uh, what, what, what I showed, that's the increase in government transfers in the case of Chile. And then we computed the, the responses, input responses of private consumption as a share of nominal GDP, uh, responses of non-Ricardian households, Ricardian households. Uh, well, here's the government deficit, right? So this is a deficit, deficit finance increase in government transfers and the response of output, inflation, and the monetary policy rate, right? So in the baseline calibration, where there's 50% of non recurrent households, that shock to transfers has a quite an important impact on GDP, uh, I'm sorry, on, on private consumption. So private consumption increases about three percentage points. Um, non recurrent households uh, increase very strongly their consumption, what, uh, more strongly in the second year, so that's just a sequence of unexpected shocks. That's why the, the responses look a bit weird. And then they increase, in, decrease consumption. Uh, output increases, uh, core inflation increases, right, uh, quite substantially, almost three percentage points. If you increase the share of non cards, of course, the responses are stronger, so that could be up to five percentage points. And monetary policy reacts to that, right, so here's a generalized Taylor rule by increasing the interest rate. So in some sense, what monetary policy does here is to, to make the economy as a whole react in a more Ricardian way, right? So so they make the non-Ricardians safe, right? Given that the non, uh, sorry, the Ricardians safe, right? So they decrease their consumption given that the non-Ricardians are consuming all of it. And that stabilizes at least partially inflation, right? And the output response. Um, and what happens in a, in a rank type of model? Uh, almost nothing, right? So uh, here's, here's risky government debt. So this is a small open economy model, right? So there's some kind of effect but basically the output inflation and monetary policy rate response is, is zero. Um, 
So then I, I read a blog of Marco, the, Marco and co-authors, right, that do something like this exercise, a bit of a different one, right, for the US. So, so, so what you did in this blog from March is to analyze the inflation drivers in the US based on the New York Fed DSG model. So that's a rank, right? And you have your main findings is that the recent rise in inflation is mostly accounted for by a large cost per shock, right? Um, and this shock is expected to fade gradually over the course of 2022. So that made me think, well, there's no demand, <laughs> right? It's mostly probably supply side factors that the cost per shock captures. Maybe you could also think that there's some implications for the persistence of inflation. I think in that one, you have transitory price level shocks and cost per shocks. And these transitory price level shocks, they capture some of the high frequency movi movements of inflation. But at least in smetz Waters and some other models, the cost per shocks, they are mostly high frequency movements, right? So that made me think maybe some of the, the idea of that inflation would be transitory might be due to this, that there were no demand side factors incorporated in that model. But of course, in the same block, you, you recognize these caveats. So you say in our model, the large fiscal transfers enacted during the pandemic have no direct effect on consumption because it's representative of households anticipates the increase in taxes. But this would not be the case in a, in a model with heterogeneous agents. In such a model, the boost to consumption demand from fiscal stimulus would be larger, right? So um, I think we're very close to to, to, to think about this in a hang type of framework. So what happens in Chile, again, here's another second exercise. So we did something like your inflation decomposition, right, with our model. So here's, again, the baseline calibration estimation. That's the historical decomposition of annual core inflation, right, which is 50% of non-Ricardians. Uh, on, on the other side, there's the rank version of the model. So this is the only thing we did there is to set the share of non recardians to zero, but not changing any other parameter, right? And then we show here fiscal shocks, including transfers. So most of the effect here is due to the transfer shocks. Then other things happened in Chile during the pandemic. There was three successive pension fund withdrawals, so households or affiliates to the pension system could withdraw every time about 10% of their, uh, uh, their pension accounts, right? Um, so these together, they injected more than 20% of GDP, right? So the, 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 the pension fund withdrawals were even larger than the fiscal transfers. So that's why the, these blue bars here are also very important, right? And you see how the, apparently the model well, the pension withdrawals are modeled similarly as a government transfer, right, from a, a, a government fund, and, and inflation also increases in response to, to these pension withdrawals. And perhaps the most important point here is that most of the increase in core inflation um, over the last one and a half years was due to these government transfers and the pension fund withdrawals, right? Summing up all other shocks, so there's a lot of shocks here, there's about 20 shocks, demand shock, supply shocks, like cost per shocks, external shocks, uh, there's a UAP shock. Some of these go upwards, there was other ones downwards. But well, if you ignore them, you see uh, the blue and the red bars are by far the most important uh, contributor to inflation, right? And in the rank model, nothing happens. So how would your inflation forecast look like, right? If you use this kind of model and you have 10, 15, 20% of GDP of government transfers appearing, right? probably you would forecast a small increase in inflation, right? It would seem very counterintuitive. That's why maybe you would move to some the framework like this or use more econometric type of models. But apparently for the practical use of these models, it's very important to have some kind of feature uh, like heterogeneity that generates uh, or that breaks Ricardian equivalence. Okay, so let me end with some um, out of time, so specific comments. Um, I think it would be interesting to use your model, maybe not in this paper, but perhaps a, a new block, right? Uh, to see whether the assessment of US inflation drivers would change in the estimated hank, right? So it might be interesting to compare the decomposition that you did with the rank counterpart or the New York Fed DSG model with the, the estimated hank. Another question that I had is, so it's very complicated and well, the email exchange that we had, right, the problems that you have with the servers and well, the footnotes in your paper, it seems computationally very, very intense to, to solve and estimate these models. 
of your, your presentation shows, but also. So I asked, what do we gain by, by using Hank over a simple tank type of two, two agent model, right? Like the one that we are using. So, um, well, Gali and De Portoli, they have a paper, working paper from 2017, where they show that the tank model captures reasonably well the implications of a baseline tank for aggregate shock. So maybe it might be interesting to also compare a tank type of model, right? It's a way in between the rank and the hank in terms of fit and forecasting accuracy. Um, and then two other questions that I have, so it's out of my own ignorance. So I wonder whether it's possible to relax the assumption that there's no household debt in hank. Maybe in the, in the new version you have some kind of debt, right? Because you have these two assets, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read that version. But at least in baseline hank, there's uh, this borrowing constraint that you can't, well, there's no debt. And think about, for, for example, in small open economy models, right? If there's a net debt in steady state of a small open economy, the impact, for example, of a, of a foreign interest rate shock can be very different because uh, the, the increase in foreign interest rates affect your, your net worth, right? But maybe that comment is a bit out of, um, well, outdated. And then another one, so whether it's possible to use habit, to, to include habit persistence in this estimated hank, or why don't you include that? That was one question that I had. Uh, so you showed the chart of Smets and Bouters. If you exclude habit persistence, then the fit uh, declines pretty much, right? So maybe that would be something to think about. Okay, so well, I would like to congratulate the authors for project. Well, it's not yet a paper, it's a project, but for sure this project will, be, will become a, a key reference in the literature on Hank models, especially for central bank practitioners. Um, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, now we have some minutes for some questions from the floor. Then a question. So, the, so Marcus's presentation made it very clear why central banks should be interested in Hank models, and I think maybe my presentation gave a different impression. And I want to sort of say that <laughs> this is the reason you should care that for many developments, heterogeneity matters. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the question. So, Marco, you showed, I, if I understood correctly, that the calibrated model does not forecast well. And I was curious how the parameters differ between the calibrated model and the estimated parameters in that exercise. Okay. So I have uh, two questions from Mar Marco. One is about your choice of model, and one is about your choice of methods. So the model you chose is uh, this BBL model. Um, and so that's a model that doesn't have uh, hump-shaped impulse responses. Uh, in consumption in particular. Uh, and so I was curious why you, you chose that model that's related to the discussion's last comment that it's, it's hard to incorporate habit persistence in Hank models. So why you chose that model as your baseline model aren't the lack of hump shape impulse responses an issue for vision estimation? Um, and then on, on your choice of, of methods, uh, it looks like you're um, favoring these state space methods for estimating Hank models. And so I was curious about why you you think the state space methods are kind of the way to go for Hank models as opposed to sequence based methods. And in particular, uh, it sounded to me like uh, the, your, uh, your approach, um, sequence, sequential Monte Carlo, uh, it just, it's, a, it's a way of uh, tracing out uh, a, a Markov chain for the posterior distribution uh, that takes as a given a, a, a certain way of, of getting the likelihood function of parameters given the data. Uh, and that's very easy to do in the state space, uh, in, the, in the state space as well as in the sequence space. And so just why did you opt to go that direction? Go ahead. I have a simpler like a application type of question. So how many computers do you actually use for this? Like how many nodes do you need? Like, uh, like how practical it would be for, you know, uh, that's it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, someone is taking over the server we have at the board. I think I have a guess who is now, but uh, yeah, anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the paper and uh, very, very nice discussion also. Um, so two, two questions. Uh, one is, I, I know this is a, an unfair question given that the results came at 3 a.m., but uh, 
so what explains the, 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 the big improvements in, in forecasting? Uh, how are you thinking about exploring this major enhancement? And one thing that comes to mind is to what extent the Hank estimated model uh, needs less of the frictions that you typically get in the smith Walters model, right? Um, so that's one thing. And the other more practical question is, in estimation of standard ESG models, you require sometimes measurement errors. So uh, how much of that you require for matching the additional dimension of the Hank uh, estimation? Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. Great. So thank you, all of you, for, for your questions. And, and thank you in particular to Marcus um, for a great discussion in spite the, of the asymmetric information <laughs> that is the fact that you had no idea what uh, I was going to talk about uh, up until a few hours ago. Um, let me touch on, a, on, on some of the few uh, points that, that you raised. So first of all, you know, I came to present uh, like a Hank model and, and I wouldn't think that I wouldn't, you know, I didn't expect to find myself defending a rank, but uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll happily do that to, to, to the extent that, that, that I can. And that's obviously kind of limited. So let me say a couple of things on the, on the New York Fed's interpretation of, of, uh, um, of inflation. First of all, the debate about supply and demand, in my opinion, is a little simplistic for the following reason, that if you think of a markup shock, and arguably most people would agree that there were some you know, cost would shock in 2021, in a period where monetary policy is at the zero lower bound and agents, as they did in mid-2021, expect it to be at the zero lower bound for a long period of time, then the impulse responses of those shocks are actually very different from what you would get if monetary policy follows the Taylor rule as a zone constraint for the obvious reason that, you know, inflation shoots up, nominal rates are stuck, expect it to be stuck, the real rate plummets, and so the, the effect of output of that shock goes exactly the opposite direction. So from the perspective of those silly bars that are called shock decomposition, that is still called a supply shock because it's, you know, the source of the shock is a markup. But from the perspective of the discussion that people have about the role of monetary policy and so on, well, you know, monetary policy did play an important role. So from that perspective, you know, part of that is what, you, you know, in the, in, in the general discussion might have been called demand. And that's part of what explains kind of that, the, that decomposition. The other thing is obviously the other, the other key defining feature of, of that model is that the Phillips curve is very flat. Now, one may question that, and, and I guess Jim was, was, was doing that earlier on, where that's still the case. But given that, uh, I'm actually not sure that your discussion of the effects of transfers on inflation, if your model has such a flat Phillips curve, would be all that different. If you look at the impact on output of those, uh, of those transfers, was pretty temporary. That implies that, if I'm, if I'm thinking straight, that the present discounted value of marginal cost isn't really changing a heck of a lot. So if in your, your tank model you had as flat as a Phillips curve as I had in my rank model, I think you, would get, you wouldn't get an iota for inflation from those shocks. And so the, 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 the answer wouldn't be Arguably, but I'm, I'm just guessing uh, all that uh, different. But I, I guess that's a question. Another and something else that you ask is 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 the Hank versus Tank. 
I mean, I don't have any, you know, strong particular ideological position on that. I mean, I guess it depends on the question at hand. Um, and it seems to me that for many empirical questions, there is a richness from looking at the entire distribution, just in terms of, again, data, that is really hard to have with tank models. Um, so you just cannot match a lot of features of the imperial distribution when you only have two agents. Uh, and I, mean, I, th I think that limits. That doesn't mean, I mean, I, you know, I, um, papers like uh, Florin Bilby, Georgia Vermicherry, and they have, a, they have a, an estimated tank model. You know, they, they, they have very interesting results also about inequality and the implication for that for business cycle. That's a great exercise, but you know, there are some stuff that they cannot talk about, and I think Hank just a full-fledged distribution, you know, right? For a central bank, you can talk about more or more precisely about uh, inequality. Um, on the calibrated, uh, um, let me get to some of your question, Alistair. You, you ask about calibrated model, how do the parameters change? I mean, what we're doing, just to make sure, we're using the, the mode of the prior, which is usually informed by you know, standard calibration. To you, that's what we plug in, um, and and so the question is how how does it change relative to the posterior? I mean, again, often those changes are quantitatively. It's not like each parameter is dramatically different from the prior, right? If you ever looked at prior versus posterior, you know there the, there is a shift, but so often it's not very dramatic. Yet, put it all together, you get quite different dynamics. Uh, so I'm not sure there's any particular parameter that changes, but it's a great question and, and one that, that, that we should try to address. Um, I mean, Adrian asked a couple of questions. One is why BBL? I mean, so, and uh, um, I mean, there, I guess I was intrigued right, by the fact that again, BBL come out and put forth and say, I'm gonna tell you a story about business cycle. And so, you know, how, what the Hank interpretation of business cycle is. And so it seems like a natural thing to ask, well, how does your model actually fit business cycle data? And that's why I kind of chose the BBL. But and then there are other great examples of, of estimated models. And, and, you know, I'd be very happy to use any of those. But that seems like a natural given, uh, you know, a, a natural, some, um, a natural application. Um, in terms of state space model, uh, as opposed to um, you know sequence based models, again, first of all, as you said, the the sequential Monte Carlo applies to it doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's just a matter of of, of computing the, the posterior, and your likelihood can be anything that you care about. Um, I mean, I think in practice there might be some advantages of, of state space just because when it comes to interpreting stuff, like you know, the exercise, you can, you know, the smoothing that comes from state space model is helpful and is part of the general way that these models are used. Uh, but again, I don't have any particularly strong a priori conviction as the one is better than the other. Again, using uh, missing data is helpful because you don't have uh, you know, all the data, but yeah, uh, I'm very open-minded. The future can, can go in very different direction and maybe in both. I mean, um, in fact, part of our next task is to you know, really learn sequence space model. Uh, computing power, I mean, that's part of the problem is that we were promised we could use the new Fed cluster, AWS. And guess what? <laughs> There's so much bureaucratic stuff on that that it turned out to be, uh, I mean, the people, the IT people did a great job, but then when we tried to run it and we, you know, we were ready to do that a few weeks ago, um, it didn't work because just because all the it's really hard, and so we were counting on a cluster, 
and that cluster whoop, disappeared. And so we had to run everything on, on a much smaller cluster, which is in the, 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 the New York Fed run, one, where other people are, are running their jobs, and that's partly why we got to 3 a.m. last night. Um, um, and I guess that's it. Thank, Thank you. We move now to the last uh, paper of this day. Mario, bienvenido. Gaston. Okay, this paper is, the title of the paper is The Role of progressive, uh, Progressivity on the Economic Impact of Fiscal Transfer. A hang for till is going to be presented by Mario Giarda. Uh, Mario is an economist, at, uh, is a senior economist at the Economic Studies Unit at the Central Bank of Chile. He holds a PhD in economics from Universidad Pompeu Fabra. And he works in macroeconomics, monetary policy, and fiscal policy, and clearly also in heterogeneity. Mario, you have 45 minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I'm Mario Yarda. I'm a senior economist at the Central Bank of Chile. And today I'm going to present you the role of progressivity on the economic impact of fiscal transfers in a hunk for Chile. This is joint work with Benjamin Garcia and Carlos Lizama, also from the bank. And we are very happy to, to have this paper in, the, in this program conference, so I, I kindly thank the organizers for putting this paper in the program. And also thanks to the bank for organizing this really great conference that is interest to me especially. Okay? <laughs> the usual disclaimer applies, and let's, let's go. Again, this is a paper that, uh, in some sense, summarizes all the things we saw in the, today, okay? So it's, but it's an application for Chile. And the, the question is pretty straightforward, and this is about the effects of fiscal stimulus. We know this is a very old question that mainly, and there are many papers analyzing the impact of government spending on the economy, but by per the perspective of government purchases of goods and services. Okay? There are some papers that study the role of fiscal transfers direct to households, that we, the, the thing that we call T. And these are in the US, and now we are seeing more papers um, being published, but they are mainly to study the MPCs. That is kind of a more micro question because you want to see whether individual households respond more or less to this fiscal stimulus. And there are even fewer on the differences between alternative policy schemes. What I mean by this, these programs have very different features, like sizes, progressivity, and stuff. And there are, there are not many papers that study the differential impact at the macro level of different of alternative fiscal schemes. And this is what we do in this paper. We study the effects of fiscal stimuli with different progressivities. We're going to go and we're going to take several uh, fiscal programs from 2018 to 2022, and we're going to study whether they have differences in their design and, and ask whether these different programs had different macro effects. Let me be clear about something. We're going to... Uh, we're going to refer to progressivity. We're going to define progressivity as how the government distributes resources among households with different incomes. Okay? And we're going to refer just to direct stimulus checks to households, and, not, and we're not going to refer uh, anything about the, the tax side of fiscal policy. Okay? So we're going to leave the progressivity of taxes fixed. Let me motivate this this question with these two figures. In the left-hand side, I have total household support to, 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 to individuals, okay? And you can see that from 2020 to late 2021, 
this household support increased uh, by a lot. In the, in, here you have billion dollars. And we had like some of the household support measures were like three or four percent of GDP in total, or yearly GDP in total in a month, okay, as Marcus uh, has clearly uh, shown. Why we think this is a nice question at the macro level? Because if you look at a data on consumption, measured as transactions of credit and debit card, you can observe that in the times of these policies, with, uh, uh, highlighted by the vertical lines, consumption rose by a lot, okay? And then industrial production in black follow. Okay, so it seems that these policies helped uh, recover the aggregate demand that was falling like crazy there, okay, in 2020, in March 2020. But let me say something else about this household support. Here, we have since 2019 to 2022, lots of different types of policy. Okay, I will say lots, but there are 12, okay? That for us is lo a lot. And, and you have very different here that were like one order of magnitude lower, and here you had like very uh, strong policies. And they are all, some of them are put together in the same, at the same time. And this is what we're gonna uh, take advantage of. We're gonna build a hunk model for Chile, taking advantage of the heterogeneity of this fiscal program, okay? I'm gonna start by showing you some empirical evidence. First, a, a, a plain vanilla a structural VAR, uh, where we're gonna show that the account, the, the account, the aggregate account of fiscal transfers, when you go to the fiscal accounts, uh, stimulate out. Okay, this is just to motivate that this question might be relevant for the business cycle. Then I'm gonna show you micro, with micro data that more progressive policies have a stronger effect on consumption than non-progressive ones. And this is what we, we try to go a little bit, bit deeper, and, and we're gonna show you with this with data on in transactions with great credit and debit card. So the research question is pretty straightforward, as you may imagine. Is how does progressivity affect consumption, okay? And to rationalize of all these facts and try to analyze how progressivity affects consumption, we're gonna build a hunk model calibrated for Chile. Okay, we're gonna build on the nice work by Adrien and, and Ludwig, and, and this model replicates the key moments of the economy well, namely uh, the, the distribution of assets, the distribution of income, and income risk in the economy. And I'm gonna show you something that we call the policy slack, that is not in this slide, but that, and you, but you can, that you can decompose consumption into an average and a distributional channel of uh, the policy, okay? Which means that the policy is gonna have both a, a, a cross-sectional effect on aggregates and an average or general equilibrium effect as well. And finally, I will show you that something that some of you have referred to as well, that the effects depend on progressivity, on the monetary policy stance, and also, on how this transfer is financed, okay? This paper is related to, the, to, to three strands of the literature. First, on fiscal policy in heterogeneous agents, nucleation model, we follow very closely the paper by Audrain, Ludwig, and, and Matthew, and we, but we include search and matching frictions, because it seems that search and matching frictions uh, as, as Gerard Salas and Qualtor show, are uh, explain well fluctuations in unemployment and hence in income risk in an economy like Chile, okay? And then I'm gonna build on Patterson. How this works? No, this doesn't work. Okay, then we're, go um, we're gonna build on Patterson, uh, who shows that you can decompose in this kind of models fl fluctuations in income into these average and distributional channels. Okay, finally, this, is, this paper is kind of related to the effects of fiscal stimulus checks, and I'm gonna show you uh, why uh, this is. So, the agenda for this presentation is the following. 
I will show you first the empirical evidence to discuss a little bit uh, why, and we are, why we are motivated to, to, to build this model. Then I will uh, briefly describe the model and the calibration. And then I will present to you uh, a variable that we call the policy slack, which is like summarizes all the effects of these policies in the aggregates. Finally, the dynamics in the food model, if, if I have some time. And, and then I will conclude. Okay? Good. Let's start with the empirical evidence. First, let me start by saying that fiscal transfers, now and before, have aggregate effects. Okay? If you go to, to the accounts of the government and, and run a fiscal, a fiscal Bayesian structural VAR with this data, um, and you, you take monthly data from January 2005 to June 2022, run the, the simplest Blanchard and Perotti identification with Koleski identification, and you put transfers uh, as a share of GDP, fiscal income, industrial production, and the CPI in, the, in this VAR, you're going to find that fiscal policy, fiscal transfers, ah, something I didn't say is that we follow Cespedes, Gali, and Fornero, for 2013, okay? So we update these estimates, okay? So you can find that the, the effect of fiscal transfers is positive over industrial production and then the CPI follows, okay? Then let me go to, to kind of the core of the, of the empirical path. So let me convince you that there were simultaneously progressive and non-progressive policies. Why is this important? Because we want to run a regression there, then, okay? So to do so, first let me again define what we mean by progressivity. Progressivity for us is how the government distributes household support among households with different income, okay? We're gonna refer to progressivity as, a, as an absolute um, measure of progressivity. Okay? If the, quintile, if the low, lowest quintile received more than the fifth quintile, uh, that policy is going to be progressive. And we're going to do, do the follow. We're going to take 12 dis different measures from 2000, uh, since 2018, and we're going to uh, take uh, the, these measures at the, a at the municipal level. Okay? A municipality here in Chile is, a, is also called a comuna, which is the lowest administrative division in Chile. Okay, we're gonna do this because we have the data, at the, the data on consumption at the municipal level as well. Okay, so to be consistent with that, we have to, to do what I'm gonna do uh, at, the, at the municipal level. And what we're gonna do here, we're gonna take the ratio of the transfers, well, we're gonna <laughs> classify each municipality into a quintile of the distribution, okay? And we're going to calculate how much of each policy was delivered to, to a given quintile in time t. Okay? So this is going to be a measure. And, and then we're going we're gonna to divide the first quintile transfers to the, to the transfer of the fifth quintile. This is going to be done for every program and at every point of, of time. So we're going to have like a, a time barring. A progressivity of each of the policies, okay? Then we're gonna, uh, no, this is, again, sorry. The, then we're gonna define or label as progressive uh, the, the, the policy, the overall pro policy as progressive if this ratio was, is larger than one, and as non-progressive if this ratio is lower than one, okay? We're gonna classify the program and not the programs at, at, at different periods, okay? So the program is overall progressive of, or the program is overall non-progressive, okay? And this is what we obtain. We obtain by definition, of course, two different types of programs, one, one group that is progressive, another group that is non-progressive, okay? Good, this is just to classify the programs into, into the progressive and non, the non-progressive group, and we're going to go back to the municipality level and run and do the following exercise. We're going to study the dynamic effects of progressivity 
and we're going to take microdata for Chile. We're going to take microdata on monthly credit and debit card transactions, income, and fiscal support. We're going to have um, we're going to have observations at the at time t at at every month, monthly observations at a municipal level, and uh, for these two different programs. Okay, we're going to denote. Oh, sorry, this. Sorry, I, <laughs> that was a, a spoiler. So we're going <laughs> to denote the municipality with I, OK? And we're going to take consumption, the total amount of consumption of the municipality. We're going to call it C. So CIT is consumption or trans, uh, trans credit, card, credit and debit card transactions. And we're going to take the total amount of these purchases and denoted by CIT, municipality I in month T, okay? And then we will take all of the progressive measures given to a, given to a, to a municipality I in type T. We're gonna add up all of, all of that. And we're gonna take the non-progressive measures given to a municipality I in type T, okay? So this is, these are all amounts of money. Pesos, okay? So we're going to take the sample from, that is monthly again, from January 2018 to June 2022, and we estimate a dynamic version of Misra and Zurico, which is just trying to estimate a local projection like, okay, I will be very uh, clear with that, like equation that we're, we're going to follow the effect of a transfer, or both transfers, on consumption in period T plus K. Okay, so this is beta K, is just how consumption responds in T plus K to an increase of one peso in the progressive policy in T. Okay, so we follow how consumption responds, so consumption responds over time. Okay, we do so for both policies. And then we control for uh, income at the, at the municipality level, changes in income for lacks of the policies as well, and a time and municipality fixed effect. Okay? And the results look like follow. The first to note here is that both of these policies seem to raise consumption significantly. Okay? But the more progressive policy seems to be to, to, to raise consumption by more than the non-progressive. In other words, it seems that the non-progressive policy, if you look, looks kind of a permanent income uh, house, uh, response. Okay? So this, is, this goes, uh, and this is a result. Let me, let me, let me tell you something, uh, some of the drawbacks of this exercise. First, uh, that we cannot interpret this result as MPCs of the households. Why? Well, because we don't have cash, uh, cash purchases. Second, because we don't have, so we don't have all the old consumption of households. And, and second, we can, for that reason, we cannot say much about the total effect of this policy as well, okay? So, but what we think we can say is the differential effect of these two different policies. We, we are very confident we can say that, okay? In the case of, of Chile, the, the, what, what you call non-progressive, you are referring to the uh, withdrawal from pension funds, and the other one are the transfer from the government, no? Those are the two main differences, because the other oh, things are oh, very small. Okay, no? there, there's a, yes. Um, we have, here we have 12 policies that include pension fund withdrawals. withdrawals. We can discuss later if these, these are good, uh, if taking those as transfers is a good assumption or not. We can discuss that. And also we have all of, all of the other transfers, like universal uh, fiscal health, and, and yes. So, yes, if I answered your question correctly, or? But, but most of the action of those two are those two. I, I would say so, and, 
and actually the pension fund withdrawals are in the red line. Okay. And the, the other ones uh, follows more the fiscal terms, okay? So having said, let me, let me summarize a little bit the two empirical facts. First, fiscal transfers have a macro effect. And second, uh, we find that non-progressive policies have lower effect than progressive policies and stimulating consumption, okay? And what does, and, and that, and that motivates us to start thinking about how are the mechanisms and also uh, when more progressivity has a stronger effect on the economy. So this is why we built uh, a model which follows very closely Eau Claire, uh, um, uh, Rogn, Lai, and Strau. This is a general equilibrium model where time is discrete, there's no aggregate risk, Households are in measure one, subject to idiosyncratic income risk. Um, there are two assets, but in the, we take the Hank illiquid by, by, by Euclid and uh, Rogline Straub, and there's a borrowing constraint that is we don't let households borrow. Then we add on top of that unemployment risk because we think it's an important feature of the Chilean economy. So there's an unemployment risk that is that represents the extensive margin, and we also have an intensive margin here, okay? These households, as the other papers show, are subject to a friction that is the take into, the take as given, the hours, the hours wages, and employment uh, uh, set by, an, by intermediaries or a union that sets those hours, okay? And then after tax income is something related to wages times, times hours times the productivity if, if employed, and after taxes, uh, labor income taxes, that are gonna be proportional, okay? We're not uh, making this progressive or anything. And there's a, if, if unemployed, there's a, a unemployment benefit omega, which is proportional to the productivity times wages. We assume dividends, uh, household receive dividends, and they, are distributed with an ad hoc rule, okay? And finally, these households receive a government transfer that we denote by F said that crucially depends on the productivity and the type of, of the household, okay? Then there's a government, which is one of the important parts of our model, is pretty standard, but important for us, that raise labor income taxes, um, accumulate debt, accumulates debt, and there's an, pays the unemployment insurance uh, to, how, to unemployed households. We assume there's a transfer function, okay? So the, the government not only sets the, the total transfer, T, but uh, the shape of this function uh, among the different uh, pro, uh, productivity levels. And this function depends on this parameter, Aleph, which is which affects negatively the, the shape of this, of this function, okay? So if LF is positive, the, we define the, the, the policy as progressive. If LF is negative, we define this as uh, non-progressive or regressive as you can, uh, would like to, to, to call it. So the fiscal balance uh, follows the, the following rule because we want this transfer to be paid partially with debt as well or with taxes. And we're gonna try different, different, paramet different parameterization for that row, where, this, where that row, if, if that row is zero, transfers are completely tax fine, okay? And finally, there's a Taylor rule that responds to inflation and uh, the unemployment rate, okay? Let me go faster with this. Firms are the, the usual ones in, in, in new Keynesian models, but we have capital and we have of course, the intensive and the extensive margin in the production function. They are in monopolistic competition and there's a markup mu in steady state. There are Rotenberg, fr Rotenberg price frictions, so we, we deliver there a new Keynesian Phillips curve and we assume there are capital adjustment costs and, and investment in the model. We assume level markets, again, are pretty standard for for the macro literature, we want to go as close as possible to, 
to the, to the model we use for forecasting later. So we want to add this kind of frictions as well to compare that with the, with the, with the maybe make the exercises that Marco showed uh, in some years, I think. <laughs> so uh, we have certain matching frictions. Uh, we follow DMP very closely and, the, and, and individual households are subject to unemployment risk as you can, can see also, on top of idiosyncratic income risk as well, okay? And there's a job market intermediary that sets unemployment and wages where the bargain wage is equal, is the, 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 the conventional one. That is a, that is a um, weighted average between the unemployment insurance and the marginal product of labor, okay? Good. So let me go to the, some of the new things uh, I, I already boring you, but the, the calibration, okay? We calibrate this model for Chile following kaplan muellen violante We separate first illiquid from liquid assets, and we find something very similar to kaplan muellen violante Liquid assets are about two, twice the GDP, while, il, sorry, illiquid assets are about twice GDP and liquid assets are about 20% of GDP. We're gonna use these two numbers in different ways. As we have a hunky liquid structure, that is that household own capital, but they cannot switch it in, in, in response to a shock, the, the portfolio. We're gonna set the capital stock equal to the liquid assets in this economy. And we're gonna leave the, the total assets in the model free. Okay, that is going to be an untargeted moment. Then we have the, 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 the share of hand to mouth. That is going to be the part of the distribution that we're going to match in the model. Okay, so we're going to take, we're going to run the model, we're going to solve it, and we're going to try to match the share of hand to mouth of, of households. Okay, that is about 42% of households in Chile. This is a very large, large number that delivers very high NPCs, okay? And we can discuss that uh, later if you, if you have doubt, doubt, doubts about it. But we follow kaplan muellen violante very closely with the data for Chile. Then we go to the data on idiosyncratic, on, 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 on administrative monthly data of workers' income, and we wanna calibrate the, the other part of the distributions here, the, the labor income inequality, and the and in labor income risk, okay? To do so, we have data, monthly data of workers' income. We take 2005 to 2019. There are five million observations each month. Then this data is great because you can estimate these moments at a monthly frequency, okay? We're gonna do it just at a quarterly frequency because it's the, it's the frequency we use in the model, okay? So the moments we're gonna, target are those of Guvenen and, and close to kaplan muellen violante as well. We're gonna consider the variance of, the, of, of log of income. We're gonna take the variance of the, the log growth of quarter to quarter income and the log growth to 20 quarters income, okay? This is kind of different to what the literature shows, but we're trying with this we want to capture the fact that households are also subject to long-run shocks as well as subject to short-run shocks. So 20 quarters are what, what Guvenen has in, in all of his papers, uh, that is five years, okay? You know that we match, we, we fit a model with a transitory and a, and a permanent component, and we think the, the model uh, matches the data well, okay? And we follow closely kaplan muellen violante with this. And what we, what we find uh, is that we, we have a, a combination of, a, of, of two different shocks that follow an AR1 that is non-Gaussian to capture the high kurtosis of these, of these distributions. And we, have, we find that we find also a permanent component that, is, that is, has low probability in a transitory component that has a high probability. So the households in Chile are subject to like lifetime shocks, something like that, that are, that are very low likely, and are subject to 
uh, short run shocks that happen about all the all, all periods, okay? The remainder of parameters we set uh, are pretty standard. We follow both uh, the, 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 stand, the, the, the main literature here and the, and, the, and the model of projections in the bank. But let me discuss some of them. We, we find, we, we want to target a share of hand to mouth that is 42% and an interest rate that is pretty low for Chile at least. Pre, uh, after the pandemics we had pretty low interest rates. And we, to, to match those, we find a discount factor of uh, 0 0.95 quarterly. Then uh, we want to match uh, an unemployment rate of 8%, given a separation rate of, of 4%, and we calibrate the vacancy cost, the matching efficiency, and uh, all of the, the parameters of the labor markets according to that. Okay, good. Let me let me talk a bit about the microfit of this model. This model is very stylized, and we have in the end kind of a one asset, but we think we do it reasonably well in in terms of uh, mar matching the liquid assets as a share of GDP uh, in the data. Okay, our model finds 18% with all of those parameters, and the data is about 19%, okay? This is the, an untargeted moment, of course. Uh, we think we do it great there. But then we have the, the consumption profile that is very important for us because we want to give them transfers to households with different MPCs that are weighted in consumption differently, okay? So we wanted to, to match this this, the distribution of consumption uh, of the data uh, better, but, but we have, I think we, we do a reasonable work and we can, we can, job, we can, we can discuss this later, okay? So, having said that about the model, describing the model, describing the calibration for Chile, uh, let, me, let me introduce to you a variable that we call the policy slack that we think help us in evaluating this kind of policy, okay? The policy slack is gonna be a variable that we, that we define as the support given in, a sex, in excess of the falling income. Imagine you are in a recession and you receive, and, and your income fell by 10, and the, 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 the government gave you 13 your policy slack is gonna be three, okay? So the, the government gave you more than you needed. And we think this is a, this looks very like, like <laughs> uh, income, but he, what, the, the, what we want to, to emphasize is that this policy slack appears when policies are pretty active, okay? And in giving money to households. And to motivate this, this variable, let me, sh let me take just two examples of household support, that, that those that were given in 2020, okay? We have in 2020 a policy that was progressive. Here we have the quintile in income. We have the, the transfer, a transfer that we call progressive and a transfer that we call non-progressive. And you can see that these two policies were distributed very, very differently among the different households, okay? You can see that progressive policies, the, the share, the, 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 how much they received fall with respect to income, whereas the non-progressive one was kind of flat, okay? In addition to this, we observed uh, an important fall in incomes of the different quintiles, except for the fifth quintile. This is interesting. And, and you can see that in the data in Chile in 2020, most of, these, of the quintiles saw their income fall, and the effect of the policies on total income were pretty different, as you may imagine, of course. The, you can build the variable I just described it before as the sum of these, of the second, third, with the fourth uh, column, and you can see that the policy slacks of these two policies are pretty different, okay? One was super generous, the, the non-progressive, and super uh, non-progressive <laughs> as well. Huh? 
okay? And then you had this, this one that was non-generous non and, and was like non-targeted and, and, and couldn't, no, it was targeted but couldn't uh, compensate the falling incomes of all households, okay? So this is just to motivate that this exists in the data and we can take the model and evaluate these policies by using this, just this variable, okay? So we do this, now we, I, I haven't explained how we calibrate the different policies here, and we're gonna take the following stance. We're gonna choose, we're gonna pick some of the policies, in particular the ones I'm, I'm showing you here, and we're gonna calculate the, the parameter implied of the, from the function of fiscal transfer. Okay, the, this Aleph that represents the progressivity of the policy. And for one of the policy, the progressive, we find a parameter that is positive, so this, this, this function is, is, is downward sloping, and the non-progressive is negative, so this function is upward sloping, okay? And we're gonna calibrate the model with these two, these two parameters, and I'm gonna show you some exercises now of uh, how you can think about how are the effects of, uh, of, of these different types of fiscal, fiscal policy. Okay, why the policy slack is important for consumption? Let's take a, the, the interest rate constant, okay, for now, and we can show that consumption can be written as, as follows. Not consumption, fluctuations in consumption. Can be written as the, the integral of a matrix of MPCs times the how uh, the policy slack fluctuates, okay? These MPCs are gonna be individually dependent, and there's gonna be a, a, a relationship between the MPCs and the policy slack, as you're gonna see in this equation. And then uh, you, can, you can, by using the, the definition of, of a covariance, you can show that fluctuations in consumption depends on an average effect, th that is the, the, the average marginal propensity to consume times the average fluctuations in, the, in this policy slack and a distributional channel that is the covariance between the MPCs and the policy slack, and, okay? This is very close to Patterson, extended a little bit to account for different types of policies, okay? I'm not, this is nothing new, okay? So we, you can decompose this further into a direct effect between average and distributional that depends only on the policy and an indirect effect that depends on all of the other variables we have in the model, namely labor income, uh, fluctuations in profits, and, and other variables, okay? Good, how, how does the, the first decomposition look? Well, we observe, okay, and how consumption responses, uh, uh, how consumption reacts to the different, to the different policies. Okay, you have in, in the left-hand panel the response of consumption and the, the, the decomposition uh, in response to the progressive policy. In the medium panel, you have the response to the non-progressive policy. And in the right-hand panel, you have the differences between these two, these two, these two panels, okay? And what we observe first is that progressive policies have a stronger effect on consumption than non-progressive ones. And also, most importantly, in both of the cases, the, this term covariance seems to be important, okay? What, what, what explains the difference between the non-progressive and progressive, the effect of the progressive and non-progressive policies? Well, it is the covariance between, uh, on impact at least, is the covariance between these two, is the co distributional effect that is represented by the covariance between the MPCs and, and the policy slack, but also, and most importantly, this higher amplification effect comes from effects that we call, uh, that, that are the, the average effects, or those that are not related to the, 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 the distribution of this policy, okay? So you see further amplification, not because you, you are giving money to households with high MPCs, but because this fact has a stronger effect over on the other variables, okay? And that stimulates comp consumption further. Let me give you the, the, 
the last um, decomposition here is that you can decompose these two direct, uh, sorry, the, the average and the, uh, and the distributional channels into the direct and indirect effect. This following uh, Kaplan and Mollenbelante or the job market paper by, by, by Adrian. And what you can observe in the differences between progressive and non-progressive is that the term that is related to the covariance between the MPCs and the policy, which is, this is just how differentially the policy, the progressive policy is targeted among households with high MPCs with respect to the non-progressive one, okay, this is the green one, explains all of the distributional channel first, and explain most of the effect, uh, the differential effect between the, a progressive and a non-progressive policy. And finally, we find that the indirect channel, but average, uh, is, a, is a large proportion of the, of the, of the effect, okay, of progressivity. What we, we can conclude about this first is that, uh, in general, we have that there's a distributional channel that comes from these covariances, that you have to evaluate these policies not only by the aggregate effects, but how they distribute among the different households, okay? Good, and the final, the final exercises, and I'm gonna go quick now because we are all tired, I think. And uh, is that what are the dynamics in the dynamic in the in the full model? Because we, we said before the interest rate uh, constant that was constant. We're gonna uh, leave that. Uh, we're gonna take out that that assumption, and I'm gonna measure that first. The effects of progressivity remain, but the overall effect of the transfer uh, is uh, depends a lot on the monetary policy stance but also how this transfer is, is uh, financed with debt or taxes. First, what I'm gonna show you, just <laughs> some plots about, just about the, 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 the effects of these policies on, con on consumption and how we, maybe you can pick another um, uh, 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 decomposition, but we just show the direct and indirect effects, okay? And you can see that for example, if, if you had an active monetary policy where, where uh, the response with the Taylor principle holds and, and monetary policy also reacts to unemployment, you can see that the effect of all of these policies are not so long lasting, okay? You have, you start entering in a, in a falling consumption very quickly, but we also observe that the progressive policy, at least on impact, has a strong effect, okay? Second, if you had like a very extreme monetary policy stance, something that, that we call, we could call re, super relaxed monetary policy that, that doesn't react and, and, and actually when the, intra, the, the inflation rate goes up, the, the real rate actually goes down, you would see that progressive policies ha, stimulate a consumption uh, very, very strongly, and more importantly, the indirect effects, those effects that, 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 that are from the side of labor income and, 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 and profits and, and so on, are super strong, okay? And this, the, the, the effect of progressive remains uh, much larger than the non-progressive. And finally, if you just uh, have an active monetary policy again, and the, and, the, and the policy is just tax financed, of course, because we, had, um, we have distortionary taxation, uh, you, you can end up in a recession, actually, in response to these policies, okay? Which one of these cases uh, is, is more relevant for the case that I show you in the empirical evidence? It remains to, to, to be explored. I think, uh, and, and maybe uh, Luis Felipe can, or, or, the, or the central bank can talk about it a little bit more. And let me conclude, empirically in Chile, progressivity in transfers helps stimulate consumption. We build a model for Chile 
a hand model for Chile to study the effects of progressivity. We show that we can decompose uh, the effects of the policies that we, we show that the effects of policy can be summarized by a, by a variable that we call the policy slack. And you can decompose these effects, the effects of the policy, into an average and a distributional channel. We show that this distributional channel is important, but um, it also has strong uh, general equilibrium effects. And with the minutes I have left, let me, let me, let me say something. This is part of a broader hank agenda at the Central Bank of Chile. Uh, we have many, many ideas uh, running now. Uh, uh, to name you some of them, we have uh, papers in which we are analyzing heterogeneous and endogenous consumption bundles, the macro effects of unconditional, like these ones, versus conditional fiscal transfers. We have Another one that we are studying the role of time varying income risk for Chile, where we take advantage of all of this data that is really nice to study these kind of questions, and much more. Thank you very much. I will be happy to, to, to answer all of your questions, and thanks for your attention. Uh, please. Now it's time for the discussion of the paper. Gaston Navarro uh, will be discussing uh, this very interesting paper. Uh, Gaston is principal economist in the trade and financial studies section at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, he holds a PhD in economics from NYU. Uh, the current research topic uh, for Gaston are financial economics, uh, financial policy, and the agents at the Regenius Agents, and he has published uh, in very prestigious journals. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah, we're good? OK, great. Uh, yeah, so thanks for having me here, for organizing the conference. It's been great so far. It's been colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm very aware I'm the last thing standing between us and beer, so I'm trying to be interesting and, and in time. Uh, uh, OK, so t this is a great paper. I really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> This translation, I get it, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so now this. I'm gonna um, give like a one slide summary of the paper, and then I'm gonna dig in into some of the items. Um, okay, so this is the main question they have. It's uh, if we change the distribution of transfers in a certain way, what's the effect of consumption? So you can think that transfers increase in one dollar, and you can distribute this dollar in different ways across households and they want to know how the distribution affects consumption overall. So that's, that's kind of the question. And they want to do two things. They want to have an empirical part and a model. Uh, in the evidence, they used these transfers that Chile had during COVID, and they separate them between progressive and non-progressive. They basically go one by one, and they put a tag on it. Okay, it was a progressive transfer, it was a non-progressive transfer. And after they do that, they can estimate the effect of each one of these two on consumption. And what they find is that these transfers stimulate the consumption much more if they were progressive than if they were non-progressive. And I'll come back to, to, to this in a few slides, but these numbers are large, and the difference also seems pretty large. So it seems that having progressive transfers was very effective in stimulating consumption, much more than non-progressive. And then they use a model, a hang model. As, as Mario was saying, basically they kind of borrow like a frontier hang model, like, like many of audience papers. So I have very little to say about the model itself. But what it shows this policy slack in the sense that consumption can be separated. You can compute as the product of MPCs times the transfers, and you add up over all agents. And that's something like the average MPC times the average transfer, plus the distribution term that is captured by that covariance. So basically, the idea here is uh, you can have the same amount of transfers. It's only $1. But if you give more of these transfers into high MPC households, the effect on consumption is going to be larger. OK, so that's the idea. That covariance is what they're thinking as, as a distribution. You wanna, if you want to stimulate consumption, you're going to be managed to high MPC households. That's kind of very intuitive. Uh, OK, I'm going to follow short this suggestion. It was a great paper, and I really mean it. <laughs> it was good. I really enjoyed the paper. It's one of those papers that build from micro to macro, so I really appreciate that. And importantly, it's one of those papers in which heterogeneity is really important for the dust, for the, for the way fact that you want to match. It's just not like a sideshow, something that really matters. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss the evidence, then I'm going to go to the model, 
And then I'm going to conclude um, with some thoughts about like labor markets in these hunk models. It's something that we discussed today in several times. Uh, but most of my discussion is going to be on evidence, which I think where the kind of new stuff is. Okay. So these are the measures of transfers uh, that were pretty large during basically COVID times. I think this is in US dollars. And then we're just talking about that in representing something like 30% of GDP. So fiscal support was pretty large during, during COVID. Uh, they have an amazing data. The central bank apparently has amazing data at many levels, and this paper uses many great databases. They observe transfers at, at the individual level, and then they can construct transfers at the regional level, these uh, communas or municipalities that, that Mario was talking about. Uh, and then they go again, one by one, and they say, okay, I'm gonna, so this is a very easy definition of progressivity, is if people in the bottom quintile got more money than people at the top quintile, that's gonna be progressive, which seems like very reasonable to me. I, I actually would have a much lower tolerance for calling something progressive. But that, that seems like it's strict and, and good enough. So now they have two types of, 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 of transfers, progressive and non-progressive ones, and then can estimate the effect on consumption. So this is what they do. They run basically like a local projection, a set of local projections. They estimate the response of consumption K periods ahead on either a progressive transfer, which a progressive transfer or a non-progressive transfer. That's the beta K measures the effect of the progressive, and delta is the one of the non-progressive. Uh, just one comment, I'll come back to this again. Now, this, this, is like a, this is like a panel. So they have time dummies in particular, so they really, mo the identification is coming from differences over time in the cross-section of regions. That's, that's where it comes, so I'm, I'm not gonna come back to this in a second. Uh, so this is what they have find. What they find, as I was saying before, the progressive transfers were much more effective in stimulating consumption than the non-progressive ones, uh, the numbers are like something like 0.6 to 0.8, relative to 0.01 to 0.2 in the non-progressive. Um, so I have two questions here. So the first one is that these numbers seem large. Uh, it, it does remind me a lot of the literature estimating like regional multipliers in the sense that they also get, it's kind of similar to what you're doing. You're learning from, from different regions and they get also very large numbers. So we know that we're not capturing anything of the crowding out effects that monetary policy or, or taxes could have. So that may explain that, but the number large. Again, you mentioned that you don't want to think about this directly as NPCs, but one is very tempted to do that. <laughs> uh, and the summation of this is like probably way above one, even for the non-progressive ones. So yeah, so some, some thoughts about how to size this and how to estimate this would be important, I think. And having a model counterpart of this, I think, will be important. I'll come back to this when I discuss the model. But you know, ideally, you would like to run something like this regression in, in the model. Uh -huh and try to understand where the big numbers are coming from. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go back to that regression and let's try to think about the identification. So uh, I think, and I think this is the main comment I have uh, for the paper. So the transfers are not random. Right? These are kind of endogenous policy responses to the state of the economy. So one would be concerned that, you know, there may be confounding factors. Maybe transfers were say in a way that some regions got more because they were X characteristic or something like that. Um, so if you look at this uh, literature that estimate the tax rebates, like the papers that Parker writes, every time there's a tax rebate, uh, they typically rely on the fact that the distribution of these checks is sort of random, so they're really independent of anything else. It, they don't matter, they, they don't correlate with your region, your income, your education, nothing like that. So they can really tease out the effect of receiving the money on consumption. Again, that may not be an NPC if there are some anticipation effects and so on, same holds here, but at least you know you're estimating the effect of receiving the check. Uh, if you look at the, the spending multiplier literature, literature where I spend some more time, uh, for example, the period of Valerie with, uh, with, with Sara Suari, uh, what typically we do in this literature is that we have some instruments, either the blanchard parody shock or the, or the news variable that, that Barry constructed, and we use that as instruments for something like this. Precisely because of that, we're concerned about the notionality, and then we think that this is something that will help us like this out. Uh, that. Um, so one thing I would like to see then in the paper is a, a, a bit of a better discussion about you know, how these problems were designed uh, and, and try to argue that there is some sort of plausible exogenous variation across these regions for identification. And I think it's something that you could do. Uh, I'm sure that many of these things were like targeted at the federal level, but, so you'd like to see something like you know, how these regions look before the transfers and after, or things like that. Um, one thing that I would think is that many of these transfers seem to be dependent on the number of kids. 
So many number of kids across creation could be used as of, of, like a source of instrument or something like that. But anyway, so there's something more that we like to see in, in terms of like identification. So <clears throat> then I want to say like one thing about the transfers, uh, how do you measure transfers, and the consumption, and then I'm going to go to the model. Uh, so one thing that I think the paper is missing right now is some better discussion about these transfers. Like what's the size, the timing, uh, if there is a regional variation or no. And this sort of a natural point to address this kind of foundation aid concerns. Uh, so see, having this, I, I, like one page, so two pages, something that allows. So I did a search myself to try to learn some of these things. I think I ran with advantage that I can read Spanish. I don't know if everyone can do that, but uh, many probably can. But like having something that discussed how this was in the design is important. And then in, in those transfers, I think that the one that stood out the most it was the withdrawal, early withdrawal of pensions. So I don't know if this was like something that the media caught more because it was controversial or because of the size of it. But this like early withdrawal of pensions, okay, so like in this, in, in, in natural is the following. Uh, I understand that if you are in the labor market in Chile, every month you contribute part of your paycheck to a pension system that you cannot touch at all. This is a very illiquid account. And as an exception, several times, but every time it's an exception, they allow for early withdrawals of that at, at no cost. So that looks a lot like, you know, the cost of accessing this illiquid account disappear for one time, which is super interesting, but it doesn't look like a transfer, really. It doesn't seem to be really a transfer in the sense that it's money that you had in that account and you don't have it anymore. So yesterday over dinner they were telling me that actually there is some amount of money that the government will put over there if we withdraw. So there may be a component of transfers, but I wouldn't say that the withdrawal itself is the transfer. That was money that you sort of had. So me at least seeing some robustness without the, that transfer, that, that would be good. And then, uh, yeah, we, we can talk more about this later on, but I would strongly encourage you to measure progressivity at the individual level instead of the, of the communities. I think that be more clear. Uh, okay, about consumption. So the consumption data is amazing because it's basically they observe credit card and debit card transactions. So the problem you always have with consumption is that it's very noisy. It's a survey. You ask people how much did you spend in Whole Foods last week? No idea. I mean, I really don't know. So this you can really see that very well. You don't have the individual level. You just have the regional level. But that, I think that's that's good enough. My my main concern with the with the with this consumption measures like what are you actually measuring? I imagine that, but it's actually a question, like maybe some people use cash a lot, but if these transfers were debited in your bank account, maybe they were more inclined to use cards, so that was a way to actually use the transfer that you got from the government. So in that sense, you would maybe a little concerned that this measure of consumption is actually like capturing some switching from cash to cards. So some, some discussion about that I think could be good. Uh, I don't know if you have also any information about like what type of, what type of consumption they actually do. I, I, I understand that you remove everything that's online purchases, but can you see durables or non-durables, things like that, is that? Uh, and the other thing that I would encourage you to do that seems like low cost is looking at other variables at the regional level that you may measure, like unemployment or inflation or number of firms, something that can tell you, yeah. I think that could be like a natural, like a, yeah. Okay, so the model, okay. So the model, again, I just have a few comments, uh, small comments, and then I want to finish about thinking about labor markets in this, in this, in this, in this literature. Uh, so coming out of the model is that the average NPC is something like 45%. It seems a little large. I mean, you showed some numbers that the distribution of consumption seems to be reasonable well match, but maybe looking at something about wealth distribution and so on, it could be useful. To be honest, I don't care much. I think that for this exercise that we're doing, what really matters are NPCs. So if those numbers are sort of okay, I, I wouldn't mind. But having some, this, given that it's so large, having some discussion seems like, yeah, interesting. And then what I said before, like, what I would strongly encourage you to do is to run the same regression that you have in the data, but with simulated data from the model. And that may not be obvious because you have multiple regions in the model, in the data, not in the, in the, in the model, but maybe you want to treat the household-like region or, or maybe you want to add regions like nominally, not something that you just randomly bunch them together somehow. Um, I don't think you need to do a full regional model, but something along those lines. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk is about labor markets, and I'm going to use the last slide I have to show some ongoing work that I have. Um, so this model includes unemployment, which I really like, because we all think that this can be an important source of uh, you know, labor income fluctuations. Now, one thing that is not probably great is that uh, 
it assumes that the hours work are homogeneous, and the finance separation rates are homogeneous as well across all workers. And then this is like not the fair complaint to Mario, it's kind of common in this kind of literature, but I want to argue is that we, one could put some evidence that this is not the best assumption. So I'm gonna like, use the last slide to show some work I have with the Andres Fernandez, uh, Rosario Dunate, um, which is a student at Michigan, and Andres Blanco, you, you may know who's also in Michigan. So what we, do is we use exactly the same data on income that Mario was showing, and we try to compute the employment response H, H periods ahead after an increase in the corporate rate of firms in Chile. That's the R. We look at the SMB. Uh, then I complain enough about identification, so I'm <laughs> there to say something better than that. Basically, what we're proposing this paper is that for a small open economy like Chile, one could use foreign shocks as, a, as an instrument. Basically, if there's a market crash in New York, that's unrelated to Chile, and that probably goes like a good instrument for variables from Chile. So what we do is that uh, we use the data from Chile that the other big advantage it has is it's tax data, so it's high quality, and it's monthly. So especially for like business cycle shocks, it seems that you want to have like as high a frequency of data as you can. So this monthly data, that, that looks pretty good. And then for the example I show you now, we use the excess premium premia measure of Milker and Sakersek as an instrument for the corporate rate in Chile. And this excess premium premia measure, in case you don't know it, is, you should think about this as a credit supply shock. And we compute uh, employment responses for, ho for houses in different income quintiles. And the income quintile is coming from a fixed effect of, of an AKM. So this is what we find. We look at total employment, sorry, when we separate employment, which is in the effect of separation and entry rate. When you look at em uh, total employment, there's a large decline for Q1 and Q2, that's the blue lines at the bottom. That's the ones that decline the more. They decline much more than the average, which is the shaded area. And when you look at the top quintiles, like Q4 and Q5, the small employment is, is much smaller. And what we find interesting is that this difference in employment in response to higher rates comes mostly because of separation rates. So basically what you see at least for this barrier in Chile is that after this shock, there's a lot of shock destruction at the bottom, not so much at the top. Uh, finding rates, there's also some heterogeneity, but it's not as large. And it seems that the finding declines for Q1, but everyone else is, is sort of similar. Uh, so I've, I've, we think this is like sort of exciting evidence that hang models should somehow accommodate. Um, Okay, that's all I have. This is a great paper. Think of the distribution of transfers is obviously very relevant for, like, for policy and, and, for, and for model design. Uh, the model has, this paper has a very good combination of data and model. So my two main comments then will be discuss more about the identification across these regions and in the model try to run this regression somehow with most of the data. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. So we have time now for questions. Mari. Uh, really interesting paper, and, and, and particularly I was learning about what was going on in the Chilean data. Yo hablo español, entonces quiero ver ese data. First of all, I want to echo what Gaston said about uh, identification, because th this was not randomly given out to people or municipalities. It's all important to do that. But there's an even more uh, subtle, I mean, that one's clear, but also a subtle issue about dynamic causality, which is what you're trying to estimate in the, in the local projections. So I recommend looking at Stock and Watson Economic Journal 2018 because it can really make a difference. So for example, in my published discussion, the MBR macro of Alistair's paper with Nakamura and Steinson, I found that when I went back to Nakamura and Steinson 2014 state panel, that once you uh, put in the proper lag controls, their multiplier falls from 2.5 to 0.7. So it can really matter in some instances. And um, particularly important is you showed the, the one local projection where the peak effect is at eight months. Given that you're having a series of these uh, transfers over a short period of time, that's why it's really important to control for the lags so that you're getting, you're not confounding the effects of a sequence of transfers. But I mean, it's just fascinating data, but it would be good to you know, tie up those ends there. Thank you. Um, it was a nice paper, I, I enjoyed it. I, I had two questions about the model. So one was when you, when you do these transfers in the model, how, how do you, what are your assumptions on how they're gonna be financed and you know, what, what do households think about that? Um, and the second question about the model was, 
I guess you get these big MPCs, I guess both in the model and in the data, but uh, you, you, had, you had a model where there was unemployment, and, and I guess that the, the initial state when you, when, you, when you provide these transfers might matter. If there's a lot of unemployment, maybe there's more scope for an increase in output and, and equilibrium consumption. But, but uh, was, was it, I, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering, in both in the model and data, what, what was the state when these transfers were, were implemented? Um, I thought the presentation was really nice and the discussion was great uh, as well. Um, I just wanted to ask whether you had thought about embedding this in an open economy model, uh, given that Chile is a very open economy. Um, we have a macro annual paper where we try to go in that direction and study the effects of fiscal transfers. And one thing that's nice in this context is you can sort of trace how the transfer over time shows up in a current account deficit. So that could be interesting, uh, uh, an in interesting implication of that that kind of a model. Another thing that uh, the open economy perspective would allow you to do is you would have an additional dimension across which households can differ, namely in terms of their foreign spending share, right? Maybe some households, I don't know what the fact is in Chile, but some households maybe in, you know, on, the, on the high end of the, uh, the income distribution, maybe they're more likely to go to Miami and spend some of their, in uh, some of their uh, income there. So that could be an interesting you know, source of, of uh, variation that will matter for uh, your, your multipliers. Yeah, so uh, uh, great job. I, I'm very impressed by what you've done. Um, so I um, have a comment on the, on the MPC. So, so uh, people here are commenting on the, the large number uh, that you calibrate the model to. Uh, so in Peru, there's evidence by Sun Ki Hong uh, and he, he's using Blundell P. Staffery Preston estimator in like a, a panel data set that has consumption and income. And he does find f in Peruvian data that MPCs are much larger than they are in the US. So if you have that kind of data and it looks like you have super rich data, it'd be kind of interesting to do the same thing he did and see if you also get these large MPCs directly from the, the micro data using this semi-structural estimation. Um, and then related to this, I, I was wondering if, uh, you know, I, I think the model is very impressive and uh, especially I like the way you added unemployment to the model. Um, if, you, if you did like a US calibration uh, on your model and compared that to the Peruvian calibration uh, that, that, that you have, uh, so take moments from the US, same moments from, from Chile, um, and then did the same transfer, um, how would the results uh, differ? Thank you. Uh, let me first congratulate Mario and the other authors because uh, it's, it's a great paper. Uh, several years ago when we were evaluating at the research department whether to embark in this uh, ambitious agenda of hang models, it was precisely to provide the bank with this type of tools. So I, I think it, it, it really pays off. Um, my question is on inflation. So you, you didn't talk about inflation, but um, have you assessed whether or the extent to which this model can account for the increase in inflation that took place uh, in Chile uh, recently? And the, uh, the perception is that there, it was highly related to the big boost in aggregate demand coming from particularly pension, the pension withdrawals. But yet you show that this has the lowest impact, right? So. Uh, can these two uh, facts be reconciled, or this, this perception against what you have in the model? Um, but very, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very nice uh, presentation and discussion. Um, I also have a point on the uh, pension withdrawals. So um, I agree with Gaston that maybe one, one way to, um, uh, to um, sort of uh, uh, approach this is to, um, in the empirical analysis, um, just um, um, sort of eliminating that, that particular episode uh, from, uh, from the analysis and see how robust the results are. But you can also do this from more directly from the perspective of the model, because I, I mean, I, I don't remember all the details of uh, uh, Adrian Ludwig and, and Matt's paper, but uh, I think, so you have this illiquid asset and uh, you don't have an adjustment cost, but you have flows, right? Like, exactly. So, you know, so every period you have some flows going in. So, I mean, you can just assume that for, for one period or you know, one quarter or two quarter, the flow is much larger. Uh, the flow coming in from the liquid account is much larger. 
And, and that, you know, will look exactly like uh, what Gaston was saying. That is essentially just an intertemporal, uh, it's a liquidity shock, basically. Uh, just an intertemporal change in, your, in, in the extent to which you consume your resources. Um, and, um, you know, and, 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 and that, that is different from, from a transfer because uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, not once you have it in your budget constraint, of course, that's exactly the same. But in terms of, like, you know, future... Uh, this counter-present value of, 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 uh, of spending that would look different because of, uh, uh, yeah. Hi, can, yeah, you can hear me now. Um, uh, congratulations, Mario, it was an excellent presentation. So just a quick question. Um, I was wondering, and continuing with, with, with the comments from Gaston, um, what are the most important channels uh, to explain the effects that you find for um, the distributional uh, impacts. And in particular, I, I have mind, or, or in other words, what are the features in the model that can, can explain the effects. And I have in mind that maybe the, the labor market frictions that you have in the model are playing a very important role. So even if you have the real wage, uh, even if you have a real wage rigidity in the model, because you have these time varying unemployment risk, you can have very important effects. So th I think th this might be even in more important uh, for the progressive set of policies where you can uh, reduce the uh, unemployment risk for the, uh, the households and this has, is going to affect uh, disproportionately more the poor households. So it would be very interesting to try to, 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 to disentangle those effects and, and go deeper in, 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 in that dimension. Mario? Okay, thank you very much for, for your comments, Gaston. And thank you very much for all of these uh, <laughs> lots of, of uh, comments. Let me start from the, from the back. Uh, Gonzalo, um, we, are, we, have in the, we discuss how unemployment affects the transmission of, of these policies into consumption. Uh, we think, uh, we, we find uh, some disappointing uh, results that, uh, for example, labor market tightness directly, like an indirect effect, doesn't affect much the, the consumption dynamics. Unemployment does it, but because uh, income goes down by much more. Uh, we can discuss about that later. Gianluca, um, yes, we, we know that withdrawals here are not exactly a fiscal transfer, but we treat, we treat it because as a fiscal transfer, we think for, uh, it's, a, it's a good assumption to treat it as a fiscal policy, I think for two reasons. The first one is that in the short run, it's like uh, giving money to households because these assets, these pension funds are fully illiquid. They, they, you, you, People were allowed to, to, to take money at some point, but before they didn't have it, and they were charged a tax to, to, to finance those pensions. So, uh, and then in the long run, so in the middle is what we're, we, we think we agree. In the long run, this is gonna be a fiscal problem. The, 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 the government is gonna have to pay for those pensions that, to people that, that, that don't have any, any, any funds. So maybe in the, in the middle, you, we can make some, we, we can go through uh, that, uh, those assumptions. Uh, we think also that um, as we are in a, Chile is a small open economy, and these funds were, were, um, were uh, invested abroad, also, this is kind of, uh, it's, it's hard to think that, that in the short run, they, they make 
uh, capital stock in Chile go down. That's why we, we took this, this approach, but we are open to, to start studying those other. What about inflation, Andres? Um, we should start thinking about inflation. The model has a very um, mechanical way to relate fluctuations in consumption with fluctuations in, 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 in inflation that, are, that depend on the, on, the, on the slope of the Phillips curve. So that's why we don't discuss that, because it's like if you observe an increase, a larger increase in consumption, you also observe a large increase in, in inflation. To answer that, uh, the question uh, that more related to, to our empirical evidence, we will have to get prices at a local level, and that's something we, we, we're going to start thinking now. Sorry. Um, Adrian. Um, yes, uh, we should f for sure uh, make a huge effort in, in, in estimating the, the, empir the, the empirical NPCs. Uh, we know that, I, I know those papers that I think, yes, you use some, some of them in, in one of your papers. And those NPCs are pretty large. The, to give you an, and, and for Chile we think uh, these NPCs are pretty large as well. Uh, but yes, we have to estimate them. Um, uh, about comparing US with Chilean calibration, we are, we are doing that in a companion paper that we call the, the, the boring uh, hunk because we want to, to compare all of these models with different calibration for Chile and how the different assumptions affect the, the results. Jonathan, um, we finance, we, we have uh, many, many, many different calibrations in which we, we, we as I showed you, uh, with this transfer finance with taxes or with debt, and that of, for sure is going to affect the households differently. Actually, the interest rate, if, 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 the, if, if government spending goes up, the, the interest rate plays a, a role, a most important role. So, for example, if you pay uh, the transfer in a more... Uh, we, this is something we, we find out like three weeks ago. If you pay the transfer with fully debt finance or super debt finance uh, ta uh, uh, way, uh, you find that the taxes required to pay for that debt goes up uh, uh, super strongly. That's why uh, you, you have, we have to start thinking about how these different calibrations uh, affect the results. Um, Valerie, thanks for, for your comment. Yes, I, I'm aware of the, and as I'm going to tell, let's say to, to Gaston, we are aware of the identification uh, challenges we have with this, with, especially with this um, exercise. Um, maybe, let me see if, I, I, uh, I, if, if this answers your question. We try with a lot of controls, with a lot of lags of the same policy, because also the policy, some policies were more persistent than others. So we, we, we try to, to control for those lags. We find that the, the, the effects are different. Uh, they, for some um, uh, numbers of the lags, uh, they are stronger or, or weaker, but you still find that progressive transfers affect consumption by more. But, uh, and, and let me talk about a little bit, uh, take advantage of that comment to, to, to talk about what Gaston, what Gaston said also. Uh, yes, we, that's something we have to put a, a lot of effort in, in studying to see whether uh, we can find a nice instrument to, to, to study these, these kinds of questions. To be honest, I'm not an, an econometrician. Uh, we wanted to motivate this paper in a nice way, but of course, we're going to push forward these, these type of questions to, 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 to calibrate our models uh, uh, best. We can talk about uh, the, well, uh, and the, the other uh, big comment, sorry for taking three seconds more, and the other comment is, is about taking the, the stand, taking a view on, on the heterogeneity as a municipality. And we can do that for sure. I think we can try that and make the regressions and run the regressions you, uh, we have also in the paper. I think that's a really good idea. So thank you very much for your comments. I'm pretty happy to.
Uh, uh, a housekeeping announcement. Uh, so for the contributors, we're meeting for dinner at 7.30 in the lobby of the hotel. 7.30 p.m. tonight. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, all the participants. Muy buen comentario, Anatón.